you're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Thank you, Mrs. Dunphy. I'll be back shortly. You're going out? I'm afraid so. But you've only just returned. Unfortunately, that is the nature of my work. Another business trip? The most important of all. But first, there are arrangements to be made. I've prepared your afternoon meal. I'm sure it will keep. Can you not make these arrangements by telephone? No, no. Some things can't be left to chance. In the meanwhile, follow my instructions precisely. To the letter, Mrs. Dunphy. Do I make myself clear? I believe so. You believe so? Then let me make it absolutely clear. <sighs> Sit down for a moment. But if you're on your way... It's necessary that you understand. And the only way to be sure is to tell you how it began, please. If you wish, sir. I must warn you, it's an incredible story. I, of all people, know that. So incredible that you won't believe me at first. But I'm going to tell you everything. Then you will believe. Because you must. You must believe. Do you know Central Europe? Europe? Only as a child, sir. It started there many years ago, after the First World War. I was on a walking tour of France, Belgium, and Germany. I, I decided to travel alone with only a small pack. <laughs> the confidence of youth. Germany was magical then, a place of valleys and mountains and swift, dark rivers. There was nowhere else like it, a fertile land where... Everything grew tall and straight out of the earth. I was struck by the richness of the soil, the verdancy of the hills. Stepping across the border from Belgium, where the mustachioed guards saluted like tin soldiers, I entered a different world. Everywhere I looked, a swelling green ocean. On the farthest hills, tall, ancient buildings of stone. Estates, monasteries, castles, or what have you. Some of them in ruins. I stood a moment at the border and watched the hawks circling above, wondering how such a miracle could be. It was as if I had passed through an invisible door from a musty room into a magical kingdom of winds and light. But so much can change in the afternoon. By nightfall, clouds filled the sky and the storm moved in to darken the landscape. The nearest village was miles away. I was unprepared, dressed for a, a stroll up the Champs-Élysées, perhaps. In minutes, I was drenched and chilled to the bone. Then I saw it, a medieval castle, bombed almost to ruins, sitting like a broken fingernail atop Schwarzhof Mountain. I came to a wall of gray stone. It was an iron gate. Please! Please! <laughs> Summon! <laughs> Please let me in! A story told years ago by a man who recalled it from his youth. Fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, he was never able to put it out of his mind. It begins with a wayfaring traveler. His name is David Ellington, a scholar, seeker of truth, and to his dismay, a finder of truth. A man approaching exhaustion, who will confront a problem that has haunted the world since the beginning of time. A man who knocks on a gate, seeking sanctuary, and instead finds that he has just crossed an unmarked border into the far edges of the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Howling Man, starring Fred Willard with Stacy Keach as your narrator. I found a rope by the gate and pulled it. Please! Someone! 
Yes? What is it? Let me in. I'm sorry. You, you don't understand. I'm traveling on foot. We don't allow visitors. I'm not a visitor. Uh, what is this place? It's called the Hermitage. And I'm a stranger caught in the storm. Your, your robe, the, the cross around your neck. You're a man of God. I'm lost. Don't you understand? Lost. Very well. Follow me. Thank you, brother. <coughs> You're ill. I'll be... I'll be all right. Once I dry out. <coughs> this way. What are these rooms? A barred window in each door. They look like... Well, cells. All are empty now. I see, but, but what were they? Wait here. What for? I'll speak to Brother Jerome. Who? What in the... Brother Jerome will see you now. Oh, what was that? The wind. Are you... sure? Come. The room had almost no furnishings. A straw pallet, a rude desk and chair, some books and religious oddments, very stark. The abbot himself was a fierce El Greco painting of a man, stooped and withered, but strong in every part of him. Like the monk who came to the gate, he wore a shepherd's cloak and carried a crooked staff. Why have you come here? My name is David Ellington. I got lost in the storm. <laughs> then I saw a lantern in the window. And what is it you want of us? Want? Only a little shelter, some food. We cannot help you here. You will have to leave. You call that a Christian attitude? Now, Mr. Ellington. Oh, for the love of... All right, if that's the way you want it. Sorry to have troubled you. <laughs> Give me a minute. <clears throat> I'll be out of here in... In... <sighs> Brother Christophorus. Yes? Carry him out of here. At once. Right away. I don't know how long I remained unconscious. When I, I came to, I was in a primitive cubicle, one of the cells. Walls and ceiling of gray stone, a single small window in the shape of an arch, the floor hard-packed dirt. The monk sat nearby in a chair. I lay under a blanket. Beneath me was a bed of straw. Water! He lives. God's infinite mercy. How long have I been here? Nine days, my son. Nine? Days? You were very ill. The fever was on you. Brother Jerome said you would die, and he sent me to watch over you. I have never seen a man die. He holds that it is an important teaching, but now I suppose it was not your time. Sorry to disappoint you. No, my boy, don't try to rise. You must rest. What in the name of heaven is that? In the name of heaven? Nothing. I, I mean the scream. Scream? That. What? Are you deaf? That cry, I heard it before. You said it was the wind. Ah, the wind cleanses the land after a storm. But it isn't the wind, is it? I don't understand your meaning. It's a man. Careful. You must regain your strength. There! Don't tell me you didn't hear it! Perhaps you would like some soup. It's cold, but nourishing. What I would like, brother, is to leave this place. I'm afraid that's impossible. What do you mean? Only that you're not well enough to travel. And of course, you won't be well enough to travel as long as you think you hear such sounds. Now, the soup. I, I don't want it. Open, please. There. That's better. Over the next few hours, my strength did return, or at least some of it. I waited until the monk had fallen asleep. Then at last I made my move. The door was held shut by a simple iron bolt. I had only to slide it a few inches without waking him. 
almost free. But I could not remember which way we had come. When I turned into another corridor, I realized I was lost. It was a maze of dark passages and doors. Here, a part of the ruined ceiling was broken away, and I saw that the moon had risen. In the naked light of the moon, I saw one door different somehow from the others. At first, I was not sure why. Then I realized that in place of a bolt, it was held shut by a piece of wood, a mere stick, crooked and curved, like the peculiar staffs carried by the monk and the abbot, only in miniature, no, no greater in length than, well, than my forearm. On this door, in this door alone, a small wooden staff replaced the iron bolt. How odd! I looked through the opening in the door. Inside, a filthy, shadowed hovel. No table or chair, no straw for a bed. It appeared to be empty. What? It was a man. Huddled in the corner, holding his knees and rocking head and back like an animal. In the soiled moonlight, I saw his dirty beard, his, his rotted clothes. Who are you? Help me. Stay back. No, please. In the name of humanity, help me. But who? You're not one of them. No, my name is Ellington. I'm an American. Shh, shh. What are you afraid of? Them? Listen, do you hear them coming? No, but why? They will look for you. We only have a moment. You speak as if I'm a prisoner. Aren't you? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Come closer. And I'll explain. Explain what? Don't you know what they are? These men of God. They are mad, Mr. Ellington. All of them raving mad. Why do you say so? I was in the village, in Schwarzhof, doing nothing out of the ordinary, walking the street with my woman. We were holding hands. That is all. Do you see anything wrong with that? Well, of course not. But what... We pause to rest by a tree in the shade. And then we kissed. Yes, I admit it. Is it wrong to kiss? Tell me. Why, no, I don't think so. You don't think so. I don't think so. But Jerome, that lecherous old fool. The gaunt man, the one in charge. So, you have seen him. As I kissed her, a shadow fell over us. We looked up and saw him standing there. I opened my mouth to speak, but before I could utter a word, he raised the wooden staff he carries, so heavy. You've seen it? Yes. And he hit me again and again. He smote me <laughs> like an angry god or a man who thinks he's god. I woke up here. No. I swear, they flogged me with knotted ropes. I asked for food, they would not give it to me. I begged for water, they gave me none. Then they threw me in this filthy room and locked the door. Whoa. Why? For revenge. Jerome wanted my woman. Are you sure? Yes. That disgusting old man, that fanatic. He wanted her. And when she refused... His advances, he took his fury out on me. Uh, your story, I find it difficult to believe. Of course you do. That's the strength of the man. He makes his madness seem a harmless thing. The beliefs of a religious zealot. But this, this is not a religious order, Mr. Ellington. These brothers of truth. Is that what they're called? That's what they call themselves. The real truth is... They're outcasts, misfits, cut off from the world, because the world will not have them. Have you heard of their sect before, of this hermitage? No, I, I haven't. Mr. Ellington, you must believe me. I don't say they're all evil, only mad. And here, within these walls, they answer to no law but their own. Wait for me. Where are you going? I'll speak to Jerome. No, you mustn't. If I remind him that false imprisonment is a crime... I tell you, he's the greatest maniac of them all. Quick! He's coming. Hide yourself. 
Mr. Ellington. No, no. <laughs> Brother Jerome? I did not know you were well enough to walk. I, I still feel weak. Brother Jerome, come with me, please. Look here, I... This way. Where were you going? I was looking for you. It was unwise for you to wander on your own. The corridors can be treacherous. Oh, can they? In what way? The building is very old. One might trip and fall without a torch. Or go where one is not meant to go, is that it? See something perhaps that you're ashamed of? I do not know to what you refer. Don't you? Oh, then you don't know the grounds very well. I saw something just now that violates the law of this country and of humanity. I must ask you... And I must ask you, Mr. Ellington, to leave the Hermitage at once. We lack proper facilities to care for the ill. You certainly do. Arrangements can be made in Schwarzhof. Uh, just a minute. No, not a minute. Not an extra second, Mr. Ellington. Now. I thought you were concerned about my health. I am. But now you want me gone regardless. Why? I have explained that. You've explained nothing. Based on what I've seen, I question your motives. I question your entire operation here. You are making assumptions. I certainly am. Now, look, no one invited me to come here. I realize that. I arrived unexpectedly, and you're not prepared for visitors. But I had no choice. And there is no excuse for your behavior. I suppose it was only a matter of time before you brought out the knotted ropes so that you could flail me or whatever it is you do for amusement. My son. I'm not your son! There are many things you don't understand. That's right, I don't. So begin with this one. Tell me, why are you in such a hurry for me to leave? What more are you afraid I'll find out? More? Besides the man you've got locked up in that cell. What man is that, Mr. Ellington? The one we just left. The one who's been screaming his head off. I am not sure what you're talking about. That's it, isn't it, brother? Or is he only one of many? Well, it isn't a secret anymore. I know. And what do you think you know? I... Uh... <laughs> I... The chair. Sit. You are still weak. Brother Jerome, I know very little about this cult of yours. What's permitted within these walls, but I doubt very seriously that you can imprison a man against his will. That is quite true. We have no such authority. Then why have you done it? No man has ever been imprisoned at the Hermitage, Mr. Ellington. He claims otherwise. Who claims otherwise? Who do you think? The man in the cell at the end of the corridor. There is no man in the cell at the end of the corridor. I was talking with him. You are talking with no man. And you think I'm hallucinating? Mr. Ellington, you are ill. You still have a fever. In such a state, delirium may cause one to see and hear things that do not exist. Do you mean to tell me you don't hear that? Hear what? Look at me. Dreams can seem very real. And honest men make unconvincing liars. The brother who's been caring for me... Brother Christophorus? Yes. He has a way of looking at the floor when he tells me I'm imagining things. You look at me, but your voice loses its command. More imaginings. I, I don't know why, but you're both very intent on keeping me away from the truth. What do you know of the truth? Which is not only poor Christianity, Brother Jerome, it's poor psychology, because now I'm very curious indeed. Curiosity is a dangerous thing. Oh, I was taught it's a sign of intelligence. There are some things best left alone. Like sleeping dogs, a nest of snakes. I'll uncover the facts eventually, you know. Meaning what? Just what I say. I imagine 
the local police will be interested to learn that you're keeping a man locked up here. I tell you, there is no man. All right, let's forget it. I'll deal with it in my own way. And what way is that? However I see fit. It's no concern of yours now. Oh, and I apologize for not dying. Maybe some other time, brother. Mr. Ellington. A last word? Bon voyage? <laughs> Don't bother yourself. I'll make it to the village with no further delay. I assure you. Mr. Ellington, the, the prisoner in the cell, it's a delicate matter. Ah! So you admit it. A terrible thing. He's... Violent. Dangerous. More dangerous than you know. We are obliged to lock him in the cell. I am sure you can understand. I understand that you're still lying to me. Goodbye, Brother Jerome. Would you really go to the police? If you were in my place, wouldn't you? Very well. Close the door, Mr. Ellington. I have told you the truth, but only a part. Now I see that I must tell you the whole of it. May God forgive me. Then you do hear it. As I have heard it every hour of every day for five long years. Why did you lie? I didn't. Oh, but I think you did. And now the skies darken. The storm returns. I should have known. When I told you that no man screamed in the abbey, I spoke the truth. It is not a man, you see, Mr. Ellington. It is the devil himself. You're joking with me, aren't you? No, Mr. Ellington, I am not. Would that I were. It would be so much easier. But the prisoner in the cell, our only prisoner, is in fact Satan. Oh, come now. Otherwise known as the fallen angel, Ahriman, Asmodeus, Belial, Diabolus, the devil made manifest. You asked for the truth. Now you have it. Do you believe? What? Oh, sure. Hmm. Now it is you who are lying, Mr. Ellington. You don't believe me at all. To the contrary, you're even more certain of what you've suspected all along, that I am mad. Well, sit down. I will tell you a story. And then we'll see how certain you are of my madness or have anything else. Drink. Uh, what did you say? Some brandy. For thy stomach and thy infirmities. Uh, no, no, thank you. Don't worry. It's not poison. A very old vintage. I'll drink with you. What is it you wanted to tell me? I presume, Mr. Ellington, that you consider yourself sophisticated. A worldly man. Why do you say that? You're young. Rich by your clothes, and reasonably well-educated. Harvard? Yale. Exactly. Having a last fling before settling into the family business. How did you... You are an open book, printed in very large type, with pictures. Of course, you consider us primitive, because we're living in seclusion away from the real world. To you, we're misfits. Please, I know all the theories. I assure you, brother... No, Mr. Ellington. It is I who am assuring you that I am not the ignorant fanatic I might seem. I coped with your world for 40 years before I left it, and rather successfully by your standards. The best schools, a degree in philosophy, a job that took me to all the corners of the earth. This beard and this staff and this face represent nothing but a different point of view. If you understand that, then perhaps you will listen to what I have to say with an open mind. Go on. Five years ago, there were no screams at the Hermitage. This was simply the bombed out ruins of a castle belonging to the family Wolfren. How did you come by it? Baron Wolfren turned it over to the Brothers of Truth as a gesture of charity. Our task was to tend the great vineyards and save what souls we could by constant prayer. But this isn't a formal religious order, is it, brother? We believe that we are recognized by God. Truth is our only dogma. We are committed to it as man's greatest weapon against the devil, who is the father of all lies. Please, continue. You were 
tending the vineyards. At that time, not very long after the Great War, the world was in chaos. Everywhere there was unhappiness, except in the village below. Really? For some reason, the people of Schwarzhof refused to yield to despair. They lost none of their faith. They continued, as they had for years, to be honest and God-fearing and happy. The village was a plum to Satan, one he could not resist. So he came here, drawn to it as a moth is to light, and embarked upon a program of corruption. But you stopped him. Yes. You see, Mr. Ellington, he made the same mistake you are making now. He underestimated me. He thought he would have no difficulty tempting an old fool. I had him in the cell before he knew what happened. But if he's the devil, how do you keep him from escaping? With the staff of truth. The one barrier he cannot pass. Mm-hmm. And when he first came, just how did you recognize him? I had seen him before, in every part of the world. Wherever there was sin, wherever there was strife and persecution, there he was also. Sometimes he appeared only as a spectator, a face in the crowd. But he was always there, in all times and places. So you understand now, I trust, why you must say nothing of the things you have seen and heard. Brother, not that I doubt you, but is it possible that you've made a mistake? No. Think, Mr. Ellington, of the peace in the world these five years. Think of this country now. Is there another like it? But you haven't put an end to suffering. There's still murders and robberies. Even now, while we talk, people are starving. The suffering man was meant to endure, my son. We cause much of our own grief and need no help from him. It is the unnatural catastrophes, the great wars, the overwhelming pestilences, the wholesale sinning that we have ended. The world is rebuilding. A great dawn will come. E enough. You've made your case. I believe you, brother. Do you? Truly? I admit I was doubtful at first, but you've convinced me. Absolutely. I promise to keep your secret. Good. Tomorrow, if you feel well enough, you may leave. For now, let the storm pass over. Brother Christophorus will look after you. If you would, go directly to your room. I will. Good night, brother, and thank you. I was glad our conversation was over. It was clear that he was quite mad. I thought of his wild beard, his eyes in the flickering candlelight, and I was relieved to be away from him. The devil, indeed. But the storm had returned, and I was not yet fully recovered. I would pass one more night in this place. What, I wondered, should I do before morning comes? The corridor was dank and empty. I felt as though I were the last sane man in an insane world. What Brother Jerome had told me was utter nonsense, the product of a deranged mind. But his belief, his faith, as he called it, was heavy in the air, infecting the very stones. To bring it down would require outside help, but perhaps I could start that very night with an act of pure, unselfish humanity. Psst! Are you in there? Where else would I be? I thought you weren't coming back. I had a meeting with Brother Jerome. What did he say? He lied to you, didn't he? He said that you're... Go on. What? The devil. <laughs> the devil. Oh, oh, that's good. That's wonderful. What a dream for an old man. Himself a devil. To catch Satan and lock him away in this godforsaken place. You don't believe him, do you? Of course not. Then help me. If I let you out now, while they're awake, they may catch you before you leave the grounds. There's always the possibility. But another hour here, you don't know what it's like. Look here, why don't I just go and get the authorities? When? As soon as morning comes. 
I'll find the path to the village and... No! It would be my death warrant. The authorities will return and find nothing. Who knows what will have happened to me by then. Jerome is mad, but he's shrewd, too. He won't leave any evidence behind. Then... What can we do? You must let me out now. There doesn't seem to be a lock on your cell, only this small shepherd's staff. You could almost reach through the bars and remove it yourself. I've tried. It's wedged in such a way that I can't get my fingers around it. Here, I think I can get it. <clears throat> Quickly! Wait! Brother Christophorus! There you are. Brother Jerome was fearful. You might lose your way. No, no, nothing of the kind. Come along. I'll light the candle. There is bread and water on the table. And more soup to give you strength. Thank you. Rest now, Mr. Ellington. Remember, you're still a very sick man. I'm feeling much better. Nonetheless, Brother Jerome has asked me to watch over you. Really, that isn't necessary. It is my duty. The chair is sturdy, and the candle is fresh. Wait a minute. Why are you locking the door? To protect you. But you're locking us both in. Never fear. I have the key. It is not long till morning. But... Sleep, Mr. Ellington. You are a weary traveler. Soon you'll be back with your own kind. What a comfort, eh? You will forget all you have seen here. I watched the monk as he sat heavily in the chair. I was a prisoner, no doubt about it. How much longer, I wondered, for both prisoners. What if the morning came and Brother Jerome chose not to release me as he promised? I might remain here for... How long had the howling man been in prison? Five years? Lord, I imagined my beard growing, my hair wild, until I too was starved, crying to be let out, no one would come. Who knew I was here? I'd drop off the face of the earth, forgotten, presumed dead. Brother Christophorus had the keys around his neck, but until he fell asleep, I was at his mercy. It was almost dawn when I dared to move. I had to be careful not to wake him. Yes, I finally had the key. I locked Brother Christophorus in the cell. There was no time to spare. I knew I must release the howling man before I left the hermitage. You come. Good. What do you want me to do? Lift off the wooden bolt. Ah. Uh are you sure this is all that holds you in? A small carved stick? Yes, lift it off, I tell you. But surely you could have forced the door and broken it. Please! There is no time for talk in the name of mercy. If you fail now, they'll kill both of us. All right. Hurry. I'm trying. I just need to slide it. Oh, God, the latch. <sighs> Mr. Ellington, where have you gone? Hurry. Hurry. A moment. Stop him! Stop him! Now! Brother Jerome, come quickly! I am free. Stop! I command you! The other way! Now! Here is the gate. It's locked. I must get over the wall! I'll put my hands together. A hoist! Step up! Let not Satan escape us, O oh Lord. Let him not sow the seeds of evil throughout the world. I call upon you. Up! Now! stepped in my hands and climbed the gate. Now, reach down and give me your hand. Help me. Help you? Help you, mere mortal? <laughs> Are you mad? And I saw, not the foot of a man before me, but a cloven hoof in a flash of lightning with those horns grown suddenly from his forehead. Then he turned and vanished in the moonlight. I am sorry for you, my son. What was he? As long as you live, you will remember this night. He is gone. Who? Tell me. Even now, you're not sure. But you will be. And then you'll know, Mr. Ellington. You'll know who it was you loosed upon the world. <laughs> The monks 
were mad, I thought, or the howling man was mad, or I was, or the whole world. But Brother Jerome was correct. I could not forget. And when the pictures of the carpenter from Bramau Alm Inn appeared in the papers, I grew uneasy, for I felt I'd seen this man before. And when the carpenter invaded Poland, I was sure. And when the world was plunged into war and cities had their entrails blown asunder, and that pleasant land I had visited became a place of hate and death, I decided to spend the rest of my life tracking down the one I had released. Each night I dreamed of it, Mrs. Dunphy, and I kept dreaming through all the wars since, until this week. It took years, decades, but eventually I found him. And so the nightmare is finally over, again. I see. And now, Mrs. Dunphy, I'm going to see about a chartered plane to have him transported back to Germany. Brother Kostrophorus is in charge now. I have already written him. He will be very relieved. And what you found, it is here? Have no fear. As long as the Staff of Truth is in place, he cannot leave the next room. The Staff is very small, but very powerful. So you see why you must not, under any circumstances, go near that door. Nothing in the world is more important. Do you understand? I believe so. Oh, he'll do a bit of howling, but never mind that. It's a trick. I'll return as soon as possible. Until then, keep that door locked. Yes, sir. Oh, my. Such stories. Come here. Please. You must listen. He is insane. Let me out, I beg you. Let me out. Who's there? Behind that door. Are you all right? <coughs> Sir? Sir? Can you hear me? A little piece of wood. The staff. Remove it, please. I don't know if I should. Please, take it off the door. I implore you, please. Please. Ancient folk saying, you can catch the devil, but you can't hold him long. Ask Brother Jerome, or Brother Christophorus, or David Ellington. They know, and they'll go on knowing to the end of their days in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At TwilightZoneRadio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD. Or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. The Howling Man, starring Fred Willard. With Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, David Darlow, Doug James, and Anna Sverutza. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etcherson, 
Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, Exim Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. going, smart guy. <laughs> Hang on, Caesar. You'll see. Aha, uh -huh, that's a good one. Is it? You know I can't see nothing in here. Patience. What am I, a doctor? Very funny. At least try, will you? It's a virtue. What is? Patience. It means it doesn't come natural. You have to cultivate it like, uh, like a garden. What do you think? I grew on a tree? Don't answer that. Here we are. This will only take a minute. It better. I can hardly breathe. Quiet now, Caesar. We're going inside. Mommy, did you see that? See what, dear? That man with the suitcase. He was talking to himself. Shh, now, don't stare. But he was, honest. Come along, dear. Hi there, Freddy. Hmm? Oh, hello, Mr. West. Ah, you got a lot of new merchandise. Every day. Yeah, hey, look at all the TV sets and the watches. Is that a Rolex? Only a knockoff, I'm afraid. Something I can help you with? Well, now, the question is, can I help you? And you know, I might be able to do that little thing, seeing as how business is booming. Looks can be deceiving. What have you got for me today, Mr. West? Patience, my boy. I'll just be putting the case down, if you don't mind. Not on the counter, please. It's glass. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> hey, take it easy. Quiet, Caesar. What say? Oh, nothing. Nothing to tell. Now, where is it? Ah, right here in my pocket. Feast your eyes on this. Did you ever see such a timepiece? Well, to be honest... Been in the family for years. Three dollars. Surely you're joking. Five taps. Oh, now, you might want to put your glasses on. It's got a jeweled movement, a gold case and chain. Gold-plated. Well, nonetheless, it's... This is a real antique. You don't see watches like this anymore. True enough. People wear wristwatches nowadays. Listen, um... Freddy, I, I'm between engagements at the moment. It's strictly temporary. In fact, I, I have an audition this afternoon, a very important audition. Five dollars, Mr. West. Take it or leave it. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll, I'll take it. One, two, three, four, and five. Don't worry, your luck's bound to change. Sure it is, sure. Here's your pawn ticket. Don't lose it. I won't. We'll be back to claim it soon enough. We? Yeah, Caesar and me. We're a team, you know. I couldn't do the act without him. <laughs> that right. The watch. Please don't sell it. I'll do my best. For 30 days at least. Thank you. Kindly. Mr. West. Yes? What about him? Wait. You don't mean Caesar. I'll give you $25 for the dummy. With the case. All those stickers on it from all over the world. There are collectors, you know, for that sort of thing. Oh. Well, thank you. It's just the same, but... Uh... I'm afraid Caesar's not for sale. Mr. Jonathan West, ventriloquist, comedian and master manipulator of a dummy. A small splinter with large ideas, very aptly named Caesar. A wooden tyrant with a mind and a voice of his own. Only a few minutes from now, he'll do his best to talk Jonathan West into a brand new act to be performed exclusively in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Caesar and Me, starring Jason Alexander, 
with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hello, Mrs. Kadehi. Any mail for me? Ah, now what was that? <laughs> Got you. Ah, it's you, Susan. Huh, I thought a bee had stung me. Maybe it did. <laughs> This is the last time I'll warn you, child. Stop playing with poison darts. They're not poison, Aunt Agnes. It's only a pea shooter. Give it to me. I didn't hurt him. Good morning, Mrs. Goodday. No harm done. She, uh, she missed me. Now can I go out and play? Good morning, Mr. West. Off you go. I'll bet you didn't get a job. Well, now... Susan, go out and play. Yes, ma'am. See you later, Jonathan. Be gone with you, scat. Bye now. <laughs> She's a lovely child you have. I'm sorry, Mr. West. I don't know what I'm going to do with that girl. Oh, I understand, Miss Cadet. You certainly have your hands full with the room and house and all. That I do. No no mail, I presume? Uh, not yet. And uh, no calls? None at all. Well, then, I'll just go on up to my room, if you don't mind. Take him everywhere, do you? Oh, I try. Wouldn't do to go on an audition without Caesar, though, would it? I suppose not. Still, he must be awfully heavy. No, 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 no. He's light as a feather, he is. My old friend Caesar. <laughs> He's not heavy. He's my partner. <laughs> right, come along, Caesar. I'll make us a bite to eat. Won't that be lovely? Uh, oh, Mr. West, if I could have a word with you. Oh, yes, of course. Um, just let me take care of Caesar here. I'll be right down. Back safe and sound. Huh. About time. There you go. Watch your legs. Mighty stuffy in there. Is it? You're gonna have to get me some new summer clothes. I'm sweating pine sap. <laughs> See, sir, you're such a kidder. You are. Relax, why don't you? Better buy some new furniture while you're at it. A guy could get splinters sitting in a chair like this. Where'd you get it? Sing Sing? Ha, <laughs> that's a good one. Sing Sing. The chair, right? Yeah, I think I'll use that in the act. <laughs> what act? I ain't seen that audience since they invented vaudeville. Here's your slippers. I'll just uh, pull them on for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ain't you forgetting something? What's that? Oh, no, no, no. I didn't forget, Caesar. Here's your copy of Variety so you can keep up with the show business. This is last week's. Is it now? Ah, well, no. You see, the subscriptions run out. I, I've been meaning to renew it. See that you do. Right. I'll uh, I'll fix us some lunch. How's that sound? The least you can do. A guy deserves a little comfort once in a while. Well, that he does. Let's see here. Well, looks like it's soup today. Is that all you got? I'm afraid it's all that's left, Caesar. But don't you worry. We'll get a book in any day now. We'll be headliners. Yeah. Just like you and that other guy used to be. Only I won't skip out on you like he did. You better not. Or I'll... No, 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 no. No, I won't run off with some girly and leave you sitting in a pawn shop and a no, sir. You can count on me. It's you and me, pal. Forever. You got that right. Ah, the soup will hit the spot. Just a light lunch, you know what I mean? My mother used to say, never eat too much when you're hot and tired. Why don't you stop kidding yourself, buddy? How's that, Caesar? Face it. You're finished. Now, why would you go and say a thing like that? Because I can read the handwriting on the wall. You're going nowhere fast. No, but I told you, Caesar, we've got an audition this afternoon. Today's the day. I can feel it. We're going to knock them dead. Yeah, bore them to death. No, 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 no. You'll see. Wait till they hear the new material. We'll be going in a few minutes, just as soon as I put on my tie and comb here. Wash your face while you're at it. You look like something the cat dragged in. Right. Good idea. <laughs> Ah, that feels much better. Who's that? Oh, ah, uh, it's you, Susan. Uh, you know, you, you, you really ought to, to knock first. I don't have to. This is my aunt's house. Well, just the same. Show me how to make him talk. Well, I, I'd like to, Susan, but we're on our way downtown. Show me. Oh, we've got an appointment, a very important appointment. An audition. Just do it once, Jonathan. The part where he laughs... I want to see what you do with your fingers to make his head move back and forth. Okay, Susan. Where are you going? 
to the mirror. I have to put on my tie. But you can't do it from over there. Sure I can. Just you watch. <clears throat> Caesar, what did the lady say she'd do with you if you misbehaved? She said she was going to slice me up into a Venetian blind. And what did you say? I said, oh, you make me shudder. There. How's that? I didn't see your lips move. That's right, you didn't. I'm the best there is. If you're so good, how come you can't get a job? All that's about to change, young lady. This very day. You said that before. Susan? Susan, where are you? You better run along. Susan! Coming! You won't get the job, I bet. Oh, now, Susan... Keep that brat out of this room. Don't listen to her, Caesar. You'll see. Today, we're gonna kill him. Um, now, Mr. Miller? Anytime. All right, then. If you're not ready... No, we're ready. Okay, Caesar. Quite stolen. <clears throat> uh, hello, Caesar. Hiya. I heard a new one the other day. That's a surprise. I wonder if I told it to you. Is it funny? <laughs> Yes, as a matter of fact. Then you didn't. Oh, hey, Caesar, I think I met your father the other day. Where? In a toothpick factory. Get out of here. No, oh, uh, um, excuse me, Caesar. It was a chopstick factory. A <laughs> chopstick factory. Or was it your mother? I thought you were the straight man. Well, um, Caesar, at least I can stand up straight. I'd like to see you stand up if I stick my mitt in your back. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to hurt you. Just watch what you're doing with those fingers, all right? Don't know where they've been. Well, let me give you a hand. <laughs> a hand, you see? He said... I is the microphone on? It's on. W would you like me to run through the juvenile delinquent routine? It's very funny, if I do say so. That'll be all. B um, but, but you haven't heard the last part? No, but I've heard the first part, and it's more than enough. We'll be in touch. Oh. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Miller, I'll, I'll leave my phone number, if it's all right with you. Sure thing. Next... Must have had a fight with his wife this morning. Or maybe he got a new hearing aid so he could hear your crummy jokes. Come on, Caesar. We're going home. There. That ought to do it. Clean shirt, tie all pressed. The suit's just about had it, though. Pardon me for asking a stupid question, but what are you so chipper about? You'll see. Tomorrow. Another lousy audition? Nope. Not this time. I am not talking about a nightclub job. Well, what in blazes are you talking about? I've been thinking, Caesar, and I came up with a plan. Oh, a plan, huh? You'll see. This one may change our lives. Okay. Surprise me. But I'll bet my bottom dollar that whatever it is, it flops. <laughs> Don't you have any faith in me? Why should I? I know you. Stick by me one more time, will you, buddy? Just this once. Things will change, I promise. I swear it. Give me one more chance. Okay? Okay. Once more. But that's it. You get one last shot. After that, we do things my way. As far as I'm concerned, you're living on borrowed time. You get me, buddy? Good morning, Mrs. Gadehi. Yes, it is. Oh, oh, Mr. West. Hmm? There's something I'd like to talk to you about. I know, Mrs. Gadehi, the rent. I'm sorry to mention it. Well, you'll be pleased to know I'll be able to straighten it out this evening. Oh, that would be very nice. Yes, indeed. I've made a decision. I'm going to look for a day job. Really? Something temporary, you understand, until the show business picks up. I think that's a splendid idea. In that case, as long as you're in this frame of mind, maybe I can help. I've been saving something for you. Um, here, take this card. Card? My cousin's. He works at an employment office. You don't say. Active employment agency. If we can't place you, there are no jobs. <laughs> it's clever. Well, thank you, Mrs. Kadehi. You're a living doll. <laughs> 
You're welcome, Mr. West. It's not far. You can walk there from here. Just turn right at the first corner, then go five or six blocks. You can't miss it. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, well then, I might as well go there right now. Why not? First stop of the day. You do that. And good luck, Mr. West. I really mean it. The very best of luck to you. Well, here's an application for him. Thank you, Mr. Smiles. Uh, but we should be able to cut through some of this, seeing as how you know Jeannie. Well, I should hope so. Typing. How's that? How many words a minute? I'll fill it in for you. W uh, well, now, uh... No typing. Well, how about sales? Um, how do you mean? Oh, you know, retail, commission, that sort of thing. Hmm. Uh, to be honest... Go on. Uh, not really... I see. Um, any uh, mechanical aptitudes? You mean in the sense of machinery? Exactly. Uh, appliances, automobiles, and, and, and so forth? Yes. Uh, well, in that case, Mr. Smiles, uh, no. Food preparation, perhaps. Uh, restaurant work, service industries. Not that I can recall. Mr. West, have you ever held a position of any sort? ever made any kind of a regular salary at any time in your life, at any time at all. That is, besides show business. Oh, yes. Doing what, may I ask? I, uh, well, I once worked in an office. Well, that's a start. Uh, in an office building, actually. As? An elevator operator. Hmm. You know, Mr. West, most all buildings today have automatically controlled stop and start systems. Aye, aye, aye. True enough. So there's simply no call for elevator operators nowadays. No, uh, of course not. There wouldn't be, would there? I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do for you right at the moment. I see. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, but if you leave your name with the receptionist, uh, I'll be in touch. Yes, yes, uh, I'm sure you will. can't find a job. Okay, Susan, that's enough. The truth hurts, doesn't it? What do you know about the truth? You're scared to tell my aunt because you're behind in your rent. Look, why don't you go outside and play? Jonathan's broke. Jonathan's broke. Well? Well, what? I see. It's like that, is it? I told you so. Please, Caesar. Now what? I don't know. No matter what I do, it doesn't work out. Eh, what else is new? If I could just get some money together. Not much. Enough for the rent and some food. Then I'd be able to think clearly without these pressures. Just a little money for rent and food, huh? Chump change. Is that all you want out of life? Right now, that'll do. You're a clod. You're a real potato head. I try. I'll give it my best. Your best stinks. I can't even remember my lines anymore. I shake so bad my lips move. Tell me something I don't know for a change. That's it, Caesar. I'll give up. I've had enough. I'm the one who's had enough. Get that through your thick skull. You? Let me spell it out for you. The cold, hard facts. I think I already know. This is the way it's gonna be, and what you're gonna do. Save your breath. I'm a failure. Will you shut up and listen? There are more ways than one to skin a cat. Meaning? You dummy. I'm talking about money. Cash. Moolah. There are other ways to get a hold of it. I've tried everything. You have not tried everything. Now dummy up. While I lay it out for you. Where are we now? In front of the furniture store. I don't mean that stupid. I mean how far away from the delicatessen. That's so loud. Why? Is anybody around? No. I followed the plan. You remember the plan, don't you? I don't know about this, Caesar. Will you cross the street? Tell me when we're in front of our mark. All right, all right, but please be quiet. Hey! What's going on? 
I lost my footing on the curb. The street lamp is out. Good. That's a break. Are we on the sidewalk now? Now we're in front of the the deli. All the lights off inside? Aye, all off. Is the coast clear? Yes, yes. There's no one coming in either direction. Okay. You know what to do. Stop wasting time. Move already. Are you sure about this? Sure, I'm sure. Take the hammer out of your pocket. That's it. Now do it! You didn't tell me there'd be an alarm! Get inside before somebody sees you. Move! Now you got it, buddy. Go for the cash register. Ha ha ha! We're in business! Ha 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 ha! Eighty-three, eighty-four, eighty-five. There you are, Mrs. Gadehi, all paid up. Oh, my, my, isn't it nice to pay one's bills? The nicest, ma'am. The best way to start a grand new morning. Better count it again, Aunt Jean. Now, no need for that. I don't trust it. See if it's real. Now, Susan, be a good girl and go tidy up your room. Don't be fresh to Mr. West. He made a new start in life, haven't you, Mr. West? Ah, sure enough. A new start. Jonathan has a job? I don't believe it. Oh, pay no attention to her, Mr. West. You know how children are these days. Yes, yes, I understand. Now, if you've no objection, I'll be going on to my room. I want to get these groceries put away. Surely. See you later, Mr. West. No doubt. believe it. Nothing but a lousy thief. <laughs> what a way to make a living. You couldn't make it any other way. What's happened to me? What am I? A no-talent guy who throws his voice. That's worse than that. A second-rate burglar. Third-rate. Starving to death in the only profession I know, paying the bills by robbing a restaurant. Well, that's showbiz. Jonathan? Now who is he talking to? Worse, I guess. <laughs> I wasn't so bad, considering it was my opening performance. Before you start taking too many bows, let me straighten you out. Oh, ease off, will you, Caesar? Not a chance. You're running out of time. Let me spell it out. You act penny ante because you think penny ante. That's the story of your life. From now on, you're going to listen to me. We're moving up to the big time. Big time? Last night was just for openers. Tell me something. Your dream was always to play the palace, right? Well, sure. Okay, buddy. Stick with me. Get ready. For what? You're going to play the palace after all. From now on, you're on top of the bill. Strictly... Big time! The way you make it sound, I don't know if I like it. Oh, you'll like it, all right. You're going to be a star, buddy boy. Nothing but first class all the way. Top of the world, pal. <laughs> Top of the world. <laughs> Oh, Mrs. Kadehi. Yes? I'll be going out now. What's that? Just for a few minutes. If I get any calls, take down the number, will you please? Surely, Mr. West. Have a pleasant afternoon. Where are you going, Jonathan? Out of the way, Susan. You better be nice to me or I'll tell my aunt. Tell her what? Oh, things. I know what you're doing. You do, huh? And what's that? I heard you talking in your room. I wasn't talking to anyone. Yes, you were. You and Caesar. Now listen, you little... Susan. Susan, please. You, you, you know it isn't nice to eavesdrop on people. Stay away from me. I'm not going to hurt you. But you shouldn't pry into other people's business. You, you don't know what you might find. Like what? Never you mind. Now, I, I'm going out. 
to buy the morning paper, and when I get back, maybe I will teach you the art of ventriloquism. <laughs> That's what you want to know, isn't it? Won't that be fun? That's what you said before. But this time, I mean it. You'll see. Now you, you be a good girl. I'll be right back. Susan, is that you? Yes, Aunt Jean. Come here and help me. In a minute. Be right there. He's so dumb. He forgot to lock his door. Doesn't he ever clean this place up? There you are, Caesar, sitting in that chair like you're real. Well, you're not. You're a dummy. Where'd you get that cigar? Don't you know there's no smoking? I'll get rid of it for you. Look at your little clothes in the closet. Think you're pretty smart, don't you, Mr. Stuckup? You better answer me or I'll wreck all your stuff. Come on, say something. I dare you. Uh-oh, here he comes. Well, just you wait. I'll be back. I know you can talk. I heard you. Hello, Jonathan. Susan. I gotta go. Wait a minute. You weren't in my room, were you? Let go of my arm. You're hurting me. Why is the door open? I'll tell my aunt. Didn't she teach you to stay out of other people's rooms? What were you doing in there? Wouldn't you like to know? You little brat. Tell me. Why don't you ask him? Caesar, what happened? Your cigar. What did she do to you? Never mind. First things first. Where's my paper? Here. Open it for me. Later. We've got to get out of this place. Calm down, jerk. I mean it, Caesar. She knows too much. Hang on. After tonight's job, we'll be on Easy Street. I told you, I'm not cut out for this line of work. Will you cool it? You're eating better, aren't you? You're paying the rent? Where were you before? Nowhere. Now listen to me. This is the big one. The really big show. This is the last time for me. The end. Sure. Sure it is, pal. Now, I got it all worked out. Here's what we do. All clear so far. There's nobody in the club. Then get a move on. Where? Mike, I told you, the front office. What's that? Nothing. Probably a mouse. Is that what you are? A mouse? Caesar, please. I'm doing my best. Then stop shaking. You make me nervous. Keep walking. Backstage, remember? I got it. Where are we now? I think this is the door. Use the flashlight. What does it say? Manager? Bingo! Now hurry up. I'm trying. And don't forget, if the night watchman shows up, stay cool. You're looking for Mr. Miller... You were supposed to meet him here. Use the screwdriver, then the ice pick. Nice and slow, like I told you. Look, suppose I can't open it. You opened the back door, didn't you? This is a different kind of lock. I can't, Caesar. Stop whining. You want to be poor again? There. Now go on in. Go! I don't know a thing about safe cracking, Caesar. Put your ear to it. Turn the dial till it clicks. Patience, buddy, patience. I'm not sure. That's it. Now reverse. That a boy. Pull the handle and you're ready. Will you look at all that money? Never mind the coins. Grab the real dough. All right, all right. Now let's get out of here. Hold on. Who's there? Uh, it's just me. Um, Jonathan West. Ventriloquist. Oh? You remember me? Can't say as I do. Uh, Mr. Miller told me to meet him here after the club closed, but I, I, I guess I missed him. Already gone, has he? That's right. Oh, well, then uh, I'll just be on my way. Uh, hold on. Uh, what's in the case? Uh, this. Wait, uh, you remember Caesar? <laughs> Don't you? Caesar, say hello to the, to the nice gentleman. Howdy doody, Your Honor. Oh, sure. From the other day. The audition. Yeah, Mr. Miller left about 15 minutes ago. Did he know? Uh, well, um, I'll give him a call. I would now like to give you my impression of the great Jimmy Cagney. Oh, dirty rat. 
Come on, Kappa. You, you're the guy. The guy who killed my brother. Never mind, Caesar. We, we won't be holding you up any longer. Sure thing. <laughs> Some act you got there, mister. Ain't you gonna count the money? That was close. Too close. What are you doing? You're not going to bed, are you? The night still got braces on its teeth. I'd feel a whole lot better if that watchman hadn't shown up. Stop worrying. I'll cover for you. I'm your alibi. But if he reports me... Not you, pal. Us. We're a team. I'm behind you all the way. Sure, sure, I know. But what if... Shut up about it already. All right, you want to turn in? Go ahead. Get your rest. You're gonna need it. Tomorrow's a whole new day. We'll be living the high life from here on out. Here, Susan, eat your breakfast. Aunt Jean? Every bit of it. Aunt Jeanie, can I see the paper? You can read the funnies later. Not the funnies, the front page. Now, what would you want to see that for? Drink your orange juice. If I do... No deals. You're a growing girl. Hmm, what's this? Karaoke club robbed last night. Thieves loot manager's office. <gasps> Saints preserve us. It's just as well you don't read the paper, child. How are you coming with your eggs? Susan? Susan? Susan, come here this minute. Hello? Police department? You better come quick. I know who robbed the karaoke club last night. Eat up, pal. I'm not hungry. Not even for steak and eggs? You must be sick. Let me feel your head. When I think of what it took to buy that steak, it makes me lose my appetite. You like a roof over your head, don't you? I'm a thief. Plain and simple. Here we go again. A man has to live with himself, even if it's in the gutter. Go on. Ain't you gonna answer the door? I knew it. What am I gonna do? Mr. West! Relax, buddy boy. Oh, hello, Mrs. Uh, Mr. West. These two gentlemen, they're from the police. They'd like a word with you. Why, of, of course. Jonathan West? Yeah, that's, that's me. Um, what can I do for you? Well, it has to do with... Thank you, ma'am. We'll handle it. What, what seems to be the problem, officers? We'd like to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. Of course. I I'll just be downstairs. Would you mind waiting a moment, ma'am? You may be of some help. Glad to. Uh, Mr. West is one of my favorite boarders. Here, yeah, Mrs. Cadet, uh, please sit down. Sorry, I'm a, a little short of chairs. <laughs> it's just a room for one, me and my friend here. But it suits us fine, doesn't it, Caesar? Say hello to the gentleman. Mr. West, where were you last night about midnight? Where was I? Uh, well, that's easy. Right here, same as always. Was I, Mrs. Cadet? Well, I do know that you don't usually go out in the evening, but I couldn't say for certain. The sergeant down at the desk received an anonymous phone call. Said we should talk to you. Why? I never go out that late. <laughs> we were here all night, were we, Caesar? You didn't go to the karaoke club? You mean the nightclub? Because the watchman said he saw you there. Tell them, Caesar. Tell them. Who's he talking to? The dummy? Please, Caesar, tell them. Tell them how he wanted to play the palace. Mr. West. You don't believe me? Ask him. Caesar, tell them how we, we tried to get a job. We had nothing to eat. The, the rent was overdue, wasn't it, Mr. Cadehi? Oh, Mr. West. Caesar, please tell them so they'll understand what a failure I am. How you tried to help me? I'm not really a thief. Caesar, you're the smart one. I'm, I'm down on my knees. I'm begging you, tell them. Stand up, Mr. West. You better come with us. But Caesar, you said it was the two of us from now on. That's what he said. I swear. He said we were a team. Come on with us, Mr. West. We need to take you down to the station. Oh, he's always been such a decent man. He's a no-good crook, isn't he, Caesar? Come on. You don't have to pretend. I won't tell. I promise. 
Look at this mess. Who's going to take care of you now, Caesar? Okay, go ahead. Act like you don't hear me. I don't care. You won't even turn your head or blink your eyes. All right, be that way. Just remember, I know you can talk. Because I heard you last night. Psst. Hey, you. Caesar? Yeah, you. Come on back, honey. I knew you talked. I knew it. And I know you finked on him. Pretty smart. The way you made that call. You're a hip little kid. I like you. Lean down. I want to ask you something. What? You like living here with your aunt? That's a stupid question. I bet you'd like to run away from this flea trap. Okay. Listen. From now on, it's you and me. We'll go to New York. I'll show you the bright lights. I know where the money is. What do you say? Well, you are kind of cute. Don't forget the suitcase. It's a deal, Caesar. Come on. Just you and me, kid. The big time. We're a team, see? A team. An unlikely pair, a little girl and a wooden doll, a lethal dummy carved in the shape of a man. This is just a fantasy, of course, because everybody knows dummies can't talk unless they happen to learn their vocabulary in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at TwilightZoneRadio.com. Caesar and Me, starring Jason Alexander with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for the Twilight Zone by Adele T. Strasfield. Heard in the cast were Zanny Laird, Meg Falcon, Rich Komenik, Lisa Joyce, Jeff Lupiton, Doug James, Roderick Peoples, C.J. Amari, Lynn Foley, and Carl Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone.
Paper, paper, get your afternoon paper. Many are dying and many are dead. Oh, hi, Miss Maitland. Hello, Vincent. How are you today? Can't complain. Paper? Of course, a paper. What would Daddy say? Well, maybe he'd be better off. Not much good news today. Oh, I'm sure you're mistaken about that. Take a look around. Isn't it a beautiful day? If you say so, Miss Maitland. Paper, get your paper here. Hey. Hey, you with the rich boyfriend? Don't be so stuck up. Sal. Come on. Just because I'm a big success now, that don't make me stuck up. Whose convertible is that? Oh, it couldn't be mine, huh? Just like that. I asked you a question, Sal. Whose is it? A guy named Halper. Halper. He's about 174 years old, and he owns half of Connecticut. <laughs> Can you imagine wheels like this, wasted on a creep who's all ready to get planted? How do you know him? I got me a new job, washing cars in his building, and I noticed this gadget was getting anxious for some action. I'm serious. The battery could have run down. He doesn't know you have it. What's the difference? He wants to go somewhere. He's got a chauffeur. Drives him around in a big black battleship. He doesn't use this baby once a month. So you took it. I borrowed it. It's okay, honest. He digs me. I've been doing little favors for him. He wouldn't care. Come on, get in. Thanks anyway, Sal. I'm not lying. The only time old man Halpert uses this is to go to try to pick up chicks. Reminds him of when he was a kid or something. Sal, I'm tired. I've been at work all day. So what? And I promised Dad I'd stay home with him tonight. Ah, for the love of. Bye, Sal. Okay, okay. Watch how I can make nice. Gee, uh, that's too bad. So, I'll borrow the wheels again Friday night and pick you up. Okay? Now, wasn't that polite? Just like one of those college boys? Sal, I meant what I said last time. No, you didn't. I don't think we should see each other anymore. What's that supposed to mean? I shouldn't have let it get started in the first place. Yeah, so long as you're the saintly social worker and I'm one of the crumbs, then it's okay, ain't it? It's only when we get real close. You notice I got dirt on my hands. You know that has nothing to do with it. Plus, I don't talk like your old man. I've tried to explain. We're just not two people who. Two people who could ever get along. With all the education you got, you ought to be able to swing a better dear John than that. I'm sorry, Sal. Listen. I ain't always gonna have dirt on my hands, and I don't need books to tell me which way is up. I know the map, and I'll get there. You'll see. Is anything wrong, Leah? No, nothing, Dad. Nothing at all, Dad. I heard your voices. Hello, Sal. I'll wheel you back in. That won't be necessary. I can do it. Feel better now that you finally convinced her she's too good for a bum like me. Sal, I won't pretend that I. Pick you for my daughter, I wouldn't. But ultimately, it's not my decision; it's hers. I'm willing to admit I may have been wrong about you. She's obviously seen you quite differently from the way I have. Not anymore. Come on, Daddy. I'm sorry, Sal. Just once in my life, why can't I want something and get it? Just once. Ow! My hand. Ah, my hand. Confidential personnel file on Salvador Ross. Personality: a volatile mixture of fury and frustration. Distinguishing physical characteristics: one badly broken fist, injured by striking a closed door, and requiring emergency treatment at the nearest hospital. Ambition: shows great determination for self-improvement. Estimate of potential success: a sure bet for the latest edition of Who's Who. Published in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story: the self-improvement of Salvador Ross, starring Luke Perry with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Blue team, I see you. Please, blue team, I see you. City Hospital Emergency Room. That would be general admissions. I'll transfer you. 
Emergency, please hold. There, I filled out your forms. Now can I see a doctor? Take a seat, sir. I already took a seat 45 minutes ago. Is your name on the list? Yeah, right there. See? Ross. R-O-S-S. -S. Well, you'll have to wait your turn, Mr. Ross, like everybody else. How long? I'll call you. When? A doctor will be with you as soon as possible. Hey, I got me a busted hand here. I'm in pain. So is everyone else in this waiting room. Now, if you won't sit down and wait your turn... When is my turn, huh? Next week? Next year? I've been waiting as long as I can remember for somebody to pay attention. I got problems too, you know. I ain't some mug off the street. Lower your voice, or I'll call security. Go ahead, call him. If that's what it takes to get respect around here... Security to the front desk, please. Who's next, Miss Olson? Oh, doctor, I was just... Something the matter? This patient doesn't want to follow procedure. Damn right I don't. What are you running here, a hospital or a torture chamber? I got me a little problem, and if you don't want to do something about it... What's the injury? His hand. You see this? I got broken bones in there. If you'd ever busted your hand, you'd know what I'm talking about. Hmm. Abrasions on the knuckles. In a fight, were you? Forget it. I'm getting out of here. Hold on. I said don't worry about it. Are you in serious pain? Oh, you don't think I can take it? I ain't some wimp. All right, clean up the abrasions, then send them down for an x-ray. Yes, doctor. This way, Mr. Ross. Now, who's next? Miller? Here we are, Mr. Ross. What's this, the charity floor? The orthopedic ward is full, but you'll be fine in here for tonight. You're sharing with, let me see, Mr. Armstrong. Hey, Sonny. Hi yourself, old man. I'll put your clothing bag in the closet. Bet if I was some rich guy, I'd have my own private room, right? It's just for one night. Look, why don't you let me go on home? The doctor has to prepare the cast after he's seen the x-rays in the morning. For now, the splint will have to do. Just don't put any pressure on it. Yeah, yeah. There you go. You adjust the bed with these buttons. If you need anything, press this one for the nurse's station. <sighs> right. Good night, Mr. Ross. Hey, nurse. Yes? What's the button for, room service? The button for... Chow. What's a guy got to do to get a burger and fries up here? Oh, you mean dinner. Uh, food services will be by any time now. Good. That's okay, then. Good night again. Mind if I watch my program? Be my guest. Do something to your hand. No, I just stopped in for a good night's sleep. The Waldorf was getting on my nerves. <coughs> I bet it hurts. You got that right. Don't worry. They bring you pills every few hours. <laughs> Great. You're lucky, though. Yeah, I ought to be on TV. No, <clears throat> I'm serious. <clears throat> I've got this congestion in my chest. You griping about a cold? At your age, it might be just a cold. At mine, it could turn into pneumonia. Excuse me while I turn on the tears. You should appreciate what you got. Know something, boy? You could break both legs and you'd be running the hundred-yard dash inside a month. Yeah? Well, if you think this feels so great, let's swap. You take the broken hand. I'll take your lousy cold. <laughs> it's a deal. <coughs> Knock yourself out, old man. I'm gonna catch some Z's. Mr. Ross? Are you awake? Yeah. I brought your pain pill. Goody. You've been a good boy. You didn't ring for more medication. I must have fell asleep. I'll leave your pills on the side table. Thanks. Doctor will be in in the morning. Till then, get some rest and be careful of that splint. Yeah, right. Hey. What's going on? My hand don't hurt anymore. I didn't even take the pill. <coughs> Old man. Old man. What? Oh, my hand. What's the matter with my hand? Hurts, huh? Oh. Sure it does. <clears throat> and me. All I got's a head cold. Some bargain we made, huh, Pops? Oh, no, please. I want to swap back. Uh, 
Sorry, all deals are final. Please, it'll never heal. Not at my age. Well, later, Pops. <clears throat> I'm gonna put my clothes on and blow this joint while the going's good. There you go, one draft. Thanks, Dan. Uh, can you put it on my tab? Afraid not, Billy. Cash on the barrelhead. But you know I'm good for it. Sure you are. And I'm on Donald Trump's payroll. Can't do it, Billy boy. Been a slow night. All right. Hey. How you doing, Sal? Five by five all the way. Say, Stan, I want you to help me try something. What's that? <coughs> Excuse me. How much money you got in the till? Sorry, Sal. No touches today. <coughs> That's a pretty bad cough. Don't worry. It's getting better already. And I don't want no loan. That's a relief. So, uh, how much you got? I don't know. A uh, bill and a half, maybe? Bill and a half. Okay. It'd be worth uh, 150 for you to have, I don't know, say, to have hair again? To have what? You heard me. Hair. A big old thick head of hair, like mine. So, whatever you've been drinking, you didn't get it here. But listen to me. I'm just asking you a question. If this is a rib, I don't like it. I know. But this is no joke. Let's say I could give you a full head of hair again. Would you pay me what's in the drawer? Sure, Sal. And if you get me in the movies while you're at it, I'll give you a bonus. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay. Now you agreed to it. The deal's set. <laughs> so when do I collect the fur? I don't know exactly, but I swear, you'll get it. Mr. Ross? Mr. Ross, you have a telephone call. Sal, are you in there? Yeah, Mrs. Olaf. There's a phone call for you. Please tell your friends not to call in the middle of the night. There's a limit. Okay. I was sound asleep. You're not the only one. Why, Sal, what what happened to your... Hello? Yeah, this is me. Stan? I know. Never mind, Hal. You got what you wanted, didn't you? I said it ain't your business, Hal. Good. Well, tell her to run her fingers through it. I'll be by in the morning to collect. Bye. From now on, no calls after 10 o'clock, and... Sal, what have you done to yourself? Shaving your head like... Like one of those gang boys. If you only knew how ridiculous you look that way. Why, why where are you going? Do you know what time it is? I gotta go out. Out of my way, cat. Who's there? Does somebody want to roll me? Well, I ain't got nothing, so leave me alone. Billy, I thought that was you. What are you doing here, Sal? To tell the truth, I was looking for you. What for? How's Stan doing? Oh, Stan? He's great. Oh, you should have seen him. Once it happened, he called free drinks all around. You mean his hair? That's right. Uh, I took me a little nap, and when I woke up, he must have had a wig or something. So happy to have hair he could spit. How'd he look? Oh, like a new man. Hey, Sal, what happened to you? Is something wrong with your head? It looks like you shaved yours. You like the way Stan looked, Billy? No, you wouldn't. You got yourself a nice full head of hair, thick and black. Same as mine used to be. Of course, it could use a good washing, but that's no problem. What are you talking about? Oh, nothing much. Just a little deal between you and me. Strictly business. Could you use some extra money, Billy? Sure. Because I'm about to come into some cash. As soon as I see Stan. If you want, I could see my way clear to let you have, say, 75? How does 75 bucks sound? In exchange for something you won't even miss. Just think. You won't have to worry about combing it or anything anymore. Say what?
Afternoon, Mr. Halper. Park it for me, Sal. You got it, sir. And no dents. This car cost me plenty. It sure must have. Don't you worry. <laughs> Here, give me a hand. Here you go, Mr. Halper. You had to drive yourself today? I didn't have much choice. But he's got to have a day off. After this, if that chauffeur wants to work for me, he can buy George work seven days or none at all. You know, I'd be glad to drive you any time, Mr. Halper. Hmm? Yes. Traffic's bad these days. Full of madness. It sure is. Here's the elevator. I was hoping for a chance to talk to you. About what? I've got... Well, you might say I've got something to sell. Anything worth buying? I've already got it. Hiya, Mr. Halpert. Going up? Yes, Andrew, all the way. And no stops. No stops it is. Not this, you haven't. Haven't what? Hold the door for me, Andrew. Yes, sir. You haven't got what I'm selling. Well, what is it? Something you can't buy anywhere else in the world, from anyone else but me. You'll say it's the best purchase you have ever made in your life. The best, Mr. Halpert. Get in, we'll talk. No problem. The penthouse, Andrew. That's what I figured, sir. Now as to this item you mentioned. As I recall, you've not seen my apartment before. That's right, I haven't. It's, uh, quite a pad, Mr. Halpert. And a strange one for a man of my age. Is that what you're thinking? You mean the modern art and everything? Oh, no, I always figured you still knew how to swing. I keep it this way for my new friends. <laughs> I bet you really wow the chicks, don't you, sir? Well, let's see it. What? This marvelous item you think I should purchase. You're looking at it, Mr. Halpert. What am I looking at? Youth. That's what I want to sell you. All right, boy, that's enough. Get out of here. I know it sounds wild, but I mean it. Sir, I'm telling you the absolute truth, and you can take that to the bank. I warn you, if you have any half-headed idea of robbing me, the security devices I've installed... I ain't interested in robbery. I don't have to be. I'm telling you, I got something to sell. Something that you want more than anything else. <laughs> you, eh? So you bottle it? Is that it? Some sort of tonic? If you'll just give me a chance. Now. I read in the paper where you're 76 years old. That's correct. I'm 26. Congratulations. Now, if you don't mind... What would you give to be 26 again, Mr. Halpert? I'm beginning to think you're the craziest kid they ever let out onto the streets. Okay. Think that. Just play along with me for a minute. It ain't gonna hurt you one bit. Now, what would you give? Let's say... a million dollars? All right, let's say a million dollars. I'd gladly give that to be 26 again, if such a thing were possible. Tell me about this pad. What about it? You own it? Of course I own it. I don't see what that has to do with... Would you throw it in? What? Into the deal. Just how do you propose to deliver this fountain of youth you're raving about? By selling you years. My own years off of my life. <laughs> well, boy, I'll tell you what you do. You gift wrap those ears and mail them to me. Just be sure you don't send them COD. For now, if you don't mind, I'll show you the door. The apartment. You didn't say. Is it part of the deal? Uh, why, of course it is. I wouldn't want to take your years for a penny less than they're worth. <sighs> a million dollars. And this apartment? Done. What is? You just bought yourself 50 years. <laughs> I'm sure I did, boy. Uh, no, you're not sure. But trust me, Mr. Halpert, you've got a pleasant surprise coming real soon. It's open. Here's that newspaper you ordered. Come in, Andrew. You know my name? Sure. Sure I do. Mr. Halpert told me about you. He did, huh? Oh, you must be the new owner of this place. That's right. Did we ever meet before? I don't think so. Funny, you look kind of familiar. Oh, I've been staying in, but I know you run the elevator. Yep, that's me. 
Hey, what happened to old man Halpert? I mean, uh, Mr. Halpert. He decided to take a long cruise. Oh. With some young friends of his. And, and since he planned to be away for a long time, he agreed to lease me this place. Yeah, that sounds like Mr. Halpert. How do you mean? Well, he sure knows how to spend money. Except when it comes to tipping, that is. And you need your tips, don't you? You're not kidding. Nobody could make it in this building without him. Drink? Ah, uh, no thanks. I'm working. How much do you make a week? Well, I'd be embarrassed to tell you, but it's sure not that much. Without tips, it doesn't go very far. This should help, then. A picture of Andrew Jackson? Just for bringing the paper? Mister, I have a feeling you're gonna get good service around here. Real good. Hey, if there's anything you ever need, just ask for me. Wait a minute. Yeah? How'd you like to make some more money? Quite a bit more. Sure, uh, as long as it's legal. How old are you? Nineteen. Would you like to be twenty? Huh? It's only a year, right? Oh, I'll figure I'll make it one of these days. Sure. You've got plenty of time. No rush. What would you say if somebody offered to buy a year of your life for as much as you can earn in a few months? Right now, so you wouldn't have to wait for the money. If somebody said that to me, well, I guess I'd tell them to take a flying leap at the moon. You wouldn't sell a year for all that money? Think of what you could do if you had it. Well, it's like this. I guess I enjoy being this age. They say you only go around once. True. The days can get pretty boring, but there are some nights I wouldn't swap for anything. <laughs> know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Nice talking to you, sir. Uh, be seeing you. Wait. Yeah? Come back for a minute. Yes, sir. Come in. Close the door. Okay. You thought I was joking, didn't you? I, I don't think I get what you're talking about, exactly. Here. This should make it clear. What's your full name? Andrew Grow. You can fill that in yourself. Now, does this make it a little more reasonable? Mister, this is a check for $10,000. That's right, Andrew. What do I have to do? I told you. Nothing. If you take it, you'll wake up a year older tomorrow, that's all. And you'll have a whole lot more money to spend. I guess so. Think of what you could do with it. Dates, nightclubs, anything you like. Now, tell me the truth. Do you really care whether you're 19 or 20? Does 12 months make that much of a difference? Well, when you put it that way, I guess 20's a pretty good age. Just as good as 19. Maybe better. Then you've made a deal, Andrew. A very good one. Be careful with that check till you get to the bank. Sure. Uh, nice doing business with you, Mr... Mr... Ross. And Andrew. You might pass the word along to your friends. I'm always good for cash. On the same terms. Oh, they'll be beating down your door. Who knows? I might decide to sell you a couple more years myself. I'll be here. And thank you, Andrew. Nice doing business with you, too. Oh, you're welcome, Mr. Ross. My pleasure. Believe me, the pleasure's all mine. Yes? Who is it? Give me a moment. Sal. Hello, Mr. Maitland. Is Leah home yet? No, she isn't. What are you... You don't mind if I wait, do you? You're certainly looking successful. We haven't seen you for quite some time. Well, you see, I've been busy, Mr. Maitland. Moving up. Making myself worthy of your daughter. You should be happy. Do something for me, Sal. As a favor, please. Leave her alone. Come on, look. The fingernails are clean now. Manicured, even. I've got the right shoes, the right clothes. Yes, you certainly do. I told you I was going to improve myself, and I always keep my word. You're obviously doing very well, Sal. And I applaud that. I'm glad for you. Well, then, don't ask me to leave her alone anymore. I'm a catch, Mr. Maitland, a real catch. Not 
for Leah. Well, we'll just see about that, won't we? Sal, I don't want to play on your pity, but the truth is, I'm going to die soon, and when that happens, Leah will have no one. Now don't you worry, Mr. Maitland. She'll have someone to take care of her from now on. You've got my word on it. Not you. It mustn't be you. Yes, as a matter of fact, it must be me. I don't know what made you so superior. I just don't get it. What have you ever done that's so great? Teaching in that rat trap school all your life? No, not even teaching, just babysitting. I think I've heard enough. Even in the war, what did you get? A gimpy leg and a few souvenirs. A couple of crummy guns to hang on the wall. Old, same as you. You're a loser, you know that. Even worse than I used to be. I suppose you want Leah to marry someone just like you. I'll have to admit you're making some sense, Sal. Do you think you'd be a good husband to her? I can buy her anything if I want to. Anything. And do you love her? I want her, Mr. Maitland. Unfortunately, that isn't enough, Sal. She needs a man who can be... I picked up a few things for dinner on the way home. Daddy, how was your... Oh. Hello, Sal. Hello, Leah. Your father and I were just having a little chat. Were you? I should have gotten to know him better before. But back then, I couldn't have talked to him on this level. I can now, can't I, Mr. Maitland? I've spent a lot of time improving myself. You're certainly looking prosperous. Oh, you know how it is. I hit some luck, that's all. You even sound different. You noticed that. Well, I met this young fellow who was going to college. He needed some extra money, so we made a, a deal. He helped me out on the side, gave me lessons to uh, improve the way I talk. You must have worked very hard at it. Oh, yeah. I've discovered some talents I never knew I had. Seems like I learned quickly. Very quickly. Just what is your new job? I can tell you all about it over dinner. Dinner? Any place you like. Oh, that's something else I've learned. Where to go and how to act. I, uh... I don't think I'd better this evening. I told my father I'd... But now that I've improved myself so much, not even your father has a reason to object. Do you, Mr. Maitland? You're a grown woman, Leah. I've never tried to tell you what to do. You know that. Well... I would like to hear all about what's happened, if you're sure. As you wish. Just give me a minute, Sal. Take your time. Don't worry, Mr. Maitland. I'll have your daughter home early. I promise. Let's take our champagne onto the balcony, shall we? I'll open the French windows. If you like, Sal. Like the view? It's lovely. Your entire place is lovely. But, Sal... <laughs> Don't worry. Every dime is not only legal, but honest. A businessman's well-earned reward. What sort of business? Uh-uh. You're not getting all my secrets. Maybe someday I'll explain it to you. After we're married. What? You do know I'm going to marry you. It's getting cold. You might say I did it all for you. Oh, I won't pretend I haven't enjoyed it along the way, but I always had a goal. I wish you hadn't. Come here. Sal, please. Now tell me you feel nothing. That was never the problem. I have to go. Then what was the problem? Y you broke off because I wasn't right for you. What kind of guy is right for you, Leah? Just tell me. I'll be that guy. It doesn't work that way. Well, I've got a surprise for you. It does with me. I can buy anything I want, and I can be anything I want. I wish I could explain it to you. It's not something you can buy. No? You name it. Sal, I'm talking about the kind of person you are. The way you feel about things and people. I'm not criticizing you. It's just the way you are. What way? The man I marry will have to be a kind man, gentle. He'll have to be, what word can I use? Compassionate. I couldn't love him otherwise. You mean a patsy, like your father, always ready to get pushed around? I mean a man who cares about other people just because they're people. And since you brought it up, yes, 
I think my father's a compassionate man. So you see, it's not something you can buy. Not even if you had your own private mint. Don't be so sure. Oh, there you are, Leah. Sal? You didn't have to wait up for us, Mr. Mayland. Here she is, safe and sounder than when she left. Have a nice evening. You certainly look as though you did. I'm sorry, Daddy, but it is nice to think that someone worries about me. Don't flatter yourself, my dear. Actually, I wanted to talk to Sal. In that case, if you'll excuse me, Sal, I've got a big day tomorrow. Good night. I'm glad you came in, Sal. You're going to be even gladder, Mr. Maitland. I've given it some thought. I realize now that you're the way you are, and it's not my place to judge you. Look, I don't care anything about Please, it. Please, let me finish. I've also decided that I can't let you ruin her life by marrying her. You thought of a way to stop it? Not yet. But there must be one. I could try begging you, Sal. Mr. Maitland, I'm not interested in your begging or your silly little threats. I came here to talk business. I don't understand. I'm going to make you an offer. I want to buy something from you, and I'm prepared to give you $500,000 for it. What did you just say? Now just let that figure roll around in your mind for a minute. 500,000 cash. That's enough to take care of you for the time you've got left. And to provide for Leah so that she can do whatever she wants. Now, you say you're worried about what will happen to her when you die. Okay, here's your chance to fix it up just the way you want it. What do I have that's worth that kind of money? Mind if I sit down? It's a little difficult to explain. Something the matter, Sal? Hmm? Uh, oh, no, no, not at all. You seem so quiet. I was just thinking. About what? You. Oh, Sal. It must have been hard for you, working, going to school, taking care of your father. Oh, I never really thought about it. Well, I have, since yesterday. I never understood you before, but I think I'm beginning to now. You're a wonderful person, Leah. You deserve the best from now on. And I'll do my best to see that you have it. Sal, honestly, what's gotten into you? I'm finally seeing things clearly. Is your father home? I, I want to tell him how I feel now so he won't be concerned. Don't worry about Daddy. He only wants what's good for me. But I'm a grown woman. Hold on. Let me get the door for you. I think I'm capable of getting out of a car. I'm sure you are. But I want to. Hello, Daddy. Did you have something to eat? I left a meal in the refrigerator. Yes, thank you. Hello there, Mr. Maitland. I was hoping you were here. I find that hard to believe. I wanted to talk to you. May I come in? Well, I ask my permission. You must be cold, Daddy. Here, let me straighten your blanket. No, let me. Why, thank you, Sal. Leah, would you excuse us for a few minutes? Well, all right. I'll just freshen up. Go ahead, Sal. Say your piece. If you don't mind, sir. Well, I do have something to say. Just that... I'm sorry. What? For all the worry and grief I've caused you. You were right about me. I wanted to marry Leah to prove something. She was a prize. A symbol. But that's all changed, Mr. Maitland. I realize now how much I love her. And I will make her a good husband. I promise you. I warned you I would not let it happen. Please, Mr. Maitland, hear me out. It's different now. I've changed. Have you? I'm asking you for forgiveness, Mr. Maitland. Compassion. Oh, yes. A sterling human quality. Sir, your blanket. Let me fix it. Wait. What's in your hand? Isn't that one of your, your war souvenirs? I hope it's not loaded. Be careful. Compassion. But don't you remember, Sal? I don't have any left. I sold it to you. Yesterday. No, please. Wait! 
The Salvador Ross Program for Self-Improvement. The all-in-one, surefire course that lets you lick the bully, learn the language, dance the tango, and anything else you want or think you want to do. Oh, and there's a money-back guarantee. But the offer is strictly limited to the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. The Self-Improvement of Salvador Ross, starring Luke Perry with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by Jerry McNeely from a story by Henry Slesser. Heard in the cast were Alyssa Fraden, David Darlow, Doug James, Jeff Lupiton, Joseph Minoso, Ivan Vega, Tim Rose, Meg Falcon, and Mike Castle. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Well, Mr. Jensen, I think I have the basics here. Oh, yeah? 41 years old, unmarried, no physical ailments, no previous visits to a psychiatrist. No previous arrest either, okay? And the only time I ever saw a shrink before was in a cartoon. Best you'll find us helpful and, at worst, harmless. Cigarette? No, thanks. Do you mind if I smoke? Hey, go ahead. It's your office. Now then, uh, your occupation? Oh, gosh, various jobs. Part-time bookie, I was a car dealer. I attended bar one time, right down the street from here. A couple of doors down. Andy's place. I was a butcher. Highly successful butcher, too. Knew how to make my thumbs weigh 12 pounds on the scale. So what do you say, Doc? How do I stack up? Normal? Abnormal? Subnormal? What's the story? <laughs> Family? Father, mother, both married. Scranton, Pennsylvania. My old man was a coal miner. Coal? Yeah, you know, little black things that people used to put in the furnaces. Sounds like interesting work. Oh, it does. Then maybe you ought to go to a psychiatrist. You know, I think I will take one of those cigarettes. Surely. <sighs> what, do you want me to pull up a couch now or something? Not if you're comfortable in the chair. Let's begin, shall we? <laughs> Nothing shakes you up at all, does it, Doc? How do you mean? Oh, I don't know. Everything's all calm and cool. You know, when I walked in here, you made an inventory. The cut of the clothes, the way I talk, and up inside your head, huh? That's where you mark down those results. And then later you put it all in little pigeonholes. You got me pegged, don't you? Not entirely. You figure you're talking to what? Maybe a minor league horse player, huh? 
Maybe I'm a little hungover, maybe a little buggy in the head. But either way, about 40 degrees tilt. Hey, my cigarette went out. Here. <sighs> All right. Picture all this, Dr. Gillespie. If said minor league horse player tells you some half-witted story, can you tell him if he's maybe off his rocker? Without Sigmund Freud and all that junk? Huh? Can you tell me in plain English what is wrong with me? I can try. All right. Here goes. I keep having a dream. A crazy dream. Are you writing this stuff down? Go on. I'll make notes on the things that seem pertinent. Well, I don't know if any of this is pertinent. Because it probably sounds nuts. Sounds nuts to me. But there it is. I'm listening. I've had this dream maybe, uh, I don't know, five, six times. What kind of dream? The real kind. How do you mean? Have you ever had a dream that you swear was real? I guess we all have. Over and over again? The same dream? The same dream, identical. Never changes. Tell me about it. It always begins the same way. I'm lying in a bed, and I just wake up all of a sudden, right? I open my eyes, start looking around. And what do you see? Hotel room. You know, nothing fancy. I mean, nice, regular. You know, like Venetian blinds, like, like you got here. So I get up, I go across the room with my bare feet, all right? Now I'm wearing pajamas that definitely are not mine. And I open up the blinds. Bright sun, blue sky, beautiful day. Beach, palm trees, like a vacation, you know? So open up the window. You get those, uh, what, those French doors, whatever you call them. And what do I hear? Steel guitars, ukuleles, you know, that, that, that hula music. The only thing is I've never been to Hawaii in my life. I don't even know what Hawaii looks like, except, you know, what you see in the movies. But it's as real as anything. And here's the crazy part. I, I don't know how I got there. But I do know, as well as I know anything in my life, that I'm supposed to be thousands of miles away. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing, Doc, that I could do about it. And that's when things get really weird. I mean, just bizarre. Once upon a time, there was a psychiatrist named Arnold Gillespie and a patient whose name was Peter Jensen. Mr. Jensen walked into the office exactly nine minutes ago. You might want to make note of that. It is 11 o'clock, Saturday morning, October 5th. You might want to make note of that, too, very specifically. It may seem trite to be so specific about the hour and the day, but in this case, it's of extreme importance. Because this isn't just a story about a man with a recurrent dream, one whose meaning the good doctor is about to help him unravel and sort out. Nothing so simple. Involved in this story is something new, not found in any textbook, Freudian or otherwise. Something we'll call, for want of a better term, the time element. <laughs> And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Time Element, starring Bobby Slayton with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Front desk. Hey, uh, uh, tell me something. So, uh, I got in, I got, uh, got in pretty late last night, didn't I? I beg your pardon, sir? I asked you if I got in late last night. Is this 206? I don't know, is it 206? I really don't know, Mr. Jensen. I wasn't on duty last night. Yeah, how about a morning paper? Oh, should be one in the hall, outside your door. Yeah, thanks. That's perfectly all. Who do you call this place, anyway? Sir? Well, was that such a hard question? I just asked you the name of the hotel. Do you work here, pal? Or what, are you just inspecting the kitchen or something? Why, this is the Royal Hawaiian. <laughs> uh, are you sure you're in the right hotel, Mr. Jensen? That's a good question. Here's the paper. December 6th. December 6th? What, what, what kind of crazy? Maid service. Did you sleep well, sir? Yeah, that's a moot question. Do you want me to clean the room now? Hey, do you want to explain the gag to me now? Uh, excuse me, sir? Do me a favor. Deliver a little message for me. You tell the guy, whoever put you up to this, that I'm going to knock out his teeth one by one. I don't know what you mean. Yeah, and take the phony newspaper with you, all right, lady? This is October. October, sir? What's October? What's October? 30 days, how's October, April, June, November, huh? Am I getting through to you? This month, this month right now, it's October, right? I don't believe so, sir. It's December. It's what? December the 6th. Yeah, that's what I thought you said. December 6th. Are you all right, sir? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm just fine. I'm fine. Except that obviously I've just come down the home stretch of the biggest toot in the history of man. 
You're telling me this is December. Well, last night, I was in New York City. And it was October. If you're not feeling well, I, I can come back later. Not feeling well? <laughs> you know what? That's the champion blue ribbon understatement of the year. You know, a little toot that lasts two months that ends up in, uh... Oh, what's the name of this place? The name of what place, sir? This place! This place right here! The Royal Hawaiian. That's what I mean. Since when is there a Royal Hawaiian Hotel in New York? It isn't in New York, sir. It's in Honolulu. Well, that figures, because the Royal Hawaiian is in Honolulu. Of course! See, that leads me to the next question. What am I doing in Hawaii? I'm sure I, I don't know, sir. <sighs> That's what I thought you said. Hey, hey just one more question. No, no, come here, come here. No, I, I'm okay. Come here. Really? I'm not be asking anything else. I promise. What, sir? This hotel got a bar. Oh yes, sir, a lovely one. And where is this lovely bar? Downstairs, off the lobby. Thank you. You're a doll. I'm sorry if I upset you. Well, look, if I ever had another mother, I, I really, I hope it's you. Okay? Come back later. We'll, we'll, we'll dance. Oh yes, sir. Absolutely, sir. How you doing, pal? Hello, sir. Bar's pretty crowded. I can show you to a booth if you like. Uh, there's one by the window. No, no, I, I want to sit at the bar. There are no seats left at the bar, sir. Look, let me ask you something. The President of the United States comes in here, wants a seat at the bar. You'd have one for him, wouldn't you? I suppose so, sir. Sure you would. Why? Because he's your Commander-in-Chief. But I guarantee you he's not going to be here today. So you know what? How about if I take his stool? Well, not my Commander, but still. Not yours? What does that mean? This is the United States of America, right? No, sir. It's Hawaii. Yeah, that's what I just said. Hawaii. Are you a state or aren't you? A state? <laughs> Hardly. That's one thing that will never happen. Is that right? Well, you know what? Why don't you take a look at the history books? Because for your information, buddy, Hawaii became a state in 1959. What do you think of that? <laughs> 1959? Well, that's very funny. Yeah, well, you're not funny, all right? Bloody Mary, please. Ah, uh, that stool's occupied. Yeah, by who? The Invisible Man? Guy just stepped out. Then you know what? I'll keep it warm for the guy. Ah, uh, give the gentleman a drink. Yeah, I want the tomato juice really anemic with lots of vodka, huh? Maybe five fingers, huh? You're the boss. Sure, baby. We'll take a walk on the beach. Hmm. Then we can have lunch in the room. Sounds swell. Ah, that's better. Keep him coming, my boy. I'm on the last lap of the biggest binge in the world. Ha <laughs> ha. Rough night? rough night. Why don't you try 30 of them? Would you believe it? I passed out in New York a month ago, and this morning, I wake up here. I know the feeling. One time, I fell asleep at the Dublin airport, and, and when I woke up, I was on a British troop train going into Palestine. That really happened. Can you believe that? Good man. <clears throat> Hi, you two. Hi. I'd like you to meet my wife. Charm. I'd like you to meet my drink. Uh, how do you do? You kids look like you're in love. How long have you been married? One day, six hours, and twelve minutes. No kidding. <laughs> Never would have guessed it. Hey, bartender, you're from New York, aren't you? Born, bred, and raised. How'd you know? Because you got a picture of the great Fiorello LaGuardia. It's the best mayor New York City ever had. Yeah, he sure is. Was. How's that? He was a good mayor. That's what I said. No, 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 no. You said he is. Well, isn't he? He was, because he's not here now, is he? No, I, I guess he isn't. He's in New York, where he should be. Yeah, because he's dead. I sure hope not. When did you hear that? Anybody ever tell you you got a wacky, nutsy sense of humor? What are you, the argumentative type? No, not me. I just want to tell you that if you're trying to rip me, I'm going to come back there behind the bar for about seven minutes, and you're going to be fixing all those Bloody Marys with a fresh supply of blood from a broken nose, all right? Hey, take it easy, mister. Let me buy you a drink. No, no, no. Let me buy you one, okay? Come on, around for the newlyweds. You know they're drinking champagne. Hey, what do I look like here? Deadbeat? Come on, give him champagne. Two more. To the bride and groom. Long may she wave. Hey, bartender, over here. What'll it be? So what do you want for ship? You bet your life. Best one afloat. The Arizona. The what? The Arizona. Well, when did they dredge her out of the mud? Say... Don't get mad, honey. He didn't mean anything. Talking about my battle wagon, and she's never been close to the mud. Oh, she has it, really. Hey, buddy boy, let me tell you something. Got a lovely wife, but a lousy memory. And now you trying to tell me the Arizona was never sunk. I'm not trying to tell you. I'm telling you. The Arizona's never been sunk in her life. Never, huh? You know it. You know it. I don't. Okay? 
I say she got sunk on December 7th, 1941, okay? And that's where she sits today, in the mud at Pearl Harbor, okay? Now, what do you think of that? What'd you say? I said... I have returned. I feel like a new man. And now that new man needs a drink, too. <clears throat> oh, here's your newspaper, Bartender. Another one of your liquid libations for me, please? Get off that stool. He was here before. Let me see that paper. Take it with you on your way out. Let me see this. Jeff Envoys to FDR. Hey, wait, what kind of paper is this, huh? What are you guys doing? Where'd you get this? The Honolulu Advertiser, Saturday, December 6th, 1941. You owe me for the champagne and uh, one Bloody Mary. But it isn't 1941. Do you hear me? Ask anybody. How about you? you? How about you? Somebody speak up. What is the matter with you people? I have to ask you to leave now, buddy. Oh, what? Because you think it's 1941? Because everybody in here is in on this stupid joke? It's not 1941. It can't be 1941. I mean, how, how could it be? So how can it be 1941, Doc? Can you tell me that? Huh? And the dream ends there? No. It just goes on. I see. But up to that point, each dream is identical, you say? Identical. I even remember going to the door of the bar and looking out in the street. And I, I, I see all the cars. 1939, 40, 41 models. Nothing newer. Go on. All right, all right. I get this. <laughs> and this is what separates the men from the wacky. I don't think it's a dream, Doc. It's not a dream. Make all the little chicken tracks you want on that little piece of paper. What I'm telling you here is the goods. I believe you. You do? Then why don't you call up the sanitarium and tell them we'll take a double room? Because you're nuts also. I mean, I understand why you think it's real. Some dreams are extremely realistic. As often as not, they're impossible to distinguish from reality. No, you don't get what I'm saying. Look, it isn't just that it's real while I'm asleep, Doc. Well, I'm telling you this, it's still real. It's still real even when I'm awake. All of it. Look, I've had dreams like everybody else, but as soon as it started, I knew it was different. I, I, do you understand me? Do you understand me? You don't understand me. These are not dreams. If they're not dreams, Mr. Jensen, what are they? What do you think they are? Let's examine the alternatives. I can think of only one. That's the one I'm thinking of, okay? I wake up in a hotel room in 1941. But I mean, I really wake up. I really wake up, and it's really 1941. Do you understand? Going back in time. That's what I'm doing, Doc. I'm going back in time. Huh. Interesting. What happens then when you're back in time? <laughs> you sure you want to hear this? I do. Then hold on to your hat, Doc, because from this point on, things go completely screwy. Want to place a bet? Well, are you a bookie or not? All right, then. I'm going to take Joe Lewis over Buddy Bear. What are the odds on Lewis? Well, they will be scheduled, okay? They're going to fight on January 9th. Yeah, January 9th, okay? Make it Lewis in the first round. Now, what's the line? 30 to 1. Ha <laughs> it's more like it. What do you mean, how do I know? Just trust me, I know. I know, that's all. The name's Jensen. I'm with the Royal Hawaiian. Now, how about the All-Star game for next year? Hey, do you want to cover me or not, huh? Okay, I'll take the American League. Let me ask you something. What kind of odds if I predict the score? I spend the next two and a half hours making bets on sure things, right? Every race, every prize fight, every football game I can remember happening after December 1941. See, I got to figure that if this goes on, I'm a shoo to put every bookie in town out of business. Now, I'm not scared, you understand? See, I don't have one idea what I'm doing back here, but as long as I am here, I figure, hey, why not put it to good use? You know what I'm saying? Jensen. That's right. Royal Hawaiian. Oh, hey, 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 how are you, buddy? You're the ensign from, from the bar. I hope you don't mind. No, no, come in, come in. Uh, I just wondered, uh, how you doing? I'm fine. Come on in. Have a drink. My wife, uh... My wife asked me to stop by and see how you felt. Yeah, it was very nice of her. I feel great. I'm fine. Hey, what are you drinking? Uh, no thanks. We're going swimming. She was a little concerned. My wife, I mean. About what? About me? Well, it's just that 
down at the bar after you saw the paper and... No, 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 don't worry about it. I was, I was going to ring you up and apologize. That whole Arizona bit. Sure. Are you, uh, sick or something? No, 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 I'm not sick. Well, what made you say it wasn't 1941? No, nothing. I was a little whirly in the head, that's all. Sure. Well, we'll be back about four or five. Uh, maybe you'd like to have a drink with us then, if you feel okay. You got yourself a deal. Hey, one more thing. Yeah? So what do, you, what do you do on the Arizona? I'm in the engineering section. You work down below? Yeah, most of the time. Good job? I like it. Well, we'll give you a call. Yeah, yeah, sure thing. How is he? I think he's okay. Uh, said to give him a call when we get back. Oh, that's great. So I remember thinking, right at that moment, these two kids were so much in love, you could take the looks they gave each other, you could spread it on pancakes. And while I'm watching them, it hits me. This boy looks down in the hold of a ship that has about 14 hours left to ride the waves. After that, it goes down under with a thousand men. And suddenly, making bets on things that I know will happen seems about as interesting as catching lake trout in a milk bottle. You know what I'm saying? Somehow trying to help those two kids is the one thing in the whole wide world that matters. So I do the only thing I can do. I make a fool out of myself. Hey, front desk. Hey, I need directions to get to the Schofield Barracks. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, U.S. Army Base. Come in. Excuse me, Colonel, but... Spit it out, Bailey. That guy is still in the orderly room, sir. Says he wants to see somebody in charge. Who's this now? Some jerk with a tambourine or something. Must be Save a Soul Saturday. What's this story? I can't piece it all together, sir. Something about the Japanese having bombs? <sighs> this ought to be good. Send him in. Yes, sir. Uh, the Colonel will see you now. You're Mr... Jensen, Pete Jensen. I'm Colonel Abernathy. What's on your mind, Mr. Jensen? First of all, Colonel, I want to guarantee that I'm not going to get stuck in a rubber room when I'm finished telling you this. You've got it. I have information that the Japanese are bombing Pearl Harbor tomorrow morning. 8 a.m., Honolulu time. You know this to be a fact. Colonel, as sure as I know, the good Lord made racehorses. They're coming over here in about 30 waves off a bunch of carriers. They're going to plaster us while we're still in bed. Oahu, the airfield, right here too. Schofield Barracks. Hmm. This is very serious. Better take immediate steps. Bailey? Sir? Have Captain Franklin contact the naval station at Pearl. Uh, yes, sir. See that they have all personnel standing by. At least 30 PBYs ready to go up. Tell Lieutenant Ordway to call the commanding general. All troops on the beach. <laughs> if you say so, sir. <laughs> all right, come on, knock it off. Cut the game. <laughs> listen to me, you brass-covered hyena, okay? Don't you say that nobody warned you. I warn you. You gotta listen to me. I'm sure you're right. Now nah, you can leave peacefully, Mr. Jensen, or I'll have you escorted outside. Go walk by myself, okay? And if anybody grabs me, you're gonna have to call the medical corps on the double. We don't appreciate that kind of talk. Is that a fact? And what do you appreciate, Colonel, huh? Maybe you'd appreciate a big punch in the jaw. All the trouble I take for getting over to try to save you people. And this is what I get? All right, Jensen, zip it. You walk on that lower lip one more time, soldier boy, and I'll get you out of the army on a medical. You understand me? Believe me, Mr. Jensen, this is going to hurt me worse than it hurts you. Oh, I believe it. Colonel! Oh! No! Are you all right? Place this man under arrest and fit him for a straitjacket. Yes, sir. Then what happened? Well, finally they let me leave, right? After I answered some questions about what year it was, and did I know who the president was? I had some trouble with the vice president. Uh, you know, Truman, of course, sure. But, you know, Roosevelt dies, Truman takes over, then it's Eisenhower. Good thing I didn't mention Ike. <laughs> in 41, he was still a white colonel on the general staff in Washington. <laughs> Think of it. They never heard of rock and roll, jet planes, TV, atom bombs. <sighs> anyway, they decided I was harmless. So on the way out, I gave him a V sign and told him to buy some more buns. And after that? What am I going to do? I had my shot. So I figure I'm just going to spend the rest of the day drinking quietly. Of course, the next morning they come looking for me to give me a bronze statue, but... But then it's going to be too late, you know? I didn't care anymore. What am I supposed to do? But I'll tell you something. There was some feeling to watch those kids relaxing in the bar with their dates and their drinks. Like, Everything was fine, like they had a future, and all was well with the world, you know? Where tomorrow there'd be a couple of thousand of them on their way through hell to get to heaven.
Oh, yeah. Likewise. Hey, uh, you know what you were talking about this morning? I got a vague recollection. Yeah, about the Arizona being sunk. Knock it off. You don't believe me? Well, you don't see me bleeding, do you? I'm not trying to drum up an argument. I just wanted to show you something. Take a look out the window. You see that ship in the harbor? That happens to be the Arizona. So I guess somebody got their signals crossed. She's still afloat. <laughs> Come on, I said knock it off. Mr. Jensen? Yeah, hi. Have that drink with us? Yeah, yeah, sure, thanks. Yeah, yeah. How was the swim? It was wonderful. So how long's it been now? 32 hours and 15 minutes. Oh, uh, they said it wouldn't last. <laughs> Mr. Jensen? Try Pete. Pete. Well, are you all right now? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm all right. Why? It's just that this morning, you seemed so sure it was another year. I did? Hey, look, honey, you know I'm kind of mixed up here. You, I, I, look, I didn't mean anything personal, all right? I told you to forget it. <sighs> oh, boy, look at you two. What's the matter? I lied just now. I wasn't kidding. The Arizona is going to be sunk. Are we on that again? Yeah, we're on that again. Listen to me, Lieutenant. Anson. Look, whatever. I got no axe to grind, you understand? Tomorrow morning, I'm going down to the basement so I can cuddle up to a furnace and listen to the sirens. You said you're an engineering officer. That means you're down near the boilers. I'm telling you, at about 20 minutes past 8 in the morning, there's not going to be any boilers. Do you understand? There's not going to be any decks, and there won't be any ship left. That goes for a lot of boilers, and a lot of ships, and a lot of decks. Not to mention handsome young ensigns with new brides. Please, don't talk like that. I gotta talk like that. December 7th, 1941 is tomorrow for you, but it's history for me. Do you understand? Last night, I was in New York City, and it was years from now. I've lived through those years. I know what's gonna happen. I know it sounds crazy, but I know what's gonna happen. Hey, you. No more trouble, huh? Hey, you shut your mouth. Nobody's talking to you. Hey, look, look, look. You're nice young kids. I, I ain't got no reason in the world to give you any grief. Okay, just do me a favor and listen. Take a hundred to one shot that this weirdo in front of you maybe has a point, okay? I'm telling you that tomorrow morning we're gonna get attacked. And if you're on that ship... I'll be on that ship because that's my berth. You're a nice fellow and all, Mr. Jensen, but if you keep saying wild things and making my wife upset, I'm... Yeah, what are you going to do about it? Sit around holding hands and biting your lobes till he goes back to his ship? Because if this boy goes back to that Arizona, he might not be alive at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Repeat, he may not be alive. Please. <laughs> Mr. Jensen, I'm warning you. Hey, buddy, I don't want no trouble. You don't want no trouble, huh? He doesn't want any trouble. Hey, I don't want to give you any trouble. I want to give you music, okay? I want to sing a song for you. Praise the Lord, pass the ammunition. Praise the Lord, pass the ammunition. Praise the Lord, pass the ammunition. And we'll all stay free. Huh? You hear that? <laughs> it's what you're all going to be singing. You want another one? Oh, oh, how does it go? Uh, let's remember Pearl Harbor. Come on, come on, you write the words. Come on, come on. All right, buddy, that's it. Shut up. <laughs> Tell me the general can't be reached. I know he can be reached. He may not be alive to call me tomorrow. Yeah, this is... Hello? 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 Yes, I want to call Navy 7096. 7096. Yes, that's right. Hello, is this a naval station? Yeah, let me talk to whoever's in charge. Yeah, hello? Listen, I have some information here. The Japanese are going to attack Pearl Harbor, right? Hello? I said the Japanese are... Hello? Hello? What are we going to do? It's almost too late. What time is it? 8 o'clock. It's 8 o'clock in the a.m. 8 o'clock. That means it's December 7th. It's December 7th already. What are we going to do? Why would anybody listen to me? Why? I told you they were coming. I told you. I told you they were coming. I told you. I told all of you. I told you. I told them, Doc. I told them. I told them over and over. Why wouldn't anybody listen to me? And then? I'm standing there by the French windows, and I'm watching the planes coming low. I'm watching them. The bombs are dropping, strafing. All hell is breaking loose. And that's, that's where I wake up, every time. Realistic and very frightening. How long did you say it's been going on? Every night for a week. And always the same. Everything. The ensign and his girl, the bar, me trying to call from my room. And the moment, the moment I see the planes coming in. Mr. Jensen, I won't attempt to analyze that dream, except to say this. 
Very often we dream with a purpose. It can signify something deeply rooted in the subconscious. The things you dream about may not be what's really bothering you. Well, don't try to outlogic me, Doc, okay? You think I'm nuts, don't you? I know what I know. I can't explain it. But that's why I came to see you, because I thought maybe you could explain it. I know for a fact I'm going back in time. And I'll tell you something else, that even after I wake up and I'm laying in bed and I'm thinking about the dream, I know it's not supposed to end there. I know one of these nights it's going to go beyond that. But you have no idea what might transpire. No, not one. All right. Let's approach it this way. Assume that it is possible somehow to go back in time. You go back and you do something, uh, warn people, say, about an accident so that it doesn't happen. But what have you done then, Mr. Jensen? By altering the past, you change the future. Here, look. This is the present, and my lighter is on my desk. Now I go back in time and I pick up this lighter. I put it in my pocket and I keep it there. Then I return to the present. By any rights, having removed that lighter, it should no longer be here. But if it is, you, you get my point? Look, Doc. Try this analogy, Mr. Jensen. Supposing I were to go back in time and I got hit, say, by a taxi. Now it figures that if I went back in time and got killed, I couldn't be alive today. Not only that, but think of the other lives affected. I wouldn't have children, I wouldn't have bought a house, uh, all these things wouldn't exist because I changed them. Ergo, I wouldn't be here to go back. So? So time travel is not possible. It can't be. It creates an insoluble paradox. Therefore, we can safely assume that what we're talking about is a dream. It has to be. Try this thing. I've never been to Honolulu in my whole life. So after the first couple of times, I decided, I decided to put it to a test. Go on. I remembered the ensign's last name. It's kind of an odd name, not easy to forget. Janowski. Told me it came from a little town called White Oak, Wisconsin. So I placed a call. There was only one Janowski in the phone book. Woman answered, his mother. I said it was a friend of his from Honolulu. How was he there? And then? She told me that her son and his wife were killed in Honolulu on December 7th, 1941. He went down with the Arizona. She was shot down near King Street by a fighter plane, a Japanese Zero. A Japanese Zero, Doc. You sure you've never been to Honolulu? Yeah, I've been there. When? In the dream, which isn't a dream. Okay, Doc, your turn. I don't hear you talking. That's because, at the moment, I don't know what to say. The patient lay on the couch. We'd been talking for hours. It was Saturday, and I'd planned to leave early and go play golf. But I was concerned about this man and his story. It was incredible. Then finally, I knew he was asleep. It wasn't a deep sleep. By the look on his face, Mr. Jensen was far from resting, though his eyes were closed. Mr. Jensen? Are you asleep, Mr. Jensen? So I decided to let him rest while I thought it through. Who knows, maybe he'd even finish his dream this time. How's your eye, Mr. Jensen? I mean, Pete. Hey, don't worry about me. I'm fine. I'll put a piece of steak on it. Sorry the bartender hit you. I should have stopped him, but I kind of got carried away, too. No, no harm done. Well, go lie down and take it easy. Uh, maybe we'll see you later before I go back to the ship. Hey, Janowski, do me one favor, will you? Play hooky tomorrow morning. He's out of his head. Look, if you never do one thing for the rest of your life, do this, will you? Come on. Stay off that ship. Take the little lady. Get away from Pearl Harbor. Come on. I don't care where you go. Get on a Pan Am and go to the Canal Zone anywhere. But just get out of here. That's a great plan. And you know what it would cost me? Only my commission in the Navy, that's all. Jimmy, forget it. If you don't go, do you know what that's going to cost you? Just a little item like your life and hers too. I tried to be nice, but this time I swear I... Come on, Jimmy. Let's go to our floor. Please, come on. What do you got to lose? I'm going to try to save your lives, that's all. Poor dumb crazy kids. Don't you tell me the general can't be reached. I know he can be reached. He might not be alive tomorrow to call me. Please, hello? Hello? Yes, I want to call Navy 7096. That's right. Hello? Is this a naval station? Let me talk to whoever's in charge. This is 
is Ensign Lamers. It's my watch and it's your nickel, so go ahead. What's on your mind? Listen to me. The Japanese are going to attack Pearl Harbor. Who? What are they going to do? I said the Japanese... What have you been drinking? I'll tell you what. Take a nice shower and dive into a percolator. Good night. Hello? Hello? It's almost too late. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? <sighs> Again. What time is it? 8 o'clock in the a.m. Already 8. Oh, that means it's December 7th. Why? No. Why wouldn't anybody listen to me? Why? I told you they were coming. I told you. I told you. I stood there at the window for a long time, thinking about Mr. Jensen and his problem, his dream. I knew I had to wake him and send him on his way, at least for now. I could give him some sleeping pills, uh, maybe a program of therapy, till I could talk to some doctors that I knew and ask if they had ever had a case like this one. Mr. Jensen? Mr. Jensen? It's getting late. I, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to... Mr. Jensen? Mr. Jensen, where did you... Carol? Yes, Dr. Gillespie? What happened to the patient? The patient? Jensen! I didn't realize he'd slipped out. I let him fall asleep on the couch because he looked so exhausted. I don't know anything about him, Mr. Jensen, Doctor. The man who was in my office all afternoon. It's a good thing there were no other appointments. I hope you have his number. I wanted to schedule a series of sessions starting next week. I'm really sorry, sir, but I... I don't show any appointments at all today. I was wondering how long you needed me. I have a date this evening, and... Hold on. You mean to tell me a man named Jensen didn't walk in here and ask to see me? Big guy, uh, shirt with flowers on it? Why, no, sir. I've been here the whole time. I thought you wanted me to stay and work on the files. Uh, all right, Carol, that will be all. Uh, you can go now. I'll lock up. Yes, sir. Good night, sir. Try this analogy, Mr. Jensen. Supposing I were to go back in time and I got hit, say, by a taxi. Now it figures that if I went back in time and got killed, I couldn't be alive today. today, today. Alive 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 today. Welcome to Andy's place. Where can I get you? Bourbon on the rocks, please. One bourbon coming up. Here you go. Need a light? No, thanks. I've got it. A lighter. Yes, I do, right here. In my pocket. Cheers. Happy dreams. Same to you. What in the... Problem, mister? No, it's just that picture there. The one in the frame on the wall? Ah, uh, yeah. A group of men in uniform. All except one in a flowered shirt. It looks familiar. Pete Jensen. He used to attend bar here a long time ago. You heard of him? Jensen? Uh, no. I don't remember that name. He looked familiar, that's all. Where is he now? Him? He's dead. He got killed before I was born at Pearl Harbor. More down here? Sure. Do more of the same. Once upon a time, there was a psychiatrist named Arnold Gillespie and a patient whose name was Peter Jensen. You might want to make note of both names for the record should you ever run across either one in a textbook. It is now Saturday, October 5th at exactly 5.10 p.m. You might want to make note of that, too, if you're even remotely interested in a new theory about something we'll call, for want of a better term, the time element, at least as it is measured in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. 
Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. The Time Element, starring Bobby Slayton, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Maggie Carney, Craig Brawley, Elizabeth Lado, Jeff Lupiton, Doug James, Kurt Navig, Sarah Marks, Roger Walski, Bo Nortel, and Carl Amari. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. My name is Archibald Beechcraft, and to coin a phrase, welcome to my world. And a wonderful world it is. You might even call it paradise. To tell you the truth, I don't remember exactly how I got here, but I assure you I have no intentions of leaving. No intentions whatsoever. Why should I? Everything I need is here. The sand, the sea, the sky, as blue as a robin's egg, gently swaying palms, and absolutely nothing on the horizon. Nothing. And no one. Do you understand? Not a soul in sight as far as the eye can see. Only the occasional bottle that washes up on the beach. Like this one. Ah, <sighs> they're all the same. With a note inside, some poor soul scribbling a message for help. Whoever reads this, I am stranded on a desert island. Please send a rescue ship at once. <laughs> stranded? A rescue ship? The fool! Doesn't he know he's finally found peace? He's escaped from the crowds, the rat race, from civilization. Obviously an imbecile. Who would want to go back to that world? Cars, subways, buses, and people. Everywhere you look, yammering away, pushing and shoving till you can't breathe, can't think. No thanks. I've had my fill of people. If you don't mind, I'll live out my days like this. Alone. Quite blissfully alone. Except, of course, for Chi-Chi, the perfect companion. Never a word of disagreement. In fact, never a word of any kind. Because, you see, he's a chimpanzee. And a very intelligent one. If I'm hungry, he brings me a banana. When I'm thirsty, he climbs a tree and picks a ripe coconut. Have you ever tasted fresh coconut milk? Oh, you must. It's really quite refreshing. Hold on, Chi-Chi. What's this? A footprint? Well, that means... We're not alone, after all. But how can that be? This is my world! Wait a minute. Whoever made this footprint, do you suppose his name might be... Friday? If so, he'll speak an entirely different language. No communication whatsoever, and plenty of room for both of us. He'll have his half of the island, and I'll have mine. Unless, of course, Friday's a female. 
You think it's possible? Why, I don't see why not. A lovely native girl in a sarong with big brown eyes like a Walter Keene painting. And a tray of finger sandwiches, poi, that sort of thing. Maybe some Mai Tais. Who can't speak, of course. No, no, why should she? She'll live in her grass hut and I'll live in mine and we'll visit from time to time. An ideal arrangement, I'll give her a lay, a flower lay, whenever the spirit moves me. And when the spirit doesn't move me... Now where's that coming from? There aren't any telephones on my island. It can't be a telephone booth on the beach. Most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Yes? Yes, who is it? Who in the... Hello, who's there? Hello? Who? H Hello? Tropical Paradise, Beechcraft speaking. Hello? Hello? Oh, oh, the alarm clock. I must have been dreaming again. What time is it? Half past six already? This is my world, all right. And welcome to it. A brief, if somewhat jarring, introduction to Mr. Archibald Beechcraft, a child of his time, a product of the population explosion, and an unwilling inheritor of the legacy of progress. He has just begun his daily battle for survival in a world that cares not one whit for his happiness or sanity. But very soon, our hero will begin a one-man rebellion against this impersonal age, and to do so, he will enlist the help of certain unusual aids of the sort found only in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, The Mind and the Matter, starring Hal Sparks with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Morning, Beechcraft. I don't see what's so good about it. How's that? If you'll excuse me, I'm late. <laughs> You're always late. Take it easy. You'll get there. I'm sure I will. And what an unmitigated joy that will be. Ninety-one. Ninety-two. Ninety-three. Stand aside. I don't have to. My mom said I could play. And I said move it. Ninety-four. Ninety-five. Ninety-six. Why do you have to do that here, inside the building? Oh, you made me lose count. Now I have to start all over again. One, two, three, four. Get out of my way, you little wretch. Ma, that man called me a wretch. Hey, watch it, buddy. Sorry. Look where you're going. Beg your pardon. Hey, careful with the briefcase, huh? I, I'm late, you see. Hey, he almost knocked me down. If I miss my train... Red light, Mr. Red light. But I can't wait for the light to change. If I do miss my train, then, then they'll dock my pay, meager though it may be. And if they do that, well, there's no limit to what they can do. I'm not about to jeopardize my position just because of all the rude, inconsiderate people who are, are ruining this city. Positively ruining. That's my train! Slow down, one at a time. But you see, officer, I absolutely must catch the 732 uptown. Keep your shirt on, pal. Let me through, please. Watch who you're pushing. You don't understand. This is my... Hands off, buddy. One person per token. I don't have a token. Well, then you better get one at the window. But I overslept. I'm late. One at a time, folks. Let's keep moving. Let me on, please. Hey, you stepped on my foot. Move to the back, please. This elevator's full. But I absolutely must get to the 15th floor. Why don't you wait for the next one? I can't wait. I'm late as it is. I said this one's full. Surely there's room for one more. Sorry, Beechcraft. If I could just squeeze in. Will you watch the elbow? I do apologize. Going up. There's Mr. Beechcraft. Finally decided to make it, hmm? Better late than never. Morning, Laura. What happened to you? What didn't? You'd been through what I've been through. Did you punch in? Yes. Mr. Rogers got here 15 minutes ago. I'm sure he did. I told him he went to get coffee. Coffee? 
That's what I need. Not now. And my blood pressure pills. Wait till the break. Look like you're busy. You mean pretend? I don't have to pretend. Of course, in a reasonable world where a person could work at his own pace, with no pressure, no interruptions... Mr. Rogers will be back any minute. I'll bet he will. <sighs> All right. When did I leave off yesterday? The Campbell file, as I recall. I'm finishing it for you. What? You shouldn't have done that. I'm quite capable. I know you are. I was only trying to help. Thank you, Laura. But if I could be allowed to concentrate without so many distractions, there'd be no problem. Here's your coffee, Miss Petty. Oh, thank you, Henry. You can call me Laura, you know. All right, Laura. I didn't know how you wanted it, so I got cream and sugar. Is that okay? That's fine. Kindly give it back. Hmm? The Campbell file. I'm just about to close it out. Where do you want me to set it? What? The coffee. Just a minute. If you please, Laura. Here you go. Oh, no. Why, you clumsy clod. Gosh, Mr. Beechcraft, I sure am sorry. You spilled it all over my jacket. I guess I didn't see you. That's precisely your problem. Try cold water before the stain sets. I'll get another cup. That's all right, Henry. No harm done. I ought to send you the cleaning bill. Is that Beechcraft? Yes, sir. Looks like he's headed for the washroom. Something the matter? Well, Mr. Rogers, you see, um... He's a little out of sorts this morning. Is he now? Feeling ill, Beechcraft? Hmm? Oh. No, sir. Nothing like that. If you'll forgive an observation, you're not looking too well. I'm all right, Mr. Rogers. You look tired. You know, Beechcraft, keeping yourself fit is not only a personal responsibility. In a larger sense, it's part of your obligation to the firm that employs you. Healthy body, healthy mind, and so forth. I'm not unaware of that. Then why don't you pull yourself together, man? Get enough sleep at night. I try to, sir. Eat regular meals. Lots of fresh vegetables, greens. Oh, you can't beat those greens for vitamins. I'm a sprouts and spinach man myself. Are you? I'd have them for breakfast if I could. Believe me, Beechcraft. The secret is definitely in the greens. It's the color of power. I see. Not drinking, are you, Beechcraft? Touch of the old sauce? I don't drink, Mr. Rogers. Well, if you don't drink and you don't stay out late at night, you must not be watching your diet. From now on, see that you do. If you'd really like to know, Mr. Rogers, if you'd really like to know precisely why I'm so dead tired, Try coming to work on the 732 subway train every morning, then jamming into an elevator with a herd of cattle, then trying to work in that... that den of cacophony you call an office. Take hold of yourself, Beechcraft. Then standing in line in that so-called cafeteria during that so-called lunch hour, which is never more than 42 minutes. Oh, that's really good for the digestion. Then getting trampled to death in the subway again at 5.38 every night. Then standing in line with more people at a greasy spoon restaurant followed by another line at a movie or a concert or anywhere else I care to go. But always standing in line, always getting shoved, always getting jostled, always getting pushed around by more People! For goodness sakes, man, take hold! I'll take hold, Mr. Rogers. I'll take hold when I can achieve that milestone. That millennium. That absolute perfection that only comes with solitude. Understand? Solitude. That means no people. You read me, Mr. Rogers? They're the ultimate insult. And my problem is simply that I can't get away from them. At no time, except during the wondrous seven and a half hours I spend in my bed every night. And even then, I hear them outside. Hear what? People! Raucous, shrieking, shouting people, herds, droves, legions, hosts, armies, bevies, flocks, and coveys of people, people, people. I don't like that look in your eye, Beechcraft. I don't like it one bit. If I had my way, here's how I'd fix the universe. I'd eliminate them all. I mean, cross them off. Get rid of them. Send them packing, destroy them, and then there'd be only one man left. Me. Archibald Beechcraft Esquire. Let me out of here. You're quite mad. Do you know that, Beechcraft? You're either off or en route away from your rocker. Well, if I am, I very much prefer my madness to, to the so-called sanity around me. People, as far as I'm concerned, you can have them. If I had my way, I'd make them all disappear. Every last one. 
Well, well, well. Old Beechcraft's finally showing some gumption. Just the same, I'd best keep a close eye on him. A very close eye indeed. <laughs> Baked fish? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Salisbury steak for me. Coming right up. Oh, and an extra roll. Vegetables with that? And broccoli. Sure thing. No mashed potatoes, no french fries. No, I'll, uh, I'll have the succotash today. Club sandwich here. Dessert? How's the tapioca pudding? Lumpy. Uh, I need another fork. This one's dirty. You got it. One club sandwich, coleslaw, no fries, coffee black. There you go. Sit, sir. And that's right, the usual. So I see. Cash or charge? Cash. I got my wallet out of my pocket. There's hardly room to turn around. Here. Don't you have anything smaller? No, I'm afraid not. Your change. Hurry up, will you, buddy? We don't have all day. I'm doing my best. If you'd allow me to put my wallet away. Next, one double macaroni and cheese, salad with ranch. Excuse me. The seat's saved. Well, how about the one next to it? No, he'll be right back. Of course. Of course he will. Hey, Mr. Beechcraft, over here. Thank God. I'm obliged, Henry. Think nothing of it, Mr. Beechcraft. Squeeze right in. That was my plan. Been saving it for you. I was sort of... Well, I wanted to make up for this morning. This morning? When I spilled coffee on your coat. I'm really sorry about that. Mm. Mm. Say, Mr. Beechcraft? Mm-hmm. I have a friend. Mm. You don't say. Works in the used bookstore around the corner. I went there before lunch. Whatever for? Oh, I like to read. All kinds of stuff. Do tell. Horror, mostly. That's my favorite. Why am I not surprised? Some of those paperbacks are pretty cool, you know? There was one about these giant worms that live in the sub-sub-basement of an office building. And if you took the elevator down there late at night, these big old white old worm things will be waiting for you. And they must have been really hungry, because, uh... Please, Henry. I'm eating. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I went over there today, and, uh, I saw this. So I, I sort of got it for you. What is it? Story of a serial killer who wants to depopulate the Earth? Uh, nothing like that. Take a look. I thought you might like it. The mind and the matter. How you can achieve the ultimate power of concentration. Think this is something I need, Henry? It's really rare. There are only a few printed. A little on the occult side, isn't it? Uh, maybe so. But seeing as how you always have so much work to do, my friend is kind of a student of the mind. He swears by this, says it's the last copy. The publisher was supposed to destroy all of them. For what reason? Too powerful. It tells you how to make people do things. Thing? Would you believe it, Mr. Beechcraft? I've seen him. I've seen my friend cause a woman to do... to do something fantastic. How's that? It's true. He was in a department store, and he saw this woman at the sale table, and he concentrated real hard on one particular thing, and... Mr. Beechcraft, as sure as I'm sitting here in the cafeteria of the United Tool and Dye Company, that woman... You won't believe this! What? Well, that woman picked up a chartreuse and orange scarf, paid for it and everything. She never would have bought it in a million years. Who would? But he made her do it, just like that. It's the truth, I swear! <laughs> Would you please try to be more careful? Oops, there goes the coffee again. Sorry, Mr. Beechcraft. Thank you so much for the book, Henry. Now, if you don't mind, I think I'll be leaving. I've had more than my fill. Mr. Beechcraft, Chapter 3! Uh, read that one first! Remember, Chapter 3! Right, Henry. Chapter 3. Initial Phenomenon of Intense Concentration. Focus on a single desired outcome, then close your eyes, mental picture, repeat three times. Ready to go back? Not yet. I have to fix my makeup. Okay. Wait, I think I'll have a soda first. Want one? Nah. Let me see. Orange, root beer, grape. Might as well give it a try. Concentrate. Tropical punch. Pick tropical punch. I just can't make up my mind. It's delicious. Try it. You'll like it. 
Why'd you pick that one? I don't know. I really don't. I was going to choose lemon lime, but for some reason my finger pressed tropical punch. How's it taste? Might as well find out. Yes! You'll see. It's absolutely delicious. Puts one in the mind of a Mai Tai. I think I'd better read the entire book. Chapter 4. To achieve your heart's desire. Heart's desire, eh? Very interesting. Very interesting indeed. The most important element is concentration. Blot out the quotidian irrelevancies that pollute your day. Quotidian? Nice vocabulary. Mr. Beechcraft? The science of the mind requires absolute adherence to the following rules. Mr. Beechcraft? Uh, what is it, Laura? Did you turn in the Campbell file? Campbell? John R. From this morning. I don't see it. I'll get to it. Now, like, the following rules of mental control over the omnipresent phenomenology of the modern environment. I really need the file before Mr. Rogers comes by again. Silence! Did you say I'm reading? Sorry I disturbed you. Oh, Laura, how was your beverage, by the way? Beverage? In the hall, the can of soda. Tropical punch, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Not bad, actually. Reminded me of... a pina colada. Did it now. Delicious, I bet. I'll just get back to my book. Very important book. Very, very important. Distractions which divert 98% of our brain capacity from the more highly evolved regions of the cerebral cortex. Everybody go into the ground floor? Yeah. yeah. The source of the power is located in the pineal gland, or vestigial third eye. You, sir? Where the power of the all-encompassing life force. Sir, you going to the first floor, too? He's talking to you, buddy. What's the matter, you deaf? What? Of course I'm going to the first floor. Where else would I be going? Watch your fingers. Going down. The more complete the mental picture, the more complete the result. Focus your mind and concentrate to the exclusion of all else. From the lower to the higher chakras, until you feel the power surging. You getting on the train or what? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. Then move along. All aboard! Mental imaging of the desired result to the exclusion of all else. Ah, now where was I? Chapter 9. The energy generated by pure mind has an electrical coefficient of... Yes. Yes, mm-hmm. The numbers are absolutely correct. Unequivocally. That being the case, it stands to reason that the conclusions are correct as well. Why, the mind must be the most underrated power in the entire universe. Given the proper concentration, well, there's really no limit to what a man could do. No limit at all. Look at them down there. People. So many. I wonder, if I concentrated hard enough, could I actually get rid of... Why not? Why not? Concentration, that's all it takes. I have the power here, inside my head. Sheer concentration. Concentrate on, on getting rid of all those people. I wonder if I could do it in one fell swoop. Or, or knock them off one by one. Just think of it. Nobody in the elevator, in the office, the cafeteria, or on the street. None! Not in the hall, or on the stairs. Nobody except... Mr. Beechcraft. Mr. Beechcraft. Who is it? You know perfectly well who it is. It's Mrs. Weller. The rent is due, Mr. Beechcraft. Do you hear me? The rent. I'm not going away till you pay, Mr. Beechcraft. Mr. Beechcraft. Close your eyes and repeat the following words three times. Go away. Disappear. Be extinct. The rent, Mr. Beechcraft. Go away. Disappear. Be extinct. The rent! Go away. Disappear. Be extinct. Mr. Beach! Mrs. Weller? 
Mrs. Weller? Mrs. Weller? Aha! You're gone! Concentration, that's the key. And I have it. <laughs> Today the landlady, tomorrow the world! Good morning, Beechcraft. Is it? I only meant... I know perfectly well what you meant. Why don't you just keep to yourself and mind your own beeswax? Well, I don't know why I bother, Beechcraft. I was only trying to be a good neighbor. I've tried to be a good neighbor for years. And what good does it do me? Why don't Go you keep away. To yourself from now Disappear. I'll stay in my be extinct. And you stay in Go yours. away. Never the twain Disappear. Meet, okay? Be that extinct. You because it suits... Aha! I wasn't dreaming. It works. 113, 114, 115, 116. Out of the way, son. Make me. 117. Very well. Go away, disappear, be extinct. Go away, disappear, be extinct. Hey, give me back my ball. I don't have your ball, young man. Then where did it go? Ma! Silence! Ma, the I'm afraid you leave me no ball. choice. Go away, disappear. Ma! Be he won't give it extinct. back. He won't. And another one bites the dust. Hey, watch it. Out of the way, jerk. I was here first. Let me through, please. I need to catch the 732. Officer, that man cut in front of me. Hey, you! I said you! Surely you're not addressing me. Put a token in like everybody else. I don't have a token. So get one. I don't have time to buy tokens. If I miss my train... Step out of the line. What for? I'm writing you up. You're going to get a big fat fine for cheating the city out of... But it's only a token. I'll mail it to you. I'll deposit two tokens tomorrow morning, but I simply do not have the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I heard it all before. This one may take some doing. What'd you say? Nothing, officer. Concentrate. Go away. Disappear. Be extinct. Say, are you cursing me out? Go away. Disappear. Be extinct. All right, that's it. I'm taking you in for insulting a transit officer. I got a nice pair of bracelets that'll fit you just fine. Go away, disappear, be extinct. You were saying, officer? You were saying? <laughs> All right, 732, let's get ready to rumble. Beechcraft is coming through. What? No line for the elevator this morning? No pushing? No shoving? My, my, that is unusual. Anyone else? No? All right, then. Going up? Morning, everyone. Laura? Ah, oh, you're not here, are you? Slept in, I presume? Like a great many people. Fine with me. I'll just sit down here and get to work without being rushed. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. Jones Stephen. A rather large export to the UK. I'll just see if everything's in order. At my own pace for once. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Better finish this one before Mr. Rogers gets here. If he ever shows up. <laughs> now, let me see. I'm all well and good. Well and good. A major improvement. Only, when I finish this and the other files, what else is there to do? With no one breathing down my neck, how should one occupy his time? Hmm. Isn't it time for lunch yet? I'll just have the salad today. Some soup to start off and crackers. No hurry, mind you. Plenty of time to digest my meal. Where to sit? Why, any table at all? The morning paper. What's new in the world today? White House? Mm. Middle East? Mm -hmm. Federal Reserve Bank? Oh, it's no use. I hate eating alone. And worse than that, I'm bored. If only I had someone to talk to. One person, that's all. Someone quiet, well-mannered, intelligent. Someone like me, in other words. That's it. Concentrate, Beechcraft, concentrate. You called? It worked. Of course it worked. Don't you have any confidence in yourself? 
pleased to meet you. The name's Beechcraft. I know. And your name is? Archibald. Call me Archie. You too. I mean, call me Archie as well, if you like. I like it just fine. How's tricks, Arch, old man? Bit on the slow side this morning. Look here, Arch. This isn't working. Wouldn't you agree? Why not? Let's be frank. Too much of a good thing. Well, I wouldn't say so. But you're thinking it. Let's just say I'm temporarily accessible to suggestions about how to occupy my time. Face it, you're bored to tears. Solitude is one thing, but loneliness... Loneliness is quite another. Loneliness. I despise people, loathe them. And I, Archibald Beechcraft, have done away with them. For good and all, mind you, for good and all. I'm leaving. You haven't finished your lunch. I don't have much of an appetite. Thought about any alternatives? Alternatives to what? To this. It's like an empty movie set in here. I don't even want to think about what it's like outside. Look at yourself. You don't have idea one about how to fill the day. People are bad enough, but inactivity is even worse. You're talking nonsense. I'm content. I'm honestly and truly content. For the first time in my life, I have managed to rid myself of the worst scourge there is. The general populace. So what are you going to do? Splurge and buy a can of tropical fruit punch from the soft drink machine? Will that do it for you? If the truth be known, I would like... Well, I would appreciate a little diversion of some kind. Any kind. You mean like a change in the weather? That's it. Perhaps a little unseasonal rain. Or a lot of rain. Let's make it a tropical storm with thunder and lightning. The works. That should shake things up. All I have to do is concentrate. Hmm. Not that exciting, is it? Maybe we need to add something spectacular. Like an earthquake. I'm sure you want to do that. Why not? Here goes. You mean there it goes? I can imagine what the office looks like right now. My desk! All your files on the floor. I'm gonna take some sorting. Enough! No earthquake and no storm either. Forget it! So now what, Arch, old man? I've had it for the day. I'm gonna take the rest of the afternoon off. Uh-huh. And do what? Stroll down the street? Take a ride on the subway all by your lonesome? Boy, I'll bet the old apartment building's quiet as a tomb. It's starting to get to you, isn't it? The thing of it is, I don't care much for people, but it's difficult not having anyone. Present company excluded. I guess it's a trade-off. That's the crux of the problem. Frankly, there isn't a breed of human being that I can stomach. Ever think of a cocker spaniel? I never cared much for animals, either. Most of all, though, I can't stand people. Thanks. Well, except for you, naturally. But that's because you're a higher class of individual. I... Wait a minute. That's it! That's what? Why didn't I think of it before? People I can stand. That's what I'll do. I'll create people who are just like me. A world full of Archie Beechcrafts. Now that's a thought. You bet your sweet life it is. I'll will it. I'll concentrate, and from now on, everyone will be exactly like me. It's so simple. And when will this new era be ushered in? Tomorrow morning. I'll re-people the Earth. Nothing but my kind of folks. In fact, why wait? How about right now? 15th floor, everybody off. Look at them, like sardines. Rude, thoughtless people. Worthless, every last one. Nobody has any manners now. Late. Thanks to them. Listen to them. They sound just like me. You're not kidding. Take a gander at their faces. They look like us, too. A rather handsome lot, you must admit. Where are they headed? Back to work, I presume. Those who chose not to dine in the cafeteria. A sight for sore eyes, eh, Archie? It certainly is. Now that I've decided to replenish the population in a kinder, gentler mold. This, I gotta see. United Tool and Die, one moment, please. The son of noise, the miserable noise. I'll go out of my ever-loving mind. Keep it down, I'm trying to work. I can't hear myself think. People. People, people, is there no respite? Herds, droves, legions, armies, hosts, bevies, coveys of people. Deliver me, please deliver me. Hear that, Arch? I've heard more than enough. You asked for it, you got it. A sty. That's what it is. Nothing but a pigsty. A people sty. Had it. Undeniably. Finally getting through to you, huh? Without a doubt. A lot of me is just as bad as a lot of them. You said it. So. What's to do now? Nothing else to do, but put it back the way it was. Just like that? Just like that. Mind over matter. Concentrate. 
Go away, disappear, be extinct. Go away, disappear, be extinct. Go away, disappear, be extinct. Hello, Mr. Beechcraft. Why, hello, Laura. How nice to see you. What? Oh, nothing, nothing. It's just good to have you back. I haven't been anywhere. <laughs> no, 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 of course not. Hi, Mr. Beechcraft. I got your coffee. Uh, Miss Petty, Laura. You didn't have to do that, Henry. Uh, careful now. Oh, 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 Mr. Beechcraft, sir. Please forgive me. You should be more. Forget it, Henry. Nothing serious. It isn't? Not at all. Just another little spill on the old sleeve. I'll take care of it with my handkerchief. Gee, thanks, Mr. Beechcraft, for being so nice about it. Tut tut, my lad, tut tut. Something else, Henry? I was just wondering, sir. Yes? That book I gave you? Did you get anything out of it? Not really. Why don't you take it back? You sure? Frankly, it's a lot of pap. Interesting, but totally unbelievable. And now, if you'll excuse me, I think I'll get back to work. Mr. Archibald Beechcraft, a child of his time, a product of the population explosion, and an unwilling inheritor of the legacy of progress. A man who has just found out through trial and error that with all its faults, this may well be the best of all possible worlds, people notwithstanding. Tonight's case in point, in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to twilightzoneradio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at twilightzoneradio.com. The Mind and the Matter, starring Hal Sparks, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Rich Komenik, Lisa Joyce, Jeff Lupiton, Doug James, Vince Amari, Meg Thalkin, Roderick Peoples, C.J. Amari, Roger Wolski, Karen Olson, Carl Amari, and Lynn Foley. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. 
This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. you, Markison? Evening, Conrad. Thought I'd find you out here. You thought right. Look at her. Like a needle pointed straight up at the sky. Pretty big needle. Odd, isn't it? Why do you say that? Well, for us, I mean. Odd way to spend the last night. Yeah. I couldn't sleep. Neither could I. But what a thing to do. A last night on Earth you don't spend in the middle of the desert looking at your transportation... Uh, last night, you spend, well, you spend it enjoying Earth. You walk around its streets, you go into its bars, you dance with its women. Yeah. You drink in its view, savor it, enjoy it. But not us. That ship out there, we'll have all we want of her and more. She'll be our world for quite a while. 113 feet long by 18 feet wide. And yet here we stand, Conrad, watching her. Just three hours before we take off. Maybe we're trying to get used to the idea. Oh, we'll have plenty of time to get used to it. That'll be our city and country and house and front yard and backyard for the next three months. And we won't have any choice in the matter. Markson, could I ask you a question? Go ahead. Are you afraid? Of some things, I guess. The unknown, loneliness, the silence up there. But the ship... After all the work that's gone into her, I don't think so. How about you, Sam? It's... different. You're ready for this. Three, four, five years. It's all you've prepared yourself for. But it's not the same with me. We both went through the same flight training. I know, but I'm a scientist, Markison, a biologist. My whole life, my world has been books and slides and microscopes. I'm being sent up there because they need my mind. Pity they just can't send that and leave my body back here where it belongs. But speaking frankly, yeah, I am afraid. I'm frightened of the place we're going and what we might find there. Martians? Well, that's not very likely. They're the one thing you don't need to be afraid of. They shouldn't be feared, even if we do run into them. Whoever we meet up there, whatever kind of creatures they are, if they exist... There'll still be people of one sort or another. You don't really think that. Why not? I've got a philosophy about people, and I mean all people. I'm sure that when God made human beings, he developed them from a... Call it a fixed formula, with the same batch of ingredients. We have a pattern of behavior designed to meet certain needs. And those needs are going to be identical, no matter what the form and the place. And that means we're all essentially the same, on Earth or in the farthest reaches of space. Think about it, Sam. People. On Mars. Wherever they're able to exist, they have to be the same. Even up there in the stars. I'd like to be able to read those stars. I wish there were an equation that applies. A plus Y equals what? A rocket ship plus two men equals... Equals a wondrous adventure. Let's get ready, Sam. We've only got a couple of hours. You're standing at the edge of a highway into space, one soon to be traveled by a flimsy two-legged animal with an extremely small head. His name is Man, and he is about to send his tiny groping fingers up into the unknown, bound for a once mythical place known as Mars. The participants are Samuel A. Conrad, age 35, and Warren Markison, age 31. They are the first to undertake such an ambitious voyage. And in a moment, we'll travel with them to a location only slightly off course in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, People Are Alike All Over, starring Blair Underwood with Stacy Keach as your narrator. 
prepare to correct course? Not yet. Fire retro rockets on my mark. Wait, I said. For what? I want to run a thermal scan on the landing gear. You did that. Well, I'm doing it again. Plus a spectrographic on the planet's surface. We can't even see the surface till we correct. By the time we finish the turn, it'll be too late. Too late for what? To change the flight plan. The gravitational field will take effect. Exactly. We cut the main thrusters and fire the retros for a nice soft landing, right? Isn't that right, Conrad? What if something's wrong? Nothing's wrong. But what if it is? It'll take all the fuel we've got for another orbit. We have to be absolutely sure. We're as sure as we're ever going to be. There are too many variables. Atmospheric density, drag coefficients, power consumption. We've been through all that. I just checked the readings. The readings could be wrong. If we're off by a factor of 0.01, we'll miss the landing site completely. I'm going to run the numbers one more time. No, you're not. I'm in command here, and I say we're going in now. At least wait till the planet rolls up on the view screen. I want a spectrographic readout. Five. Four. Not yet. Cancel the sequence. I'm not canceling anything. Two. One. Fire retros. I said fire. All right, if you won't do it... Don't touch that switch! Fire. Fire! You fool. Strap into your seat now! Marcuson, you all right? Marcuson, where are you? Warren? Warren, can you hear me? Over here. Oh, thank God. After a landing like that? Any landing you can walk away from is a good landing. If you can get this instrument panel off me, I'll try to do that. Hang on, it's split in two. Let's see if I can lift it. How's the rest of the ship? Nose down in the bottom of a crater, as far as I can tell. Air pressure seems to be holding. Here, take my hand. Whoa, whoa. Not just yet, Sam. I've got a little bit of a problem with this leg. But we made it, didn't we? Yeah, we made it. With or without my help. It wasn't your fault. Sure it was. If I'd followed your order... We still would have come down at the wrong angle. The flight plan was off. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the flight plan. It's the terrain. It's not like the reconnaissance photos. Close but different. Somehow... Then you were right to be cautious. Do we have power? I don't know. I haven't had time to check anything. Try to get the lights running. It's dark in here. I may be able to rig a new circuit. You do that. I'll give you a hand. Don't be crazy. You can't even stand up. I'll do it. Sam? Yeah? Hurry, if you can. Will you, Sam? I want to take a look outside. I want to... I want to see what's really there. There's plenty of time for that. Uh, is there? I told you, we've got air. That means the hull's intact. You rest easy. I'll, I'll get the medical kit. If you say so, Sam. If you say so. Sam? I've got the circuits up. We are in business. What are you doing? Running a diagnostic on the equipment. Stay down. How long did I sleep? A couple of hours. Don't worry, you needed it. You run an atmosphere check? Yeah. So, is it safe out there? That's the question. What's the matter? Something wrong with the sample? No, I got a good one. More than enough. That's the problem. You couldn't get a reading? Oh, I got a reading all right. A complete analysis down to the last trace element. So what did it say? It says the air is fine. Almost identical to the mix on Earth. Well, what are we sitting here for? Let's go plant the flag. Hold on. You're not going anywhere with that leg. You go then. Just get the hatch open so I can see what's out there. I'm not going anywhere. Of course you are. Sam, we're the first men on Mars. What's the matter with you? Not yet. What are you waiting for, a printed invitation? It's the reading. But you said it was fine. It... it can't be right. Don't you trust the equipment, Sam? 
You designed it, remember? You and I both know there's no breathable atmosphere on Mars. Well, maybe there is where we landed. That doesn't make sense. If we're in a crater, there could be a buildup of gases. Not according to any scientific literature I've ever read. <sighs> then it's obvious the literature is wrong. You trust your equipment? I've run the data 50 times. And everything checks out. We made it, Sam. We made it. You know what that means? I want to filter out another sample and run it through the analyzer. We've traveled 35 million miles. Exactly. Another few hours won't make any difference. We can't wait any longer. The human race won't wait. If you won't open the hatch, I'll do it myself. You won't be able to get it open. The hydraulic's out. <sighs> Patching the auxiliary power supply. You said the circuits are up. I'm telling you, we can't. Maybe you can't, but I can. You're going to wreck your other leg. I'll use the manual override. That's what I'll do. I'll disconnect the hydraulic lift at the wall and... I told you to take it easy. Sam. <laughs> just my luck, eh? 35 million miles through black space just to find a place to die. You are not going to die. It's all right. Really. It's just that... I'd hate for this ship to be my tomb. Do me one favor. Anything. When it does happen, and I think it'll be soon. Don't talk like that. Get me outside, one way or another. Don't be afraid. I've got a strange hunch that if anybody's out there, they'll help you with the funeral. That's how people are. And they are people, Sam. As long as they've got minds and hearts, that means they've got souls. And that makes them... people. No. For God's sake, don't die now. Don't leave me alone here. Warren! Warren! What's that? I don't know that. There's no way to find out, and, I, and I'm not ready to find out. Go away! Whoever or whatever you are, go away! No. No, they're coming. Whatever they are, they're coming. The gun. Where's the survival kit? There. Nothing fancy, just a good old 38 automatic. That ought to do the trick. Get away! I said, get away from the ship! All right, if you won't go away, you want me to come out, I'll come out. You think you're ready for me, huh? Huh? Where's that lever? Whoever or whatever you are, let's find out if you can eat lead. What the hell? Come on. Where are you? What are you waiting for? You see this? It's a gun. Know what a gun is? Want to find out? Step into the light so I can see you. Please, don't be afraid. There's no reason to, you know. What do you have in your hand? Oh, this, this it's a pistol. It's a... I, I, I was only going to use it if... Uh... May I see it? What? Uh, I, I suppose so. Just don't touch the trigger. It, 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 it contains uh, explosive missiles. They're called bullets. We didn't know if you were ever going to come out. We've waited most of the night. Very glad to see that you've finally done so, however. This is amazing. 
Ah, I'm Conrad. Samuel Conrad. That's my name. Uh, you understand? Name? Oh, we understand, Mr. Conrad. We landed here, my friend and I, uh, in this ship. Crashed, I should say. We come from Earth. Earth? Where I'm from. This planet is known as Mars. We took off in our ship almost uh, three months ago. Check on the other one. He may be injured. Yes, of course. Here, I'll show you in the sand. See, this is the sun. Sun, the, the, the big star. And this is the Earth. The third planet from the sun. And this is you. Here. The other one is dead. His name is Marcuson. Don't be alarmed, Mr. Conrad. We don't intend to hurt you. We've only been wondering when you intended to come out. Of course, we were curious. But how... How do you know my language? We don't, Mr. Conrad. As you'll no doubt soon realize, you're speaking our language. Your language? Unconscious transference. You'd call it hypnosis of a sort. But you must be tired. We'll prepare a place for you to rest and food. I'm appreciative. I, I really am. You'll forgive me my... my staring, I, I, I mean, but I, I can't get over it. I mean, you're... you're people. Just like I am. Actual human beings. Markson said you'd... Marcus. We'll bury your friend for you. Later on, you can tell us the sort of marker you'd like. That is your tradition, isn't it? Yes, it is. We can also repair your ship for you. You can? If that would please you. Oh, yes, yes, very much. Good. Consider it done. There are so many questions I want to ask. Really? So many things. I want to find out about your, your, your civilization, your, your science, the way you live, the social structure. A hundred questions. A thousand. We will be glad to answer all your questions. But first, you must rest. Yes. Come with us, Mr. Conrad. You must have food and drink and sleep. After you. Where are we going? Not far. A structure we've built. I don't see anything. Oh, I know it's dark out there, but it's only a short walk. You'll understand more when we arrive. The true end of your journey, if you will. A place that's more comfortable. Would you give me a moment? What? It won't take long. I'd like to say goodbye to my friend. Oh, certainly. Marcus, I hope, I hope you know what's happened. I hope you know that you were right. There are Martians, after all, and they're people. It's incredible, but, but they really are just like us. You knew, didn't you? Somehow, you knew. Oh, I'm sorry, old friend, that I didn't believe you. And that you didn't live to see them. Are you ready, Mr. Conrad? Yes. I'm ready. I hope this will do. I'm impressed. On Earth, this would be considered very modern. The angles, the lines. Are the walls stainless steel? Well, not exactly. Something like it. Would this be considered a typical house here? In a sense, it would be the equivalent of an apartment, I believe you call it. Except that there's no furniture. I don't believe it. Everything is built into the walls. What's the power source? Not electricity, surely it's... A simple principle, really. You'll hear all about it. About everything. But we promised you food. Your table and chair. From the ceiling? That's brilliant! And on the table, your meal. It will taste somewhat different from what you're accustomed to, but I trust you'll find it agreeable. Here. Thank you so much. All of you. You know, I am hungry. 
Very hungry. Please sit down, Mr. Conrad, and eat. Mmm. It's different, but it... But I like the taste. Like, uh, melon or, uh, cantaloupe, maybe. Mmm. And yet, there's almost a, a meat flavor. You don't mind it? Mind? Are you kidding? After that freeze-dried stuff we ate on the ship? No. Oh. Mmm. This is delicious. We'll leave you to eat, then. Oh, I wonder... Could you do us a small favor, Mr. Conrad? Mm, anything. As a favor, would you mind sketching for us what a home looks like on Earth so we'll better understand your culture? No, no, not at all. Uh, this is what we call a ranch house. It has only one story. Here, look, I'll show you. This is roughly the shape. The front door here. This is what's known as a picture window. Looking out from the living room. I see. The bedroom area. And the kitchen, where we cook the food. Here, I'll put down some more details about the interior. Please. Couch, chair, television set. Then inside the kitchen, over here, the refrigerator. Maybe a freezer. And the stove. A freezer and a stove? Well, one to keep the food from spoiling and, and one to heat it up. Remarkable. In the bedroom, the bed, the bureau, the mirror, you understand? Do you understand mirror? Um, reflection? To look at yourself. Uh -huh. <laughs> of course, I've forgotten. Will you look at that? Here's your mirror, along with the sink, towels, running water, and this will be your bed. All the comforts of home. Eat in pleasure, Mr. Conrad, and then rest. We'll come back later. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, miss? Yes? I didn't ask any of your names. That's all right. You have a name, don't you? I'm called Tina. Tina, I wish you'd... Uh, will, will you tell the others for me how much I appreciate all this? The trouble you've gone to, this, this is a pretty wonderful thing that's happened to me, so... Thank you. Do you understand? Thank you. I mean, to come millions of miles and, and meet people of your own kind, I, I was so frightened before. I, I was so miserably frightened. And then... Please don't be. I know what I was afraid of now. I was afraid of loneliness, of silence, of the unknown. But now my friend was right. There's no need for fear now. No need at all. No one will hurt you, I promise. You must believe that. I do now. I'll see you later, Mr. Conrad. I hope so, Tina. And please, call me by my given name. It's Sam. Goodbye, Sam. There she is. Sorry, he had more questions. What did you tell him? That we'd be back later. He understands. How did he take the language transference? Oh, quite easily. His quotient is low enough. You should see the wave chart. He has the mind almost of an infant. And you must have a look at his ship. I have done so. So primitive as to be almost unbelievable. You wonder how he made it here. Tina, how does he react to things? What? He asked you a question. I'm sorry, how does... His reactions. Most trusting. Emotionally very complex. He feels loneliness, curiosity, excitement. He seems to crave companionship. And what is your recommendation? My... For what we should do with him. I think we should let him go. Oh, let him go. How can we let him go? He means us no harm, and he's... He's what? Tell us what he is. Go ahead, Tina. Feel free to speak. He's... He's so much like us, that's all. <laughs> Did you hear that, everyone? He's so much like us. Excuse me. Tina, where are you going? I have something to do. At this hour, surely not. Perhaps to observe our new arrival. After all, he is almost one of us now. <laughs> one of us indeed. <laughs> Tina? Is that you? Yes, Mr. Conrad. I was just... Ah, what's the joke? Oh, something one of my friends said. Oh, what was it? Something humorous, that's all. At least he thought so. Hmm. Won't you come in? I wouldn't want to disturb you. 
Not much chance of that. I'm too wound up. This is all a bit much to grasp at one time. You must have a great many questions. Perhaps you can answer a few of them. If you don't mind, that is. Won't you sit down? Well, maybe for just a minute. Have a seat. The couch is quite comfortable, thanks to you. Mr. Conrad, there's something you should know. Oh, well, that's an understatement. Where do we start? I don't quite know how to put this, but... Ah, uh, wait. I'm not a very good host. After all, you and your people have been so gracious, seeing to my every need. Is, is there anything you'd like? I, I assume there are refreshments. I don't suppose you people know what a drink is. In the cabinet, you'll find several varieties of beverages. Yeah? I hope they're to your satisfaction. Let's just have a look. Do you mind? Be my guest. I don't believe it! This is a 25-year-old single malt. Where did you get it? We manufactured it, you might say, to suit your taste. But how could you know what my taste is? We retrieved it from your memories, telepathically, to use your word. You were very specific in your recollections. May I ask what it is like? You mean you've never had scotch whiskey before? Well, young lady, you are in for a treat. Here, I'll pour us both one. I'm not sure that's a good idea. You're right, it's not. It's a great idea. Give this a try. Perhaps just a taste. Here's to the end of a long long journey and to good people everywhere mm. <coughs> it's a strange taste it's so sharp oh <laughs> i should have told you to sip it just take a small amount and just roll it around in your mouth then you swallow it ah yeah how's that it's interesting you said your people manufactured this how exactly uh, you must use some sort of molecular reconstruction powered by... Uh, what is the power source here, by the way? Solar? Hydrogen fusion? Uh, we've been experimenting with this on Earth for years, but so far... Please, Mr. Conrad, I... You seem nervous. It's just that... Not my fault, I hope. I've, I've never been very good at small talk, getting to know people socially. I, and, and now I'm more aware of that than ever. You're behaving perfectly. That's not the problem at all. You're the one who should be uneasy with us. Suspicious. What's to be suspicious about? Do you want to know the absolute truth? This experience, meeting all of you, it's lifted a burden off my chest. All this time, not knowing what to expect. But you're so kind. You're so understanding. You take it all in stride. A visitor from another planet, I mean, am I... The first? No, I can't say that you are. I should have known. You accepted me so easily. That and the other... Uh, Visitors, where did they come from? Not Earth, obviously. Outside the solar system? Please. There will be plenty of time to answer those questions and more. I'm sure there will be. But you see, I'm... I'm a scientist. Facts, numbers... Those are our concerns, too. They have been since time immemorial. You've been here a very long time. Your civilization, I mean. Yes, in Earth terms. But Mr. Conrad... Sam, there is something I wanted to tell you. It's only fair that you know before... Before. Before what? Ah, Mr. Conrad. Still awake, I see. Oh, come in. I was just telling Tina here. Mr. Conrad, we have a surprise for you. Really? A very nice surprise. You shouldn't go to any more trouble. Would you accompany us, please? Where are we going? That's the surprise, Mr. Conrad. You'll see soon enough. Isn't she coming? Tina will remain behind. Oh, we were just getting acquainted. She has other duties. Actually, I... Don't you, Tina? I hope I'll see you later. No. If you don't mind, Sam, I think I will go with you now. Tina. Great. I'd like that. Quite a complex you have here. There must be miles of corridors. Like... Interconnecting tubes. It provides both shelter and a gathering place for our people. The walls, are they glass? A form of what you call plastic. Very strong, for protection against the elements. Then you have seasons. We've seen evidence of dust storms on the surface and, of course, the polar ice caps. We've had to recreate an atmosphere in recent centuries. That has wrought havoc with the forces of nature. Far more than you might have observed from space. I can hardly wait to take a closer look. Really, Mr. Conrad, you don't want to tire yourself. You should get a good night's rest while you can. No reason to. I feel fine. 
Does the complex house your research facilities, laboratories, that sort of thing? They are in an adjacent structure. I thought I saw a reflection out there, but it's so dark. All in good time. It will be a few more hours until sunrise. Then all will be clear. Ah, here we are. After you, Mr. Conrad. What? Allow me to illuminate it for you. But this is... This is what, sir? Why, it's just like... Like the entrance to my house back home. Is it? Yes. This is the foyer, and, 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 the, and, the, and the living room would be down here. You like it? Do I? It's a perfect replica of my place in California. This is perfect. We did our best. I mean, in every detail. Furniture, the... Uh, the, the works, even the drapes. If I open them, I bet I'll see my old picture window. No point in opening them now. It's dark. Wait till morning. How did you build it so quickly? We sincerely hope this is the way you're used to living. You didn't miss a thing. The general outline came from your diagram, the rest from your mind. You think very clearly, Mr. Conrad. Very clearly, indeed. Strong, clean impressions. Would you care to see the rest of the house? Would I ever? Ah! My kitchen! And my refrigerator! It's filled with your favorite foods, the ones you remember most vividly. Cheese? Uh, fried chicken? And pizza? Oh, oh. I'd love to have some warmed over pizza right about now. This is really fabulous. I don't know how to repay you. Your presence is quite enough. Now, I really, really, truly appreciate it. We wanted you to feel at home, Mr. Conrad. Do you? <laughs> well, I, I never saw it this clean. Splendid. In that case, we were wondering if you'd mind remaining here for a little while. Oh, sure. And about my spaceship. Take your time. Your spaceship? You said you'd be able to fix it. Oh, yes. We'll restore it to its original state and then transport it here, outside your residence. It will be in perfect working order. That's great. You expressed interest in seeing more of our people. We'll arrange that first thing in the morning. I'm sure they will be most interested. I'd be delighted. For a little while longer, then. Enjoy yourself, Mr. Conrad. Enjoy your house. You bet I will. I can hardly wait to sleep on a real mattress again. Oh, let me show you out. That's not necessary. Sure it is. This is my house, isn't it? It is, sir. It most certainly is. What's this in the vase? You call them roses, don't you? Well, yes, but how? We had a little trouble with the petals. So delicate. If you examine them closely, you may find them somewhat imperfect. I doubt that very much. Here, I want you to have one. It's my way of saying thanks. Thank you. I'll keep it to remember you by... But we'll see each other again, won't we? What? What? Are you crying? Come along, Tina. I'm very happy to... to have known you, Sam. Time to go. Sleep well and wake refreshed. Man, will I? This is too much. I wonder if there's some more of that scotch in here. Yes! Well, all I can say is if this is an illusion, it's one a guy can live with. Mm. This is the best scotch I've ever tasted. Mm. Ah. I've got to sit down here, put my feet up. Ah. This is the greatest. Absolutely the greatest. picture window and see what morning's like on Mars. Oh, look at that. Red sand. Red hills. Ooh, oh, wow. <laughs> they made the window so it retracts automatically. Oh, 
about that. Oh. Real honest to goodness air. <sighs> I gotta get outside. Come on. It's a matter of the store. Wait a minute. What's that? Sounds like some kind of vehicle. Hey! Hey, everybody! I bring you greetings from Earth! Hey, hey. What are these bars for? Everyone, please exit through the rear of the tram. Over here! I'd like to shake your hands, but I'm locked in. Go to the main window, please. He's still in quarantine. What's he talking about? Why are you all looking at me like that? Please don't touch the bars. Hey, what's going on? Hey! This is our latest acquisition. No, no, it can't be. <gasps> My ship. They said they'd move it here. Wait, why, why, why would they? It can't blast off this close. It would set the whole house on fire. Unless they don't intend. Isn't he unusual? Careful, children. Can it talk? Yes, on an elementary level. A very limited vocabulary, of course. Its primitive spacecraft will soon be on permanent display. For now, you're free to observe the creature in its natural surroundings. I don't belong Note the here. simple primal emotions. No! No! Let me out of here! You may take holograms, if you like. And next, we'll move on to the Venusian habitat, the intergalactic breeding area, and the Alpha Centauri house. This again is a holographic opportunity. I don't belong in here, please! Please! I would like to take a hologram. Isn't she cute? Look this way, Earthman! You were right, Marcus. You were right. People, they are the same. No matter where you go, they are always the same. It's a zoo. A zoo. <laughs> a zoo! <laughs> it's a zoo. Species of animal on public display. Physical characteristics similar to a human being. Head, trunk, arms, legs, hands, feet. Very tiny, undeveloped brain. Comes from a primitive planet known as Earth. Calls himself Samuel Conrad. And he will remain here in his specially constructed cage with running water and electricity and central heating for the rest of his natural life. Because Samuel Conrad finally discovered a flight plan that led him off course and into the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at TwilightZoneRadio.com. People Are Alike All Over, starring Blair Underwood, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling, based on a story by Paul W. Fairman. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, Lisa Joyce, Richard Hensel, Steve Key, Derek Purcell, Doug James, Linda Ryder, Brooke Reed, Charlie Kummerer, Amanda Amari, and C.J. Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, 
Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, Exum Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Matches, pencils, buttons, shoelaces, anything you need, anything at all. Anything I need, huh, Puff? That's right. No chance. Why do you say that? Because nobody has what I need. You never know. Take a look in the tray. Forget it, old man. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. Every night you're out here selling this cheap junk. But I haven't seen nothing yet that fills the bill. Maybe you haven't looked close enough. Oh, I've looked, all right. Needles and thread, thimbles, eyeglasses. Where'd you get all this stuff? From a flea market? Here and there. It's a hobby of mine. You never know what people will need. What people will need. You're crazy, Pop. You know that? You're out of your ever-loving tree. Am I? You can bet on it. Standing here like this, nobody ever stops, right? Oh, once in a while they do. Sure. Why would they? All you got's junk. Why don't you trade it in for a tin cup? Stick a sign around your neck that says... Poor me. Nothing to eat and no place to go. That wouldn't be correct. I have a room of my own. <laughs> yeah, right. A cardboard box in an alley. Actually, it's a rooming house. Been there quite a few years. I pay rent like everybody else. With what? Nickels and dimes? What do they give you for crap like this? People give what they like. A little or a lot. Sometimes, nothing at all. Then you're loonier than I thought. Face it, you're a bum. Why don't you admit it? Nowhere to go and nothing to do. You mean, uh, like you? Listen, you old codger. I got lots of things to do and plenty of places to do them in. Fact is, I'm on my way someplace right now. I got business. I know. In that bar. It's where you're going. You walk in, but when you come out a few hours from now... Hey, you don't know a thing about me. Not a blamed thing. So keep your trap shut. Sorry if I've offended you. I only meant that... We're all exactly where we belong. The only shame is in not knowing opportunity when we see it. An opportunity, say, to improve our lot. Yeah? Well, I'm doing plenty to improve my lot. Just you watch. But you? You're going nowhere fast. You're going to stay right here till you rot. You're yesterday's news, old man. You're a big fat nothing. If you say so. I wish you a good evening, sir. Shoe polish? Ballpoint pens? Ah, uh, get lost. I got business, important business. Chewing gum, candy, toothpicks. You've just met Mr. Fred Renard, age 36, who carries on his shoulder a chip the size of the national debt. It consists of an antagonism directed against the world, those who people it, and everything with which he comes in contact. The taste of his food, the temperature of his coffee, the fact that he has lost 11 jobs in the past year and three girlfriends in the past month. A general displeasure that is as much a part of the man as his eyes, nose, and ears. This is a sour man, a friendless man, a lonely, grasping, nervous man, a man who has lived 36 pointless, meaningless, 
undistinguished, failure-laden years on this earth, and who at this moment is looking for an escape, any escape, any route out of the norm, any path away from the sameness of his living, anything, any body to get him out of his rut. And though he does not know it yet, the little old man on the street corner may turn out to be just what Mr. Renard has been waiting for at an unlikely intersection in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, What You Need, starring Bruno Kirby and Bruce Kirby, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Ready yet? For what? For me to pour you another one. I'm fine. You've been fine for an hour. I'm not finished yet. Then how come your glass is empty? You got a time limit? Look, we sell booze here, mister. We don't rent space. Is that a fact? That's a fact, buddy. Tell you what, then. Yeah? Why don't you just go take a flying jump at the moon? All kinds. You mean all kinds. You okay, miss? Yes, thank you. I was just leaving. Take your time. Oh, that was a heck of a season. Darn right it was. We could have gone all the way. Yeah, you pretty near did. Boston had nothing in the outfield. New York. Forget about it. We had it all sewed up. How you doing, Lefty? Oh, I'm fine, Sal. Yep. All sewed up. Then they brought in that slugger from Cincinnati. Bring the man another beer. Ah, oh, you don't have to do that. I know I don't, but it ain't every day I get to talk to Lefty Garrity. That was a while ago. Listen, the man wants to buy you a drink. You let him. Make it two. Two drafts coming up. Thank you kindly, fella. Don't mention it. Hey, Pop. Good evening, gentlemen and lady. Does anyone need anything? Anything at all? Not tonight, Pop. You, sir? I told you. Get lost. Ah, so you did. So you did. How about you, miss? Matches? Perfume? Really, I don't think so. A hair ribbon, perhaps. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the young lady's hair. Thank you. Why don't you give it a rest tonight, Pop? You might have a look just the same. I have a little bit of everything here. I guess I'll take some matches. You don't need matches, miss. I don't? I'll tell you what you need. Yes, I think I know exactly what you need. What is it? Cleaning fluid. Cleaning? Very good cleaning fluid, guaranteed. Remove spots of any and all kinds. I think you'll find it useful. I really don't... Believe me, miss. It's what you need. Well, I suppose I... How much is it? No charge. Here you are. There you go. Two drafts. Thanks, Sal. You looking at me, Pop? He's okay. I know he is. I've seen him in here before. What have you got there? Oh, many things. Odds and ends. Things you need. Things I need? What do you think I need, Pop? That's always the question, isn't it? A cigarette lighter? I'm afraid not. I don't smoke. A pair of socks, perhaps? Man, that wouldn't help me. What I need, well, you wouldn't have that. <laughs> Tell him, Lefty. The old coot comes in here every night bugging everybody. Tell him what you need. Go on. And what might that be? A new left arm. A new arm, did you say? Lefty was quite a ball player in his time. Pitched for the Cubs. Then his arm went sour. Didn't it, Lefty? Didn't it go sour on you? Sure did. So that was what happened. I should know. I dropped a bundle on him at a Sunday doubleheader a couple of years ago. What do you do now? What does he do? Well, for starters, he comes in here seven nights a week looking for his career. I keep telling him it ain't at the bottom of a bottle. Sometimes there are alternatives. Other things a man can do. Instead of pitching? Instead of baseball? Come on, let's get back to the socks and shoelaces, Pop. All right, give me one of each. That's more like it. I think this is what you really need. A piece of paper? Go ahead, take it. It's like a bus ticket. That's right. That's what it is. A bus ticket. A ticket to... Scranton, Pennsylvania. Scranton, Pennsylvania. What's in Scranton, old man? I'm afraid I couldn't say. Coal mines. That's what they got in Scranton, Pennsylvania. They got nice, lovely coal mines. You can't pitch with that arm, Lefty. Maybe you can dig with it. 
Wonder who that is. Sal's place. Somebody's old lady, probably. Or a bookie calling to collect. If it's for me, I ain't been in. Got it? What? Yeah. Yeah, he's here. Hey, I thought I told you. Lefty. Huh? You want it on the phone. Me? That's what the man said. Wants to talk to Mr. Garrity. You're kidding. Hello? Yes. Uh-huh. But he never got any calls before. No. Are you sure? Maybe it's his wife. Nope. He's not married. When? Hey, listen, if this is a gag... Right. I understand. Uh-huh. Okay. I'll be there. And, uh, thanks. Thanks a heck of a lot. Well, what do you know? Dead rich uncle or a horse come in? I can't believe it. Believe what? Old manager of mine. Said he's been calling around trying to find me for three weeks. I thought he was putting me on. You owe him money? He said he's got a job for me. A coaching job. Minor league club in Scranton, Pennsylvania. No kidding. That's great. A minor league club in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Wants me to take a bus there for, uh, uh, for an interview. Well, if that don't beat all. You hear that, Pop? He wants me to take a bus. Does he? How'd you know? Coincidence, maybe, or just good fortune. Why question it? Why question? It's there for you. But this ticket, I don't get it. I just don't get it. Better get packing, Lefty. You're wasting time. Oh, nothing much to pack. This is the only suit I own. Oh, I wish I had time to take it to the cleaners, though. You look fine. No, I don't. Still got this old stain on the front, see? Gravy or something. I like to look halfway decent when I meet the general manager. That's who's going to interview me. The general manager. Oh, I hate to look like a tramp. I can get a shave, but I don't have any other suits. Excuse me. I couldn't help but over here. Why don't you try some of this on your jacket? What? It's supposed to be very good for that sort of thing. Uh, thank you, ma'am, but uh, Miss. It's Miss. But I wouldn't want to... Here. Let me try. Uh, don't go to any trouble. All I need is a handkerchief. Yes, I have one. It should only take a few drops. Stand still. Well, I'll be. There. You look good as new, Lefty. Thanks very much, miss. I appreciate it. That's quite all right. Oh, lucky you were around. Not really luck. The old gentleman there, he's the one who gave me... Where did he go? Looks like he just slipped out. Ain't that something. What do I owe you for the drink? Hmm? Oh, make it a buck fifty. Here. Last of the big time spenders. What's he in such a hurry about? Candy, breath mints, pencils. I saw what happened. Something for you after all? A flower for your lapel. Is this what I need? That's up to you, sir. Or a nice necktie. I have several different designs. What do I need only? You tell me. One needs different things at different times. What do I need now? What do I need tonight? It's late. You stay right here. What do I need? Try this. What? Is this a gag? Because if it is... Oh, it's no gag. Then what in the... It's what you need. Scissors? That's right. I want you to level with me, old man. I mean it. I'll spread you out for three blocks. So bad, they'll have to scrape you up with a spoon. It... it's what you need. It really is. Go ahead, take it. So what do I need a pair of scissors for? You don't have to accept them, of course. The choice is yours. You're giving me a pair of scissors? Precisely. Let me get this straight. I'm gonna need these. But you can't tell me what for. I'm afraid not. Well, let me tell you one thing. What I need is something that'll do me some good. Like a tip on a horse at Belmont. One that's gonna finish in the money. Just give me the name, I'll do the rest. Sorry. I know nothing about gambling. Is that the truth? 
But you're asking me to gamble on this. A pair of scissors. What's it going to get me? I couldn't say, but I do believe it's... What I need. I heard you the first time. Well, I'll tell you, Pop. I need scissors like I need a hole in the head. Say, what are you trying to pull? Pull? You help those people in the bar. But me? I get something to open my letters with. Something to cut a piece of string. Now, you listen to me. These things will cut a lot more than that. Like your throat. Don't you forget it. If you think I'm some punk, you can pull a joke on. No joke, I assure you. Ah, forget it. What am I wasting my time for? You're just a nickel and dime loser. I got better things to do. I got business. Big business. Very well, then. If you're sure... Give them to me. You said they were mine, didn't you? I did. Yeah, yeah, why not? See you in the funny papers, old man. Perfume? Lipstick? Kitchen utensils? Anything you need. It's Freddy. Who do you think? Freddy. Been a while, huh? Not long enough. I ain't got time for deadbeats. Hey, what are you talking about? I paid you off every penny. Took you long enough. I always pay my debts. Say, listen, Carmine. I was looking at the racing form. What are you bothering me for? And I see a horse here looks pretty good. The sixth race tomorrow. Name of, uh, let me see. Staunch Soldier. Yeah, that's it. I couldn't steal a purse from an old lady. I don't know, Carmine. Says they're taking the weights off. Plus, he's getting a drop in class. Sounds like a sure thing. So I was thinking, why don't you put a C note down for me across the board? What are you, a comedian now? What'd you say? Must be something wrong with the line. You heard me. Come on, you know I'm good for it. No more credit, Freddy. But I tell you, I can make a mint. Don't con me, buddy boy. All right, 50 bucks. On the nose, I don't want to be greedy or nothing. She's coming in at 17 to 1. You know how much money that is? I told you, I ain't taking your bets. Now get off the phone, I got a business to run. But come on, I swear. Come on. Come on. Why, that dirty, lousy two bit. Tell Carlton. Yeah, by the week. Payment in advance. In cash. Same to you, pal. Mr. Renard. Yeah. About your bill? I'll settle up tomorrow. That's what you said yesterday. Hey, I got a big payoff coming in. Deal I'm putting together. Just got a little cash flow problem. Strictly temporary. Mr. Renard. Give me till tomorrow afternoon. If I don't have payment in full... Don't worry about it, okay? Five o'clock, the whole thing in cash. Till five o'clock tomorrow, then. At the latest. You got it. Come on, come on. What's with this elevator? About time. Fourth floor, you broken down old piece of... Hey! What? My tie! How did it get caught? In the door! Can we reach the button? Stop this thing! Stop! Get this off of my neck. Something quick. Something to cut it with. <laughs> Man, I don't believe this. I could have choked to death if I didn't have these. Mrs. Ruggiato. Oh, hi there, Mr. Pettit. You see that boy of mine? No, I haven't. I'll tan his hide when he gets home, staying out all hours. I wouldn't worry. He's probably out playing. Friends are important, you know, at his age. At any age, in fact. He's supposed to be doing his homework. His dad's gonna have a fit. I'll keep an eye out. Billy! You come in here right now, you hear me? Gotcha. Billy. You startled me. 
Did I? Hey, Mr. Pettit, um, you got any new toys tonight? Something wrong with your ray gun? No, it's neat. Only, well, I think I need a two-way wrist radio, too. Just in case. In case of what? Well, like, if there was a bad man, you know, I could call the cops. I don't see any bad men around here, do you, Billy? No, but what if there was? Tell you what. If you see any bad men, then you go inside and tell your dad or your mother. They'll protect you, believe me. They're what you need most, not some two-way wrist radio. Are you sure? Absolutely and positively. Okay. Bye, Mr. Pettit. I gotta go home. See ya. See ya, Billy. Sleep tight. Now, where's that light switch? You! Is this what I need? A spool of thread? Who let you in? You gotta get a new lock on your door. I could open this one with a toothpick. How did you know where I live? No problem. I'm real good at figuring things out. You told me you had a room in a hotel. All I had to do was ask around. I'd appreciate it if you'd leave now. You missed this. Here, Pop. Nice button. Is this what I need? Please, just go. Sure thing. Only you and I are going to have a little talk first. It's late. I'm an old man. Nice pair of scissors you gave me. I'm glad you like it. Now, if you don't mind... Save my skin. You should have been there. Why? I was on an elevator seat, and my necktie got caught in the door. Ain't that the craziest thing? Couldn't reach the controls, so I had to use the scissors to cut it off before it choked me. How did you know? I don't know anything. I think you do. I asked you a question. How? What difference does it make? It might make a lot of difference. What have you got? A fortune-telling machine in here? Some crystal ball? No, nothing like that. But you can look ahead, can't you? See the future. Sometimes. Then you're an A-number one dummy. You got a million-dollar talent, and you dribble it away for nickels and dimes. You're a loser. Shh, please lower your voice. Now, you listen to me, old man. Your losing days are over. From now on, you got yourself a partner. I don't need a partner. I don't need anything. I'm content, Mr. Renner. I may have a certain gift, but I use it sparingly. Yeah, on bus tickets and cleaning fluid. You got cheap taste. But your new partner, he's not satisfied so easy. And what would satisfy him? Are you kidding? What satisfies him comes from expensive shops. It drives long and low on four wheels, and it fits nice and soft around the shoulders and drapes easy and looks uptown. Luxury, Pop. Luxury. Go ahead. Concentrate. What's in store for tomorrow? Let's go, old man. What do I need? Very well. Here. What's this? A pen. A lousy, old-time fountain pen? I've been sitting here reading the paper. Trying to pick a winner. And what do you give me? A leaky fountain pen that drips all over the... All over the... Sports page. Sorry about the accident. Hold on. Accident, huh? Is that what it was? An accident that a drop of ink falls right on a... a horse's name? If you say so, Mr. Rennett. Take a look. Yeah! <laughs> this is wild. This is really wild. Sorcerer's Apprentice. That's the horse. Sorcerer's Apprentice runs in the sweepstakes tomorrow. Does it? Hey, Pops. Hey. You're all right. A leaky fountain pen. That's just what I needed. See you later. Yes, I suppose I will. In fact, I'm almost certain of it. Front desk. Nah, we don't have room service. They got eyes at the liquor store. Get it yourself. Likewise, buddy. Well, well, Mr. Renard. Hiya, Tony. Been waiting for me? Uh, I hope you got that back rent, because if you don't... I said five o'clock, didn't I? I need the whole thing, plus this week in advance. Otherwise... Here you go. 
20, 40, 60. Hey, your ship came in, huh? I told you. I'm a man of my word. Sure thing, Mr. Renard. Anything I can do for you, let me know. You got the evening paper yet? Right here. Just came in. Let me see the sports section. Tomorrow's races. Here we go. I uh, was wondering... Uh, yeah? How about a tip? A tip? I mean, for the paper and all. You want something from the liquor store? I can get it for you. You want a tip? Here's one. Yeah? Don't play with matches. Why don't you take the elevator, Mr. Renard? Still works last time I looked. No, thanks. Two ten, two fifteen. Still got two hundred and twenty bucks left. It's gonna be a million. I'll parlay it all seven races. Not just horses either. Prize fights, football, baseball, basketball, anything. Come on, come on. Talk to me. Come on. I got some bets to put down, starting with... I told you, Freddy, no more credit. Listen to this. Put your ear close to the phone. Get off the line. Hear that? Cash on the barrel head. Uh, what you do, rob your grandmother? Me? I took a little ride out to the track. Hit a long shot, 23 to 1. Now listen, I got some business to conduct. Big business. Better write this down. Starting with the first race tomorrow. Hold on. What are you consulting your Ouija board? Are you kidding? All I have to do is take out my lucky fountain pen like this. Your what? Or should I say, my leaky fountain pen? <laughs> Let's see what it drips on this time. I'm hanging up. Hold on, I tell you. This will just take a minute. You gotta put the dough in my hand or it's no bad. So I'll stop by. Sure you will. Just let me give this a little shake. Hey, what gives? This thing's all dried out. What kind of a con is this? Try a magic eight ball, Freddy. It works better. Must have had one drop of ink left. Now it's empty. Why, that old crumb? That crook? One shot and that's it? No way. This thing is worth millions. It will be. I'll beat it out of him. I'll take it out of his hide. Buttons, needle and thread, shoehorns, anything you need. There you are, you old coot. Mr. Renard. That's right. Whatever your name is. Pettit. That's me. Well, Mr. Pettit, you sure came up short this time. Oh, how's that? The pen you gave me. Yes, I remember. It don't work anymore. Is that right? No ink comes out. What a shame. So I can't pick any more winners. You've already won a great deal, Mr. Rennett, for a man in your circumstance. How do you know? You must have. And the things we need, we only need once. What's that supposed to mean? Just for a single occasion, that's all. An egg, the hand of a clock, the book of matches, a rubber band, a harmonica, a piano key, whatever it may be. But just once, that's all they're ever needed. Long enough to present an opportunity. What's next, then? Next? Come on, come on. You know what I'm talking about. Nothing's next. I'd rather not give you anything more. That's so? I'm afraid it is. I want to tell you something about me, old man. I was born under a lousy zodiac. I've had nothing but the bad end of the stick since I was four years old. I feel sorry for you. I really do. You don't have to go to that kind of trouble. Just keep it coming. Keep supplying me with what I need. I don't care if it's scissors to save my neck or a fountain pen that gives me the inside word. Whatever it is, I don't want it to stop. That's a pity, because it must stop. What are you doing? Closing up for the night. But why? Why does it have to stop? Because the things you need most, I can't supply. Like what? Serenity, peace of mind, humor. The ability to laugh at oneself. Those are all the things you need. And unfortunately, it's beyond my power to give them to you. Try one more time. Take a look in my eyes. Come on, old man, look deep. Look deep and tell me what I need tomorrow. You can see ahead, I already know that. Now, what do you see? Please. Go on, I said look. Please, you don't have to. What's in the cardboard box there? Go ahead. Open it. 
Those pair of shoes, all shined up too. Take them. Is this what you've got for me? Yes, they're for you. Nice. They're tight though. Sorry. Too tight. And they're leather soled. I hate new leather soles. They're slippery. But they're what I need, aren't they? I put them on and I walk someplace, is that it? I walk someplace where I'll get what I need. Perhaps. Hey, old man, so what's with it? What happens? I'm waiting. That's another thing you need, Mr. Runnett. Patience. Yeah? Well, I'm tired of being patient. I sincerely suggest that... You giving me the business, old man? That's what you're doing? You giving me the business? I'll come right back across the street and take you apart bone by bone. Listen. Let's hear it. Where are these shoes supposed to take me? Are they what I need? I never said they were, Mr. Rennett. But I'll tell you a little secret. They happen to be what I need. Who are you? Hey, watch where you're driving. Can't you see? Look out! No! No! Ah! Did you see that? Knocked it right out of his shoes. Somebody call an ambulance. Too late for that. I got the license plate. Mr. Rennert, I looked in your eyes just as you asked. And what I saw was death. My death. You would have killed me. So what was needed, Mr. Render, was one pair of slippery shoes. I'm sorry to say, that's all that was needed. Slippery shoes. Look at that old man. Is he all right? You okay? Oh, yes, I'm fine. Just fine. What happened? Hit and run, I guess. I heard the guy scream, and then the car just kept going. You see it, old-timer? Yes, most unfortunate. A hit and run. Can you beat that? Poor devil. Need anything tonight, sir? Shoelaces, perhaps? Matches? Anything at all? Are you kidding, fella? What would I need at this time of the night? I'll tell you what you need. You need this. A comb? It's yours, sir. No charge. Don't be rude, Harold. Well, thanks, I guess. Put it away. You never know. What's his story? He's a peddler. I've seen him around. He's a loony is what he is. Middle of the night and he gives out combs. Says it's what I need. Okay, folks, stand back. Better call for an ambulance. Looks like it's a little late for that. Evening, officers. What have we got here? Who are you? It's Rollins, Times Herald. Uh, you mind if I get some pictures? Go ahead. Just don't touch anything. All right, folks, back up on the curb. Come on. Anybody see what happened? I did. I saw the whole thing. It was a hit and run. All right, get their statements. Right. You were both witnesses? Sure were. We'll need your names. And a picture, if you don't mind. Sure. For goodness sake, Harold, try to look presentable. Our picture's going to be in the paper. Yeah, I guess I'd better comb my hair. Well, use the one that man gave you. Hey, where'd he go, anyway? Hold still for a minute. Say cheese. Street scene, night, a traffic accident, and a victim named Fred Renard. A gentleman with a sour face and a disposition to match, to whom contentment came at long last, after no small measure of struggle. Mr. Renard, who was finally provided with all he needed on a lonely street corner in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at TwilightZoneRadio.com.
What You Need, starring Bruno Kirby and Bruce Kirby with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling from a short story by Lewis Paget. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, Jeff Lupiton, Frenette Lebo, Kurt Navig, Linda Ryder, Max Kirsch, David Darlow, Carl Amari, Meg Falcon, Doug James, Roger Walski, and Vince Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hello, Mr. Morgan. Ferdy. Nice to see you, sir. Where's Daggett? Uh, Mr. Daggett? Mm -hmm. uh, the table in the corner. Uh, he got here a few minutes ago. Good. I'd like to see a dinner menu. Uh, I don't have much of an appetite. A drink, then. The usual. Yeah, make it the good stuff. Of course. Harold? One tequila with lime, table three. Coming right up. He's here, boss. Well, well. How you doing, Dane? You wanted to see me? Yeah, sure. You know Ben and Jimmy. Dane. Hi, you boys. And Iris and Sherry. Hi. Hello. Pull up a chair. No, thanks. Go ahead. Take a load off. I thought you wanted to talk. I do, I do. Mr. Daggett wants you should sit down. I'll stand. Now listen. That's all right, Ben. If he doesn't feel sociable... I don't have all night. Well, we can't talk here. How's your drink, sweetheart? What? Oh, fine, Bernie. Order another one. Make it champagne all around. Ooh, champagne. Are we celebrating? That's right. A regular celebration. What's the occasion? The six-month anniversary of a wonderful partnership. Come on, Dane. We'll go to my office. You too, Jimmy. Ben. Stay here and keep the ladies company, like I told you. Okay, boss. After you. Age before beauty. That's a good one. Come on in, Dane. What's a bodyguard for? We don't have any secrets in here, do we, Jimmy? Not on your life. Sit down. Have a cigar. I'll take a napkin. What for? My shoe. <laughs> you and your shoes. Always got a brand new pair. What's the matter? You see a piece of lint on them? Jimmy, give him your handkerchief. Huh? Do it. Okay, boss. There. There. That's better. So, what's on your mind, Bernie? No, oh, I thought we should have a little sit down. Something wrong? What? No, no. Business is jumping. A real healthy cash flow. Most of it from my joints. Yeah, well, see, that's just it. I'm feeling generous, so I thought I'd make you an offer. Forget it. Wait a while. I'm talking cash. I'd buy you out. 
You walk away with enough dough to live the high life. I already live the high life. Yeah, yeah, sure you do. But think about it. You could set up a new business, anything you want. I have a business. Now listen, Dane. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Thanks for the warning. You want my answer? It's a big fat no. Don't waste my time, Bernie. Yeah, I'm out of here. Not on your life. That's a laugh. A two-bit mug with a heater in his pocket. Sit down, Dane. Tell him to keep his hands where I can see him or I'll ventilate that cheap suit, but fast. Cheap? It's a Versace. We're not through here. Read my lips. N-O. Dane, Dane, Dane. I thought we had a good thing going. See this 38, Jimmy? Out of my way. Put the piece away, Dane. You hurt my feelings. You heard the boss. Stay out of your pocket. You too, Bernie. Hands on that desk. Anything you say, Dane. I'm backing out the other door. I see this mug stick his head in the alley. I'll blow it off. Clear? You're getting yourself in an uproar. You need more than a clown in a cheap suit to put the squeeze on me. Maybe so. Now, Ben! You should have looked behind him. Good shooting, Ben. Just like you told me, Mr. Daggett. Now, get this punk out of my office. What do you want we should do with him? Dump him with the rest of the garbage. Jimmy, clean up the blood. He's leaking all over my Persian rug. Right, boss. You got it, Mr. Daggett. Meet Bernie Daggett, a successful West Side businessman. He's just concluded a merger with a partner who has certain investments and a preference for two-tone footwear. Make that had, because the owner of those shoes is now officially out of business. Said business will continue, of course, under different ownership. But what of the gray and black wingtips? They're brand new, with a shine so bright you could use them for mirrors. It would be a shame to let them go to waste. But never fear, a certain Nathan Edward Bledsoe of the Bowery Bledsoes is about to recycle them. At the moment, a few long blocks from here, Nathan just happens to be looking for a new pair of treads because the ones he's wearing are falling apart. He doesn't know it yet, but his search for a warm place to sleep and a bottle of forgetfulness is about to end. Dane's shoes will carry him out of his misery and straight into the twilight zone. And now, The Twilight Zone, and our story, Dead Man's Shoes, starring Bill Smitrovich, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Mmm. Oh. Uh, give me a swig, will you, oh. Nate? Sorry, Chips. All gone. Well, let's go get another one. Oh, uh, you go. I'm gonna turn in for the night. But it's early. Besides, I don't... I don't got no more money. Go pay and handle some. Move your head. What for? So as I can toss this bottle in the trash. Two to one says you can't make it. You gotta have money to gamble, remember? Oh. <laughs> you missed. Uh, I guess we better clean it up. <laughs> clean it up. That's a good one. <laughs> now nah, you've done it. Somebody called the cops. Wait. That ain't a cop car. Okay, Jimmy. The coast is clear. Dump them. Where? Under the fire escape by the trash. What's he got in the bag? Quiet, quiet. Keep your head down. Okay, Ben. I'm done. Let's go. Let's go. Mr. Daggett said to come right back. So long, Dane. Good riddance to bad rubbish. Will you look at that? They drove all the way down here just to dump their garbage. That ain't garbage, you moron. Then what? What do you think? You mean? Go, go check it out. Maybe maybe he's got a ring on his finger or something. Oh, no. I ain't messed with no... 
dead body. You chicken? Yeah, I'm chicken. What's that sticking out? I don't see nothing. Wait here. What is it? Can you beat that? Just what I needed. What? Guy's got a pair of shoes on. Brand new. I wouldn't touch them if I was you. My size, too. Careful, Nate. You're fooling with evidence. Look at that. Perfect. Wonder if there's anything in the pockets. Nate, we gotta get out of here, I tell you, before they hang it on us. No wallet. Oh, nothing. Except for this key. Hmm. Number 621. Mayfair Apartments. Hey. I know where that is. Pretty swanky. Hey, where you going? To check out my new digs. Hmm. Mayfair Apartments. <laughs> Dorman, would you get me a cab? Certainly, ma'am. Taxi! Next in line over here. Where's she going? West 84th. Ma'am, here you go. Thank you. Now this is for your trouble. Thank you, ma'am. Watch your fingers. Hey, fella, where you going? This building is for residents only. Yeah. Sure, pal. So sue me. Mm -hmm. Apartment number 621. Nice place. Dane, I'm so glad you're here. I was just painting my toenails. Where were you? Who are you? That's rich. Who am I, she says. What do you want? Not you, that's for sure. You better get out of here, Buster. I'm not kidding. Now where's the liquor? Right over there. That's Dane's tequila. If he comes back and finds out you touched his stuff, he'll kill you. Sure he will. Do you hear what I said? He'll... he'll kill you. For real. Uh, thanks for telling me, Wilma. Who told you my name? You know what I'm gonna do now? I'm going in the bedroom to get some clean clothes after I take a nice hot shower. And you know what you're gonna do? What? You're gonna fix me another drink. I am. And use the good stuff. The gold reserve. But that's... That's what? N nothing Oh, and Wilma? Yes? Don't even think about leaving. You'd never make it downstairs. Uh... Hmm. Shirt, socks... And a suit. Think I'll try the pinstripe. me, Wilma. Wilma? No, I can't talk any louder. Listen, is Dane there? Well, where is he? What do you mean you don't know? All right, do me a favor. Call me as soon as you do. Thanks, Bernie.
Where is he? Who? Dane. Dane? Uh, I don't know who that is. Oh, yes, you do. I don't. Honest. Then what are you doing here? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. You walked in here with his shoes on. Nobody else wears shoes like Dane's. I don't remember. Well, maybe this will refresh your memory. Hey, who are you pointing a gun at me for? I don't know what you're talking about, lady. I, I, I found the shoes. At least I think I did. You mean you oh. stole them? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I stole them, okay? Where? Please, miss, I don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about nothing. What do you know? N nothing. You gotta believe me. I, I ought to shoot you right now. Busting in here like you own the place. Please. I don't want any trouble. All right, but you get dressed and get out of here. Move. Okay, okay, I'm going, I'm going. Hurry up. I just gotta put my shoes on. Those aren't your shoes. Yeah? Is that right? And what about the gun? I suppose that's not mine either. What? Keep away from me. Give me that thing. Ow! You shouldn't play with guns, Wilma. You might get hurt. Hand me the towel. What? The bath towel. I see some dust on my shoe. <laughs> Just get out, please. I won't say anything. Where's the other one? I don't know what you mean. The automatic. What do you think I mean? In the closet, the shoulder holster. Full clip. Good. What are you standing there for? I thought I told you to make me a drink. Look, mister, I don't know what you want here. A drink, I said. Okay, okay. What kind? What do I have to do, break your arm? The only thing I ever drink. Tequila with lime. Dane's due back any second. I'm warning you, for your own sake, if you know what's good for you... I know what's good for me. Please, don't touch me. Please, don't! Oh. Who am I, baby? Oh, it's not possible. No? Let's try that again. Dane? But you're not him. You're not. Be quiet. What have you done with him? What happened? What? Oh. Wait. Wait, you gotta tell me. Please. Tell you what? I have to know. Later. Where are you going? I got a little unfinished business to take care of. Where's Bernie? Bernie? Bernie Daggett. At the club. That's what I thought. You wait here. I'll be back after it's over. And don't answer the door. For your own good. Sir? Yeah? Uh, did you get the message from Mr... Oh, uh, I'm sorry. What's the matter? That problem? Uh, nothing, sir. I thought you were someone else. Oh, is that so? Like who? Another one of our residents. Well, let me guess. The guy in 621? That's right. Uh, you must know Mr. Morgan. Yeah, you might say that. Uh, just visiting. What's it to you? Oh, well, nothing at all. It's just... Just what? Uh, that suit and those shoes. Mr. Morgan has a pair exactly like them. No kidding. Must be quite popular these days. Very smart. I like them. You got a handkerchief? Why, yes, I'm sure I do. Uh, here you are. Clean one, is it? Oh, yes, sir. Good. Got a scuff on the toe. You do? It doesn't show from here? Shoe shine stands closed, huh? Uh, yes, sir. At this time of night. Yeah, here you go. Here's a tip. Oh, that's not necessary, really. It's the concierge's job, too. Listen, get a shoe shine boy who works around the clock. Some people care about how they look. Right, uh, I'll do that.
Hey there, Mr. Morgan. Get a cab for you? No, thanks, Tommy. Oh, begging your pardon, you're not Mr. Morgan. Were well, you sure about that? Get you a cab if you like, sir. That's okay, Tommy. I feel like walking. Clean shirt, new shoes, and I know just where I'm going to. Sure looks like you do. Yep. Clothes make the man. <laughs> That's what they say. Hello, Mrs. Tomlin. Oh, watch your step. Why, thank you, Tom. Yes, sir. May I help you? I'd like a table. Do you have a reservation? How about that one over there? In the corner. Next to Daggett. I'm afraid that table is reserved. It is, huh? If you would care to wait at the bar, perhaps something will open up. Well, here you go, Ferdy. This should take care of it. That table open now? <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, I should have known a man like you would have a reservation. Yeah, must have slipped your mind, huh? Uh, right this way. Let me pull the chair out for you. And what may I bring you, sir? The usual. The usual? Tequila. Really? Any particular brand? The good bottle, under the bar, with a slice of lime. Certainly, sir. Right away. Ferdy. Yes, Mr. Deckett. Bring us another bottle of champagne. Of course. Who's that, anyway? You mean the gentleman with the shoes? I'm afraid I don't know, Mr. Daggett. Never saw him in here before. Nor have I. I'll get you your champagne. Friend of yours? No friend of mine. Hey, Jimmy. Yeah, boss? That fellow over there. You seen him? Negative. What about you, Benny boy? Never set eyes on him. Well, he seems to know us. What's he smiling for? He ain't looking at me, honest. <sighs> of all the nerve. Just some lush. Forget it. Yeah, but a familiar lush. Something about him. Maybe he's looking at me. <gasps> Iris! It could be. Or ain't I worth staring at anymore? Oh, nobody said that. Said what? Oh, nothing. I just said I was leaving you. Yeah, sure. Jimmy, why don't you go over there and... See? You never listen to me. I'm all ears. I said I was leaving you, Bernie. Sure you are. I mean it. We're Splitsville. There's only one way people leave me, honey. Feet first. Drink up, everybody. Let's finish this bottle. Sorry to tell you, boss, but that guy's still looking at us. Like he's got a secret or something. Oh, he's driving me crazy. All right, that's it. Can't even have a drink in peace. Ben. Yeah? Invite him over. What if he don't want to come? Then get rid of him. No problem. Hey, you talking to me? Mr. Daggett wants you. Oh, isn't that nice? Makes me feel all warm inside. He wants you should join him. Well, what do you know? An invitation from the great Bernie Daggett at his own personal table. Are you sure? He loves you should join him. Oh, I don't know what to say. Don't say nothing. Just do it. Well, if you put it that way, I accept. Here he is, boss. Well, well. Allow me to introduce myself. Hello, Bernie. You know me? Well, everyone does. By reputation. Oh, I get it. Sit down. Thanks. Get the man a chair. You, uh, celebrating something? You might say so. Big business deal? Who told you that? Friend of mine. They're right. What are you drinking? Tequila. With lime. What did you say? Something wrong with that? No, no. It's just kind of funny. Is it? A coincidence is all. I had a friend drank the same stuff. Well, no kidding. What happened to him? What do you mean? Well, you said had. Say, what's your name? Kilroy. Look, buddy, when Mr. Daggett asked you a question... Easy, Jimmy. I'm sure he didn't mean no disrespect. What line are you in? Restaurants. Just like Dane. Isn't that something? But tonight, I'm a messenger boy. And I've got a message for you, Mr. Daggett. Well, go ahead. 
Let's have it. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, no can do. What do you mean? I have instructions to deliver the message personally. In private. It's uh, kind of a touchy matter. You understand? And who's this message from? Afraid I can't say. Here you are, sir. Another bottle of champagne on ice and one shot of tequila with a slice of lime. On me. Here you go, Polly. Yeah. Thanks. Think nothing of it. Anything else here? I'll let you know. Yes, sir. Nice drink. Glad you like it. Nice place. Real nice. You own it? This guy. What did he look like? Which guy? The one that gave you the message. Well, sometimes, Mr. Daggett, it's my business to forget things. Not remember them. Okay, messenger boy. Let's go. Ben, wait here with the girls. Keep an eye on things. You know what I mean. Don't worry, boss. I got you covered. It has to be private. It will be. My office? So it's me. Hey, I didn't say where it was yet. You didn't you? Down the hall. The door at the end. Right. Nice place you got here. Soundproof, too, so we can talk in private. Good idea. Come on in. Make yourself comfortable. Oh, age before beauty. <laughs> That's a good one. Jimmy, put your arms out. What for? Just till we get acquainted. Go on, Jimmy. Frisk him. Well, well, what do we got here? Well, it looks like a 38 to me. What's the matter? The monkey can't see? You got nerve bringing a piece in here? That's okay. I know how it is. A man needs protection nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, you don't know what kind of trash you'll run into. Hold it for him, Jimmy. Hey, careful with that. I'm always careful. Just till we're finished. Tell your monkey I want it back with all the bullets. Hear that, Jimmy? Absolutely. Have a seat. Cigar? No, I don't smoke. Good idea. Could be dangerous to your health. So could a lot of things. Yeah, looks like you got a good thing going here. I get by. Win some, lose some. I bet you don't lose very often. I try to keep my hand in the game. And what game is that? Oh, you know. Little of this, little of that. I got a string of restaurants now. That right. Strictly legit. Must be doing pretty good. Nice digs, mirror on the wall, big desk. They call it Danish modern. Hey, real oil paintings. Cost me plenty, let me tell you. See that picture there? Thomas Kincaid original. No kidding. Of course, I got a special discount. Yeah, you paid too much. What? I have three, just like it. Picked them up at a fire sale. Guy turns them out like a factory. Doesn't even sign his name. Got a room full of brunettes to do it for him. Jimmy, make a note. Yeah, boss. See if there's a money back guarantee on this crap. Now then. What were we saying? The message? Oh, yeah. You're monkey deaf, too? Say hot shot. Don't worry about it. When does he go back in his cage? I got no secrets from my boys. Yeah, you sure? Sure, I'm sure. And hey, one thing first. What's that? Give me a handkerchief. You got one in your breast pocket. Yeah, I know, but I don't want to get it dirty. Hear that, Jimmy? Yeah, yeah. Here you go, hot shot. There's a piece of dirt on my shoe. Maybe you should watch where you step. Right. All kinds of dirt around here. Where'd you get those shoes? I borrowed them. From who? A friend of mine. What's your friend's name? I think you've met. What's your real name, mister? My name? That's from my friends. Are we friends yet? I don't know. Are we? Yeah, I'd buy you a drink, invite you to my office. And all because you got a message to deliver. If that ain't friendly, I don't know what is. Bernie, Bernie, Bernie. Mr. Daggett to you. How'd you get it cleaned so fast? What? The rug on the floor? 
What about it? Well, blood's hard to get out, isn't it? Say, what are you inferring? You have to send it to the cleaners. Unless you got your own cleaners. Nickel and dime mugs who wipe up people's messes for them. I don't know what you're talking about. Don't you? But I know one thing. You got a bad attitude. The kind that can get you in trouble. Absolutely. You think so? Then here's what I'm gonna do, Bernie. I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'm talking about another guy who had a nice thing going for him. Yeah, plenty of dough, plenty of action, restaurant uptown, only he wasn't happy. And you know why? Let me guess. People were sticking their nose in his business. Close, but no cigar. He had a partner. That meant he couldn't be number one, see? And being number one was very important to him. So he offered to buy the partner out, and when the partner refused to sell, this guy, he brought him in his office. And he killed him. Blew him away. Just like that. Or rather, he had his monkeys do it so he wouldn't get his hands dirty. It happened right here, and nobody was the wiser. Oh, it was one slick job. You're out of your mind. Only, not slick enough. You didn't get it all up. Take a look. There's still some little bits of blood on the rug around the edge, see? Geez, I hope you didn't wash it in hot water, Bernie. That makes the stain set, so it'll never come out. There'll always be traces. You know, the cops come in, put the stuff on it, the luminol, then they shine a purple light, and whatever was there, bing, there it is. Who? Who are you? I told you, a messenger. And here's the message. Look out, boss. He's got another piece. I thought you said he was clean. He didn't check behind my back. Anybody but a monkey knows to do that. Now take the gun out of your pocket and set it on the desk. Real slow. Better do what the man says, Jimmy. Okay. Okay. Now take the other one. The 38 you took off me and put it down on the floor. And kick it over to me. Nice and easy. Can't we talk this out? And don't go for your own gun, Bernie. Keep your hands where I can see them. That looks like you got the drop on me. You heard the man, Jimmy. Nice and easy. I'm doing it, see? But you're not doing it right, you big monkey. You put it down so the barrel's pointed me. You're gonna go for it, aren't you, Jimmy? You just can't help yourself. So I better do something before you make a play. Uh, are you nuts? You shot Jimmy in cold blood. That's right. And now it's your turn. You won't get away with this. Not unless I take care of Ben, too. What are you talking about? There's nobody else here. He's outside in the alley. Come on, drawing a bead on the door right now. As soon as he opens it, I'm history. Unless I shoot first. What are you doing shooting holes in my door? Didn't think it would work for a second time, did you, Bernie? Ben waiting in the alley. Before I can back out, huh? You're crazy. Open it. Take a look. Bet I drilled him right through the stomach. At least I hope so. Takes longer to die that way. There's nobody out there, I tell you. Oh, and by the way, where's the other 38, Bernie? The one you took off me the first time. In the desk? Huh? I'd like to have it back. Dang. You are him. But it ain't possible. Say goodbye, partner. Vaya con Dios. Now, Ben! Oh. You remember the door to the alley, smart guy. Only I never do the same thing twice. You didn't think about the mirror. A two-way mirror to the next room. Too bad, Bernie. That means seven years bad luck. Got him. Nice and clean. Good shooting, Ben. You cut that pretty close. I wanted to take him out with one shot, the way you got Jimmy. Bernie, listen to me. And listen good. You want I should finish him? Wait. I'll come back, Bernie. And I'll keep coming back. Again and again. And, and sooner or later, I'll kill you. So help me. I'll, I'll kill you.
Get him out of my face. Right. Drop this scumbag in the garbage any place you want. Just don't let me see those shoes again. Not as long as I live. With pleasure. Get some of the boys over here. We should bury Jimmy nice and proper. You got it. And remind me to send some money to his old lady. Who was this piece of junk anyway? I'll tell you something, Benny. I don't know. I really and truly don't know. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Spare change, bus fare, something to eat. Hold on. What in the... Nice pair of shoes. Ah, uh, Nate, that you? Oh, no, no. Poor Nathan. I'm sorry. You forgive me, don't you, Nate? But I guess you won't have any use for him now. Rest in peace, buddy. Yeah, what do you know? Perfect fit. Spare change, sir? Ma'am? Anything at all? Hot meal? That's all I need. <laughs> yeah, and a hot bath and a change of clothes. That's all. Cause I got places to go and things to do. <laughs> There's an old saying that goes, clothes make the man. And another one that says, if the shoe fits, wear it. Keep both phrases in mind, should you ever find yourself on a lonely street at night. Because nothing comes without a price. And if you happen upon a pair of expensive black and gray loafers, size 9, be very careful, because they just might have a mind of their own. Try them on, and chances are you'll find yourself on a long-distance trek into the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to twilightzoneradio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at twilightzoneradio.com. Dead Man's Shoes, starring Bill Smitrovich with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for the Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont and O.C. Rich. Heard in the cast were Meg Falcon, Christian Stolte, Rick Arthur, Alex Sopener, Frenette Lebo, Amber Lake, Doug James, Dale Rivera, Roger Mueller, Rich Kamenek, Eddie Martinez, Tony Castillo, and Carl Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, Exum Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking.
You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Okay, you know the drill. You talking to me, Copper? Well, I don't see anyone else here. Spread them so I can read you your rights. Set it and forget it. Just three easy payments. Coffee beans that are aged. Will you stop it? Turn that thing off. We'll have to operate on his brain at once. Scalpel. Watch it, nurse. It's the bottom of the eighth inning, and so far it's been a very tight game. Drop it! Drop it or I'll shoot! Take it easy, Phyllis. The repairman's coming. You did call him, didn't you? Of course I did. Now turn it down. I'm trying to cook dinner in here. I gotta keep it warmed up, don't I? Bring me another beer. Get it yourself and wash your hands. It's almost ready. Yeah, yeah. Acme TV repair. Come on in. So, what seems to be the problem? Did you hear me, Joe? Dinner is served. In a minute. Channel change is messed up. You don't say. Keep flipping all over the place, one thing after another. Well, let me take a look. Yeah, you do that. Shall I repair it here, or perhaps take it to the shop? Are you kidding? Tonight's a big match from the garden. World Hardcore Tag Championship. You know, Mr. Britt, it may take some time. Let's fix it, will you? I gotta watch my programs. Okay, Joe, have it your way. If it's cold, it's not my fault. I'm coming. Go ahead, pal. I'll check back with you. Most certainly. Mind if I turn the sound up? A uh, man's got to do what a man's got to do. Just keep it down to a roar, huh? The wife. You know how it is. Yes, I do. Your wife. Your wife, that's all I hear. Easy. I said I'm taking care of it. Huh? Why don't you just tell her about us? Don't worry, I'll tell her everything. When the time's right. If you were any kind of a man, you'd do something now. You'd get rid of her. Wait a minute. What kind of program is that? Oh, that's Channel 10. But I don't get Channel 10. There's no such thing. Portrait of a TV fan. Name, Joe Britt. Occupation, cab driver. Married to one Phyllis Britt, long-suffering companion in a lower middle-class apartment. His one consolation is the time he spends in front of his television set, watching various sports, crime, courtroom, and medical shows, his nightly escape into a world of fantasy and high drama. But tonight, Mr. Britt is going to watch something not listed in his local newspaper, a special broadcast designed for the cabbie who's seen everything. Joe Britt doesn't know it yet, but his flag is down, his meter's running, and he's already in high gear, on his way to a call that will lead him off the pages of the map book and into the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, What's in the Box? Starring Mike Starr with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Great dinner. Glad you liked it. Scrumptious. Wasn't it? Absolutely mouth-watering. I thought so, too. Tastes like... Like... Yeah, go ahead and say it. Like what, Joe? I got it. Fiberglass. Well, keep on being late. What do you expect? Not much from you. Yeah, the feeling's mutual. I'm telling you, I'm getting sick of it. Where'd you get this slop? The Lucky Dog Pet Store? You're getting sick of it. How do you think I feel? I don't get a man coming home to me at night. I get something left in the cab that's all used up. Nice, Phyllis. Real nice. Tell the whole world. We got company, remember? Oh, yeah. The TV repair man? Better hope he gets finished pretty soon, Joe, so you can watch your programs instead of having a conversation with your wife. We're having a conversation right now. Sure we are. It ain't my fault I'm pulling long hours. Yeah? Whose fault is it? The man in the moon? I already told you. Guy hails me when I'm heading into the garage. Had to haul him all the way up to Yonkers. Oh, give it a rest, Joe. I heard that one before. The other day it was Yonkers. Yesterday it was LaGuardia. You don't fool me one bit. Just tell me. 
Who's the girl? What girl? The one you've got on the side. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, and you're a louse. You don't have nothing left by the time you get home. You gotta be giving it away someplace else. Yeah, I got so much extra energy. Where would I get it? Not from this food. You get what you pay for it, Joe. And you're slipping way behind in your payments. Give me a break. I'll give you a break in your head is what I'll give you. If you're cheating on me, Joe, I swear. Can it, Phyllis? The guy out there's getting a free show. Free? How much are you paying him? Ten bucks an hour? Twenty? And for what? So you can watch your stupid TV. I got a suggestion, Joe. Why don't you sleep on that couch tonight so you don't miss the late, late show? That's it. I'm going in the other room. Well, don't let me stop you. Take the whole six-pack. As soon as he gets done, you better hurry up. It's getting late. The main event's coming up. Goat Boy and Old Crow versus Dude Love and Rob Van Don. I know what's going on. You think I don't? You can't even look me in the eye anymore. You're so guilty. Phyllis, for the love of... Well, don't jump off any building on my account, Joe. One of these days, I'm going to even up the score. Make it a real tight ball game. What's that supposed to mean? Freddy Broom. You know that good-looking butcher? He's always given me the once-over. I can feel his eyeballs rolling over me like ball barons. You'd think I was the Queen of Sheba. What are you trying to do? Start a fight? Well, I got no fight left in me. Once that Joker gets fiddling with the TV, all I want to do is watch wrestling and flake out. I'm pooped. Yeah, I'll bet you are. You drove to Yonkers. For all I know, you even went twice. You shouldn't drive so much, Joe. You'll ruin your health. How's it coming, Mac? Oh, well, Mr. Britt, you've got yourself a little problem here. A little problem? You've been at it an hour now. I could have built a whole new set by now. Is that so? Sure thing. I didn't just step off the ferry from Jersey. I know how you guys operate. Do you? First you kill a 20 buck hour. Then you say you gotta take it down to the shop. Another 20. Then you start switching tubes and charging me for the privilege. I get some poor sucker's old parts, and he gets mine. Nobody's the wiser, right? If you say so. And what was that phony station you brought in? Channel 10, my aching back. I don't know what you're referring to. Yeah, huh? Probably put a videotape in just to confuse me. It's a racket, that's what it is. A penny ante Cosa Nostra. Well, the state of New York's got laws against that. So save yourself a headache. I ain't swinging for no big bills, period. In that case, the set's ready. What? You heard me. The set's ready. No charge for my services. Want a beer? On me. No, thanks. Have a pleasant evening. Same to you, pal. Same to you. Now, where's the remote? Hey, Phyllis! Come on in! We can get Channel 10! Your wife, that's all I hear. In a minute, Joe. Hold your horses, baby. What? That guy looks just like... Why don't you do something about her? I trusted you. I didn't hold anything back. I waited and waited. Wait a minute. You drove me all the way out to the park in your taxi, and now you won't even speak to me. I'm talking to you. What's the matter, Joe? How did they know? There wasn't no camera around. What do you want from me? Marry me. Marry you? What, are you crazy? If you don't, I'll tell her everything. Like what? I'm a bigamist? Look, baby, we're talking about two different things. Love is flowers and wine with dinner. Marriage is a floor mop and two pounds of hamburger. Serious, Joe. So, how's the picture? The picture? Look at you, you slob. You spilled your beer. It'll dry out. It's a good thing your mother gave us this rug. Oh, I hate it anyway. Even beer stains is an improvement. Take it easy. You say we can see Channel 10, so where is it? I turned it off. Well, turn it on again. Maybe later. Later, I've got the stove to clean. Turn it off, Phyllis. Quit clowning. Give me that thing. What are you, nuts or something? Never mind. You yell to come in and look at Channel 10, and then when I drop everything... What's the matter? Is the set still on the blink? Yeah, I mean, no. Well, there must be something screwy. You know there's no Channel 10 around here. Did you try the other channels? Let me see that remote again. Get your hands off that! Listen, Phyllis. Do you by any chance trying to pull a fast one? I don't know what you mean. That guy. Who was he? What guy? Don't oh, give me that. The guy, the guy, the repair guy. Oh, him? 
<laughs> How do I know? I never saw him before. No? You're the one who called him. I told you to call a repairman. I didn't say which one. You picked him out. Oh, you're suspicious. <laughs> well, Casanova, you can relax. When I even up the score, it'll be with that butcher, Freddie Broom. He's got the most expressive hands. Oh, I've watched him cut meat. You should see what he can do to tenderize it. He sends me right to Yonkers. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, that must be it. He did something to the TV. They can do all kinds of cockamamie things with electronics. You're acting like a lunatic. Okay, who was he? Before I crack you one in the mouth. Like I told you, I don't know. The regular repair guy, he's on vacation. So you were yelling to get the set fixed tonight so you can see every drop of blood on Goat Boy's forehead. Excuse me, I mean forehead. All right, knock it off. You don't have to read my horoscope. Where did you get this, Fink? Let go of me. From the phone book. Where else? What's wrong, Joe? He didn't fix it, right? No, he fixed it. He fixed it perfect. You should have seen this as uh, Channel 10. Nah, never mind. I'd like to. Turn it on. No, no, no. It's, it's nothing. Honest. I, go finish your cleaning up. I'm sorry I yelled at you. See, I guess the traffic got to me. Yeah, that's it. It's... Well, something sure did. You keep this up, Joe. You better see a psychiatrist. Take my word for it. <sighs> I guess I'll stick to wrestling. Something civilized. They're circling each other, looking for an opening. With a tag team gold on the line, this is going to be a real slobber knocker. <sighs> this is more like it. Now the collar and elbow hookup. Into a quick go behind. Whoa, Nelly! Dude loves going for this patented sleeper hold. Oh, but wait a minute. Go boy fouls him with a billy goat kick. Whoa, where's the referee? Oh, that one must have hurt. Now, oh, now you're not going to believe this, folks. He's trying to chew Dude Love's ear off. Come on, Rev. This is a Pier 6 brawl. Now all four men are outside the ring on that hard concrete floor. Break it up. Oh, somebody's got to stop these bohemoths before... Great dinner. Glad you liked it. Huh? Scrumptious. Wasn't it? Absolutely mouth-watering. I thought so, too. What is that? It's like, like... Yeah, go ahead and say it. Like what, Joe? I got it. Five a glass. No, well, you... Well, keep on being late. What do you expect? Not much from you. Yeah, the feeling's mutual. I'm telling you, I'm getting sick of it. Where'd you get this slop? The Lucky Dog Pet Store? You I don't believe this. How do you think I feel? I don't get a man coming home to me at night. I get something left in the cab that's all used up. Nice, Phyllis. Real nice. Tell the whole world. I don't believe it. If she sees this... Hey. Oh. Wait. I can't breathe. Ow! Ow! Joe, I'm all finished. Let's watch something together for once. Even your wrestling, for a while at least. Joe? Joe! Talk to me, Joe! Joe! Joe, wake up! Are you all right? What, what, what happened? I don't know. Here, get up on the couch. Uh, I must have fainted or something. Are you okay? Yeah, 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 sure. What happened? Maybe something I ate. Yeah, that's it. Tasted, uh, it tasted kind of funny. Well, why wouldn't it? I had to heat it up three times. Twice would have been enough. Now listen to me, Joe. Huh? It may be your heart. Oh, come on. I'm serious. All that overtime, it's not good for you. You ain't kidding. You'd better go to bed while I call the doctor. No, no, no. There, there's nothing wrong with me. Sure, Joe. You just keeled over for no reason. It's the television. What? There's something screwy with the TV. Are we on that again? Phyllis, I got something to ask you. I'm listening. Here, put your feet up. You want some hot chocolate? This is important. Are you sure you never saw that repair guy before? I'm going to call the doctor. Come here. Sit down. I told you I got something important to talk about. All right. What is it? Phyllis, what would you say if I told you that I saw myself? Oh, Joe, please. I'm serious. Wearing my regular clothes, just like I look right now. I'd say you looked in the mirror. I do that all the time, and I don't like what I see either, but it's nothing to faint about. 
Like Frank Sinatra said, that's life. Nobody's getting any younger. But what are we going to do about it? The moving finger writes and having written a... I said, listen, I'm talking here. Phyllis, I saw myself on TV. Really? Was it that candid camera? I hope you were smiling. You always had a real nice smile. No, it wasn't the candid camera. What would you say if I told you I saw you on TV, too? When? Just now. I'd say you're cracked, Joe. I haven't been out of the apartment all day. And somebody's spying on us. If you really think that, you must be losing your marbles. Why would anyone want to spy on us? It's not like we ever do anything anymore. Nothing to write home about. Enough! Okay, forget it. Either you really are a bird brain or you're in on it. Ain't there something you want to tell me, Phyllis? Look me in the eye. I'm giving you a chance to come clean. Joey, you know better than that. Never mind that Joey stuff. I'm on to you. You're trying to trap me. You set me up, didn't you? Joe, you're scaring me. Well, you'll have to get up mighty early in the morning to get the drop on Joe Britt. You must be sick. You're not yourself. Now, you listen to me. You go into the kitchen and you look up that repair guy in the phone book. Tell him to get back here on the double. Understand? Sure, Joe, sure. Take it easy. You'll get your blood pressure in an uproar. Because if he don't, I swear I'll go down to his shop, wherever it is, and drag him here. Who do you two think you're dealing with? I ain't nobody's sucker. Okay, okay, I'll call him. See, I'm going. In the meantime, why don't you go to bed? Calm down. Take a load off. Now, fellas! Hello? This is Mrs. Britt. Yes, I think you'd better get over here right away. Calm down, she says. Come here. What do you see now, huh, Joe? What do you see? I'm on to you. You're nuts. We'll see about that. Ha! Missed me. I'll kill you. What's that? Say it again, Joe, so the neighbors will hear. I have witnesses. I said I'll kill you. Oh, no, you don't. Not my mother's face. Damn right there. Put it down, Joe. It's an antique. Yeah? An antique, huh? What's it going to be worth in a minute? You lousy, no good. Come to Papa. Get away from me. I got you cornered. No place to go now. I don't like that look in your eye. Unless it's out that window. Joe, put it down. Not the vase. Don't you try to run or I'll smash it, I swear. No. Get away from the window. Let go of me. No! Phyllis! Phyllis, honey! Oh. Oh. Phyllis? Yeah? What's the matter now, Joe? Joe? What's the matter? Can't you hear? Can't you see? Look! Look at what? The TV! What about it? On the screen! There's nothing on the screen. See for yourself. But I saw it, I tell you. You and me right here in this room. What are you talking about? Channel 10 again? I told you, Joe. We don't get Channel 10. It's a trick. It's gotta be. Somebody's playing a trick on me. Why? 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 Dr. Saltman, how is he? I've given him a sedative. I'll also leave you a prescription for some tranquilizers. Is that all he needs? We'll just have to wait and see. Of course, it might be wise to seek more expert advice. I'm a family doctor. Psychiatry's not my specialty. However, his condition could turn out to be relatively simple. What condition is that, Doctor? I read an interesting study the other day. It might apply here. According to this study, it's possible for someone to suffer delusions, even actual hallucinations, because of what's called media overload, effects that are directly attributable to the electronic culture we live in. Why don't you give it to me in plain English? I can take it. Well, for example, television. You told me your husband's an addict. Perhaps he's been staring at this mixed blessing, so to speak, for such a long time that its reality has become his. You mean he's turning into a TV set? No, no, nothing like that. But he may have reached a stage of confusion where he no longer knows whether he's watching the action or participating in it. You're putting me on. 
He's living a kind of waking dream, in other words. Mind you, that sort of thing isn't limited to the mentally ill. It can come in flashes for anyone who's exposed to large enough doses. I have on occasion found myself actually calling for sutures or sponges while watching an operation on television. <gasps> Even a man like you. Never mind. Is that what's wrong with my Joey? He thinks he's one of those doctors on TV? <clears throat> In your husband's case, I gather he believes that he has, in some sense, already murdered you. What? Or rather, that he will. He no longer seems capable of differentiating between past, present, and future, between reality and fantasy. Yeah, like with his wrestling. Hmm. In any event, we don't want this situation to develop further. <gasps> I should say not. I'd like you to bring him to my office first thing in the morning. I'll order a thorough checkup, reflexes, blood work, and so forth. Sure, if you say so. Meanwhile, see that he gets some rest. I will. Thank you, doctor, from the bottom of my heart. Glad to be of help. I'll let myself out. Oh, Dr. Saltman. Yes. Is this your little black bag, or am I just imagining it? <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Thank you. Perhaps... He shouldn't watch any more television for a while. Oh, good idea. Think of it this way, Mrs. Britt. If you gaze into the abyss long enough, the abyss may begin to gaze into you. Isn't that the truth? Good night, and sleep well. Can you beat that? I wonder if I stare into the frigid air long enough, I'll turn into cold cuts. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something, though? Back to our movie in a minute. Vince Worthingless here. You say you want dependable transportation? You need a second car so the little woman can get out of town on the weekend? Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> well, tell you what I'm gonna do. We'll get back to the news in a minute. You see this little baby right here? I'm gonna give it to you for nothing down. That's right. Nothing. Zero. Not a penny. Walk in and drive it off with just your good name. The smile on your face and the number where your little wife can be reached while she's out of town. Come in your birthday suit. What do I care? How's that for a bargain? Oh, what's the use? That guy's on every channel. I might as well turn in. Phyllis? Hold your horses, Joe. Phyllis! I said keep your pants on. I'm just turning out the lights. Phyllis, where are you? Phyllis, where are you? Help! Hold on, Joe. I'm coming. I'm coming. What was that noise? I heard a crash. Demira. Uh, what did you do? Demira on the dresser. I looked in it. And I saw... Uh, I saw this room. And in this room, I saw you, Phyllis. You were arguing with someone. And I didn't want to see that. So I threw the water glass and broke it. I'll clean it up. Now lie back down. The doctor wants you to sleep. I can't sleep. You wouldn't be able to either if you'd seen what I saw. So, okay, stay awake. Only let's make a deal. What you saw, I don't want to hear about it. He told you? Yes, and what you saw on the TV before. But he said not to worry, just go to sleep and tomorrow you'll be fine. Can I fix you something? It's okay. Phyllis. Yes? Phyllis, come closer. I have to talk to you. Oh, no, you don't. What's the matter? Every time you start off like that, we wind up in a fight. And tonight, if you don't mind, I'm passing. Don't you worry about it. I got nothing to fight with you about. Well, that's a relief. If anyone's to blame for us not getting along, it's me. Well, what do you know? The doctor shot some sense into you. Do you think so? Now, go to sleep. You're not well, Joe. You can't be. If you were right in the noodle, you'd never be talking like this in the first place. No, I mean it. I really mean it. Oh, Joe. You know, Phyllis, driving a cab is pretty lonely work. You're all by yourself for hours and hours. And in between times, people are yelling at you to slow down, hurry up. Take Madison Avenue, don't take Madison Avenue, turn right, left, stop, go. And on top of all of that, they think I'm cheating them. Would you believe it? No, they don't. Who says that? So when someone finally comes along and smiles at you, calls you Mr., well, maybe you go all to pieces and think the moon and the stars are your own private property. At least for the night. It feels like spring. 
and you act like a first-class donkey kicking up your heels like you were 17 or 18. See what I'm saying? No. There ain't no point in drawing you a picture. I guess you get the message. Maybe you better spell it out for me. Well, seeing you dead like that after you fell out the window. Or at least, I thought you fell out the window, because it was on the TV and all. It was an awful shock. And I realized, well, you know what I'm trying to say. Then say it. Okay, I'll give it a try. It took a shock like that to make me realize it's you. And not some, well, some... Sounds like you're trying to confess something. I just mean, it's you I love. You're the one. I'm touched. Okay, I'm just trying to be honest. I'm really touched. How's that, better? You don't have to get nasty. Me? Nasty? What am I supposed to get, dewy and gooey? Please, Phyllis. Am I supposed to fall all over myself when my husband of 27 years tells me he's finally decided he loves me? You don't know what love is. That's not the point I was making. What is the point, then? After charming the pants off the entire borough of Manhattan, he pins the blue ribbon on me? Which means I win one used-up nitwit. Easy credit, no money down. All mine to keep and feed and pamper and obey till death do us part. The only point you've got is the one on top of your head. Take it easy, Phyllis. I'll take it easy, all right. I'd take a butcher knife to you right now if you weren't so pathetic, lying there in bed out of your ever-loving mind. Who's out of his mind? You are if you think I'm going to take your crap lying down. Well, at least you take something lying down. Yonkers, huh? Tell me another one. No wonder you're so short on the money every week. You've been blowing it on some cheap floozy. Cheap? Not everybody's cheap. Some people are expensive. You admit it. I didn't admit nothing. That's where our money's been going. You, you... You get out of here before I... You bet I will. This is one time I'll be glad to obey. To think of the years I gave you. Well, never mind that now. What are you doing? What does it look like? I'm packing my bags and moving on. You can't do that. Oh, you just watch me, Buster. I'm gonna drag you into court, Mr. Britt. You and your fancy woman, whoever she is. This is the thanks I get for trying to turn over a new leaf. So long, Joe. Thanks for the memories. I don't know what I ever saw in her. Will somebody please tell me? That woman wouldn't know sympathy if it jumped up and bit her on the behind. Get out of here before I throw you out! Order in the court. Phyllis? Your Honor, the prosecution objects to these interruptions by the defense. What's going on in there? Hey, we have a sidebar, Your Honor. For what purpose? Who's in my living room? Approach the bench, but I warn you both. If this is a delaying tactic. Ugh. Oh, that TV again. I should have known. Your Honor, the defense is merely trying to establish the sequence of events. Or, should I say, to respond to the fantasy presented by the prosecution. Throw me out. I'd like to see him try. Now what are you doing? I'm taking my crystal glasses. They were a wedding gift, remember? But why? You don't have to do that. Why, he says. Stay away from me, Joe. I'm warning you. The mood I'm in right now, you're lucky I don't tear you limb from limb, you dirty, rotten cheat. Order. This court will stand in recess. What did you have to turn the TV on for? On? It's been off for 15 minutes. Look for yourself. Channel 10. What do you want to do? Drive me nuts? That'd be a short trip. We don't get Channel 10. Get it through your thick skull. You didn't see anything on the tube? No, I didn't, and neither did you. You've been faking it the whole time. Phyllis! Oh, Phyllis, you! It is the ruling of this court that Dr. Saltman's testimony be entered into evidence. He testified that, in his expert opinion, the accused was sane at the time of the crime. So the charge of murder one, with special circumstances, will stand. How can you stand there watching this? To what? You flapping your gums? That's not me! Who's not you? Joseph Britt, the jury has found you guilty. It is the judgment of this court that you be taken to the state prison where you'll be <sighs> put to death. In the oh no! Turn it off! Off! The set's already off. Anything you see, it's in your mind, Joe. It must be your lousy conscience. Take a good look. Turn it off! What's the matter, Joe? There's nothing on Channel 10, is there? If you see something, go ahead. I don't mind. Why should I? 
I never meant anything to you anyway. We'll both watch it together. Why not? I need a good laugh. Get out of my way. Oh, I'm so frightened. You just scare me to death with your big muscles. Get out of the way, I said. My, my, how rough you are. Tell me what you see, Joe. It must be very upsetting. Where's my shepherd? I shall not want. No. I'm innocent, I tell you. That's what they all say. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. You ain't getting me in that room. Don't fight it, Joe. Lo, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. All I know is, I ain't sitting down! There's no use struggling. In all my years, I haven't seen a strap break yet. No! 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 Here. Now let's see this TV work. No more Channel 10 or anything else. Was it Lady Wrestler's Joe or a burlesque show with fan dancers from Yonkers? <laughs> Shut up! You shut up or I'll kill you! I swear I'll kill you! Come here. What do you see now, huh, Joe? What do you see? I'm on to you. You're nuts. We'll see about that. Ha! Missed me! I'll kill you! What's that? Say it again, Joe, so the neighbors will hear. I have witnesses. I said I'll kill you! Oh, no, you don't. Not my mother's face. Stand right there. Put it down, Joe. It's an antique. Yeah? An antique, huh? What's it gonna be worth in a minute? You lousy, no good... Come to Papa. Get away from me! I got your point. No place to go now. I don't like that look in your eye. Unless it's out that window. Joe, put it down. Not the vase. Don't you try to run or I'll smash it, I swear. No! Get away from the window! Let go of me! You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You can't afford an attorney. What happened? My wife and I were having an argument and then... Keep walking. Get in the squad car. You ain't gonna give us any trouble now, are you? That's him. That's the man. I saw him push her. They were fighting. Stand back, folks. All right. Break it up. Break it up. Party's over. Excuse me, Mr. Britt. You. The repairman. You started the whole thing. Fix your set, okay? What did you do to my TV? It's your fault. Your fault. All right, move along. Oh, Mr. Britt. I can use you for a reference, can't I? You will recommend my services if anyone else should need their set repaired. Mr. Britt? Joe Britt, cab driver, also a two-bit Romeo and star of Channel 10, who made his television debut just in time for the new season. But the series was cut short. His final show was only a few months later, broadcast live from the prison at Ossining, in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at TwilightZoneRadio.com. What's in the Box? Starring Mike Starr with Stacey Keach as your narrator was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Martin Goldsmith. Heard in the cast were Meg Thalken, Jeff Lupiton, Christian Stolte, Franette Lebo, Doug James, Carl Amari, Paul Patch, and Roger Wolski. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, 
Terry Jennings, Exim Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Yeah, sir. Ah, oh, the old inn on the square. <laughs> yes, sir. How perfectly charming. You have been here before? No, no, no. It's just, just as the guidebook said. Let me get your bags. In a moment. First, let me see uh, if they have accommodations. Very good. I'll wait, sir. Hello. May I help you? Good day, uh, I've just arrived in your town. Yes, sir. And I was wondering, do you by any chance have a room available? Let me see. Uh, that would be a single? Yes. Yes, I'm traveling alone. I can give you a lovely front room overlooking the square. That would be perfect. Would you care to see it? No need. I'm sure it will be quite satisfactory. In that case, welcome. If you would be so kind as to sign the guest book. Of course. Thank you, sir. There was something else. No, sir. Well, then. Yes? The key. Oh, yes, the key. Mr. Schmidt, is it? That's what I've written. Of course. Of course what? I mean, sir, I just wondered, well, it was just that... You wondered what? It's just that you remind me of someone, Mr. Schmidt. Oh? During the war. The war, so long ago. There are times when it does not seem so. I suppose. There... there were SS stationed here. You don't say. They used to come to the end very often. Did they? When they were off duty. Well, that must have been a very busy time. Busy, sir? Eventful. Yes. Well, then. Will you be taking your meals with us? Perhaps. I should like to explore the town first, see the sights this afternoon while there is still light. As you fish. Ah, yes. Very, very quaint outside, isn't it? Quaint? Picturesque. Some have said so. You'll be here long? A day or two, perhaps. I'm not sure. You see, uh, I'm on holiday. And you've never been here before? No, never. I, I'm told the scenery is lovely. I understand there's a wonderful old medieval castle one can visit. Castle? Oh, yes, sir. Very old. And other things? What do you mean? Other sites. What, what would you recommend for a tourist? Very little else, sir. Very little else of any particular interest. I'm told, though, that the town was quite active during the war. Active? Sir, it was like... Well, it was like most places in Germany. Ah, but I'm told that it was not like most places. I'm told that it had some special attractions. 
Uh, what was it? Um, a work camp or something that you had here? Something of the sort, sir. Well, was it a camp or not? A camp, sir. How's that? A camp, Mr. Schmidt. A, a concentration camp. You mean a relocation camp? Really, now, that's odd. I, I'm getting old, I guess. <laughs> For the life of me, I, I can't seem to recall the name. Sir? The name. Surely I must have read about it. What is the name of this town? Dachau, sir. Dachau. Mr. Schmidt recently arrived in a small Bavarian village which lies eight miles northwest of Munich. A picturesque, delightful little spot once known for its scenery, but more recently related to other events having to do with some of the less positive pursuits of man. Human slaughter, torture, misery, and anguish. Mr. Schmidt, as we will soon see, has a vested interest in the ruins of a concentration camp. For once, some years ago, his name was Gunter Lutz. He held the rank of captain in the SS. He was a black uniform, strutting animal whose function in life was to give pain. And like his colleagues at the time, he shared the one affliction most common among that breed known as Nazis. He walked the earth without a heart. And now former SS Captain Lutz will revisit his old haunts, satisfied perhaps that all that waits for him in the ruins is an element of nostalgia. What he does not know, of course, is that a place like Dachau cannot exist only in Bavaria. By its nature, by its very nature, it must be one of the most populated areas in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Death's Head Revisited, starring H.M. Winant, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Eh, uh, to be sure, Dachau. Once a peaceful place to live, but now... The camp, it's just there on the hill, isn't it? Yes. And that group of buildings, that, that would be the barracks for the workers. Workers, sir? And the officers, of course. I wonder if their quarters are still standing. Most of us would like it all burned to the ground. Oh? Such a disgrace. Yes, yeah, yes, of course. Uh, or perhaps it could be turned into a shrine. A shrine? For the men who lived there. Officers and workers alike. A million people were put to death there. Men and women and children, but not the officers. It is already a shrine. Yes, uh, I see your point. Will there be anything else? No, no, I'm off to do some sightseeing. Good day to you. You are on holiday, Herr Schmidt. What, 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 what did you say, driver? The trip, sir. You have come here for pleasure? The pleasure? Oh, yes. A rest to relax, to forget. Uh, it's the best kind of trip. To rest and enjoy life. <laughs> that is all that matters to me now. For all of us, I should say. It's true. We, we work, we slave, we do the bidding of others instead of tasting the fruits of our labors. And then one day a man asks himself, what is my reward for so much sacrifice? Most certainly. Selflessly, year after year, not what we would have chosen, perhaps. Not what we would have chosen at all. No. Ah, never mind. <laughs> I'm an old man. You would not understand. But I do, sir. How could you? You are so young. Perhaps. But it seems to me, sir, that each of us makes his own reward. And eventually it will come. What we deserve most. It's the true product of our labors. Of seeds sown long ago. Not only for others, but in the end, for ourselves. Would you agree? <laughs> you are quite a philosopher. Only a taxi driver. And you enjoy this occupation of service? Oh, yes, very much. 
I am a fortunate man. How so? My needs are simple. I bring comfort to others in some small way. It is the best work anyone can do. Is it? My parents. They suffered greatly in the war. They knew very little of comfort. Ah, the war, the war. So, so, so much ancient history. But not yet forgotten. For some, perhaps. For myself, I, I hardly remember any of it. And yet, you have returned. On the contrary, I've never been to this village before. My apologies. I thought because you wish to see the camp. I'm a teacher of history, that is all. And a student as well of historical places. Of course, Herschwitt. The camp is just ahead. But look, no one has kept it up. Very few people come here. The road, the grounds, the wire fences, the, the buildings, even the guard towers, the entire compound is rotting, falling apart. There is no reason to maintain it now. Perhaps you would rather visit the castle. No, no. This is what I came to see. Very well. A disgrace. Stop the car. Yes, sir? Yes, at the gate. Let me out. You are going in? Of course I'm going in. I've come all this way. I shall wait for you, then. Return in two hours' time. Two hours? There is much to study, notes to be taken. You understand. As you wish. That should be adequate. I'll come back to this spot, sir, in front of the gate. Yes, yes. And kindly be punctual. Oh, so cold here. I... No, wait! I've changed my mind! Ah, well, I, I can always walk back to the hotel if I must. But first, I look around. Hmm. Everything seems so small. Not as I remember it. There were many more barracks in the compound. And now only a few remain standing, like this one. All right, pigs. Up, up, up. Time to greet the morning on your feet. Another splendid day, a day of glorious service to the fatherland. Please, Captain. More water. A ration of bread? Anything. I beg you. I'm pleased to bring you news. News? What has happened? The war. It is over. Even better. It snowed during the night, but the temperature is only slightly below zero. So, you will assemble in the yard at once. Do not trouble yourself with clothing for the occasion. First, we do some simple exercises to increase our physical strength. Not now. I have no shoes. It freeze. My hands. My toes. Frostbite. Sir, I cannot stand. Outside, I said. Yes, yes, outside. Nothing in there but... but an empty room. The yard. And, and the towers, I remember. Next to the punishment posts, one, two, three, at least they still stand. What's that? A sign, <laughs> still hanging on that building. It says, detention. Ah, yes, I remember you. <laughs> Oh, we had good times in that building. Oh, such good times. Water. Please. Water. <laughs> water, pig? You'd like water? <laughs> Unfortunately, we have no more water. Not for you. Why should you care? It's been only five days since you've been fed. Only five days, pig! Five short, inconsequential days. That is nothing. On your feet, filth! Locked. It... it doesn't matter. Such a long time ago. 
But it doesn't seem so, and now, now there is no one to share those memories. Good afternoon. Where? Hm? Over here, at the window. But I, I thought there was no one inside. Who are you? Did I startle you? Well, I, I did not expect to see anyone here. Why not, Captain? Wait. Why do you call me that? But you are a captain, aren't you? No, no, I am Professor Schmidt. So, that is your name now. <laughs> you, you, you have me confused with someone else. Is that right? Or is it you who are confused? I tell you I... I never forget a face. I am Professor Schmidt. Are you? Your clothes. But about them, you... Don't approve? Why Why are you dressed that way, like... Like what? A prisoner. Very good, you do remember. But there are no more prisoners. No? Not now, surely. Welcome back, Captain. Why do you say that? Because I've been waiting. Waiting? For what? I can't forget a face. Especially yours. I tell you, I, I don't know you. Are you sure? I, I must go. Where are you going, Captain? That is none of your concern. Back to the town? To the life you have now? Yes, my life. I shouldn't have come. I am leaving now. I'm afraid that is no longer possible. Don't follow me. Get away! How can it be locked? There was no one near it. No one. Wasn't there. What have you done? I haven't touched the latch. Then who? I saw your own hand on it, only a moment ago. Nonsense. As you wish, Captain. Why do you persist in calling me that? As I told you, I've been waiting. For what? For you, Captain. We've been waiting a long time. Such a long time. We? There's no one else in these ruins. Isn't there? Wait. You're... Yes, of course, I... I remember you. And well you should. How well you should, Captain Lutz. Captain Gunther Lutz of the SS. Becker! Is that you? So you do remember me. <laughs> remember you, Becker? Of course I remember you, my prize pupil. How kind of the captain, after so many years. That's what I used to call you, isn't it? You don't look so bad, Becker. No, as a matter of fact, you look quite well. You don't seem to have changed at all. Neither have you, Captain. Not really. That's why I, I didn't recognize you. You haven't changed. But how can that be? I, it isn't possible why it's been years. A great many years, Captain Lutz, since we last saw one another. And now you must be what? Uh, the caretaker? <gasps> of course. That is why you are dressed like, like a prisoner. You are the caretaker here, aren't you? In a manner of speaking. Why, Becker, I must tell you, this is not only a surprise, it, it's a rather pleasant surprise. For me too, Captain. Isn't it odd? How so? It's odd that our paths cross again and we meet now under, under somewhat happier circumstances. Happier? Yes, for some of us, happier. <laughs> what was that? What, Captain? I it sounded like... The wind, Captain? Perhaps it was the wind. Yes, <laughs> only the wind. But it is not the wind. No? Don't, don't you hear them? It sounds like... Like what, Captain? Voices. Really? What do you want? Whoever you are, come out and face me! Cowards! If that is your desire, Captain. But I assure you, they are not cowards. Then why don't they show themselves? As you wish, Captain. As you wish. Where are they? They disturb you, Captain? 
Stop calling me Captain, please. I'm not a soldier anymore. Soldier? You never were a soldier, Lutz. The uniform you wore cannot be stripped off one skin quite so easily. It was a part of you, a part of your body, an emblem of your mind, a tattoo, Captain. A skull and crossbones burned into your soul. What do you know about it? I was a soldier, Becker! No, Captain Lutz. You were a sadist. You go too far, Becker. Do I? Yes. How can you say such things to me now? Very easily. I speak only the truth. Then if that is the case, you must know. I know that you were a monster. Of the worst sort. One who derived pleasure from giving pain. A distinction that does not even apply to animals. Listen to me, Becker. There is no war now. That's all over with. It's in the past. Is it? There is no more Reich. There are no more camps. Hmm. How convenient for you to think so. Oh, it is ridiculous. It is patently ridiculous to dwell on these things. What else should I be thinking of? You did as you thought best, and so did I. I performed my duties, functioned as I was told. Stop that noise! Odd that it should disturb you. It never used to. Not even when your victims screamed. Victims? What are you talking about? You weren't quite so sensitive when they screamed for mercy. But now, they are not screaming, Lutz. They are simply... Reacting. They are responding. They have just listened to you offer the apologia for all the monsters of history. We did as we were told. We functioned as ordered. But that is the truth. We merely obeyed directives from our superiors. Familiar, is it, Captain? Stop this! It was the theme music at Nuremberg. The new lyrics to the Gatterdammerung. The plaintive litany of the master race as it lay defeated and dying. We were never defeated. We were betrayed by disloyalty from within, infiltrators, spies. Always the fault of others. We did not do, others did. We did it, but others told us to. Or someone else did it, but we never knew it was done. Captain Lutz, ten million human beings were tortured to death in camps like this. The disease, the lame. Women, children, tired old men. They could not contribute. You know nothing of history. In time of war there is a hierarchy. There must be. Only the strongest survive. So you burned them in furnaces. Our facilities were inadequate. But you murdered them nonetheless. Not just the Jews, but the Gypsies, the Communists, the Outsiders. You shoveled them into the earth. You tore up their bodies in sadistic rage. And now you come back and wonder that the misery you planted has lived after you? That is the real wonder, that you are so naive. There is no point in talking about this any longer. I told you I have to leave, Becker. Why did you come back, Captain Lutz? You changed your name. You are quite safe down in South America. What could possibly have brought you back here? One misses his homeland, Becker. The fatherland. One grows nostalgic for the good old days, when one was young and strong. I had thought, I had hoped that with the passage of time, sanity would return. People would be willing to forget the, the little mistakes of the past. They would not succumb to these primitive cries for vengeance. Little mistakes. Little mistakes. <laughs> You ask too much, Captain Lutz. You ask far too much. Why not ask for the world to stop revolving on its axis? Or for gravity to cease? Don't ask the impossible. Don't ask forgiveness from those who you've destroyed to a point past forgiveness. Enough! My driver will be returning soon. Yes, time is short, Captain. We have something of great importance to accomplish here today. And what's that? It's time for the trial. Trial? The court is convening in Compound 6. The court, is it? 
Well, what is this nonsense? Is this a joke? No joke. Your trial, Captain. Trial? For what? You are to be tried for crimes against humanity. By whom? Who will try me? You're in insane, Becker. You were insane when I used to string you up and... That's right. When you used to string me up, Captain, suspended over a hot pipe and feed me salt water until my tongue swelled. Burn me with cigarette butts and laugh at me when I screamed for you to please put an end to it. To have mercy and kill me. Your memory is quite good, Captain. Quite good indeed. Shall we go now? The court is waiting. Let me out! Someone, let me out of here! There is no escape. There was not then, and there is not now. Nothing has changed. You think the fences are in disrepair? Look again, they are secure, as they were when you were in charge. It is only fitting, wouldn't you say? No, please! Let me up! I can explain! You can try, but it will do you no good. There is no explanation suitable for this court. We have rules. Who are these people? Greetings, Herr Captain. Welcome. Won't you join us? We welcome you to the House of Pain. Do you not know their faces? Their bodies? Then, starved, tortured, beaten. For they are your legacy. You made them what they are. Now then, shall we proceed? Please, please, this is inhuman treatment. No, not fit for a pig. Precisely. Read it. Read the charges. The inmates of Compound 6, Dachau Concentration Camp versus Gunther Lutz, Captain SS. I am entitled to a military tribunal. Indictment 1 that he condemned to death without a trial 1,100 human beings. 1,100? Where did you get such a number? Indictment 2, that he did maim and torture without provocation. Rubbish. Indictment 3, that he did personally order the withholding of food and water rations, causing disease, dehydration, and death. Where is your proof, your witnesses? Here, Captain. Remember me? I was only a child. You killed me with your own hands. Indictment 4. That he did deny medical treatment for the sick and ailing in violation of all rules of international law and common humanity. We did not have proper supplies. Our resources went to the front. To the officers? For leadership. A military force must have leadership. Indictment 5 that he did order summary executions by firing squad for those too ill and infirm to work. Eins, zwei, drei, fire! There, that will teach them the penalty for refusing their duties. And desecrated the remains with no proper burial? No. No, no, I, I did not do any, any of these things I could not have. Indictment 6. Listen to me, for the love of God, listen. That's it. I, I've been dreaming. Dreaming. The courtyard outside. The hanging post. None of it used for years. Of course not. I... Oh, I'm a foolish old man. Foolish and tired. Yes. You are very foolish. Becker, is that you? I, I, I must have dozed off. I... You've been unconscious for a while. I had such a dream. 
You had no dream, Captain. Of course I did. I dreamt there was a kind of trial, a kangaroo court. There were people in this room. Can you believe it? Yes. Ghostly figures. Not ghosts. Then... then what? They were here. They're still here. They have never left. It's true? They walked these buildings and the courtyard outside. But how? You did not bury them deep enough. You did not cover them with enough earth, or the bullets were too small a caliber, or the flames were not sufficiently hot. Perhaps there was not enough gas. Becker? Becker, you must tell me, who are you? Really? The caretaker. Did you forget? But the trial... The trial is over. You have been found guilty. It's time to pronounce sentence. No! No! Would you care for a last cigarette, Herr Lutz? Yes, Lutz, it's time. For what? For the sentence. You are going to pronounce sentence? <laughs> This is what you have in mind now? You will pronounce sentence and then... and then you shall execute the sentence? Is that correct? That is the procedure, as always. And who? Who is there to carry out the sentence? Do you see anyone outside the window to help you? Anyone at all, do you? They are here. I see no one. Are you blind? Here, look for yourself! There! Pigs! Filth! You will assemble in the yard. You will crawl out of your graves to see that justice is done. You will pass sentence on Captain Lutz. Brave, brave victims. Where are you now, eh? Not so brave at all, I should say. They won't answer. Why not? Your authority no longer applies here. But yours does. I am all that is left. And you are no longer a captain. You have been stripped of your authority as of this moment. Oh, I see. Do you? Then where is the judge? Where is the jury? The executioner? You are still obsessed with procedure. Shall I tell you where they are, Becker? They're in your mind. You have hatched them out of your hatred. You have planned your vengeance out of the crazy quilt of a warped imagination sewed together with little thin threads of wishful thinking. Why didn't I kill you when I had the chance? Why didn't I... But wait. Yes? I did, Becker, I did kill you. Ah. Your memory is no longer so conveniently selective. Yes. I killed you the night. You killed me the night the Americans came close to the camp. You tried to burn it down. Of course I did. I had no choice. They would have commandeered our supplies, our weapons. And what of the prisoners? You've said that they were of no value. They were of no value. They were a burden. And yet you tried to kill everyone who was left. And in my case, you succeeded. So, it was a waste of time, wasn't it? A waste of your precious time with absolutely no practical value. And it would certainly be a waste of what little time you have left now to try to murder me again. Uh, uh, but I will. I will. I'll finish it. I still can. Where? Where, where, where? Where? You have been tried and found guilty of crimes against humanity. What crimes? It is the unanimous judgment of this court that from this day forward... Where? Where are you? Show yourself! And for the rest of your natural life, you shall be rendered insane. But this is gibberish! This nonsense is idiocy! Where have you gone now? Where? At this gate, this locked gate, you shut down hundreds of people with machine guns. Do you feel it now? I'll finish it once and for all! Where are you hiding? Do you feel the bullets smashing into your body? Do you feel the agony of tearing lead? 
Uh, uh, I'll finish it with you, Becker. Here and now. And on these posts, you hanged human beings, human beings to die slowly and painfully. Uh, they were criminals. What was their crime? Stealing water? A crust of bread? They would have died anyway. Do you feel their hunger? Do you feel their agony? Silence! And in this place, the detention room as you call it, the things you did to human beings here are unmentionable. How does their torment feel? I refuse to give you satisfaction. If you can still reason, Roots, if there is any portion of your mind that can still function, take this thought with you. This is not hatred. This is retribution. This is not revenge. This is justice. No! Liar! Liar! And this is only the beginning. Your final judgment will come from God. There! There! If you won't open the gate, I'll crawl under. You can't hold me here. No, it's a violation of my international rights. Uh, Becker? Becker? Where are you? Becker? Where are you? Becker? I'll finish it, you swine! Ah! That man? Oh! What is he? He's crazy! Oh! Herr Schmidt, I, I didn't see you. Call for a doctor, quickly! Get away. Get away! Stand back, please. What happened here? I heard him screaming, Doctor. Such sounds. Like a... like a wounded animal. He didn't seem to know where he was or who he was. Will he be all right? Not for a while. But what do you mean? I have shot him so full of sedatives that he doesn't know whether he is still on the earth. Shall I help him up to his quarters, Doctor? His quarters? He registered for our best room, overlooking the square. Herr Schmidt did, if that is his name. It is the name on his passport. Where shall we take him, Doctor? His room is ready. Release it to someone else. He won't be coming back any time soon. I want him in the hospital, strapped to a bed. Yes, sir. Pity I could look after him. What happened to him, do you suppose? That's what I'd like to know. I give you my word, it wasn't my fault. No, no, I'm sure it wasn't. I drove him up the hill myself, not an hour ago. The hill? Yes, the old road. To the ruins of the camp. How curious. He said he wanted to study it. He was all right then. Are you quite sure? He must have walked or run all the way back here. To the square. But his screams. Ah, his screams. Were there any marks on him? None. Then what must he have seen? I have no idea. All I know is that he is in very real pain. More than pain. Agony. As if he has been tortured. But my taxi didn't strike him. Yeah, yeah I believe you. He fell right here, as you saw. Clutching himself. As though he had been beaten or shot. He seemed insane. A raving maniac. Sometimes we cannot judge by appearances alone. What could happen to a man in two hours to change him so? Someone must tell me. I wish I knew. He said he was on holiday. Poor old fellow. Come here to reap the rewards of a life's work. I wonder what that life's work was to bring him to such a place as Dachau. There may be an answer to that question. Yes? 
but I'm sure I couldn't say. Ah, well, tell the ambulance I will meet them at the hospital. Yes, doctor. Thank you for coming so quickly. Yes, thank you. Not at all. That is my job, to heal. Only I don't know if I can help this man. But you will try, because that is your duty. Yes, I will try to understand. Someone will have to make a proper diagnosis. I'm afraid his affliction may lie beyond my understanding. Goodbye, then, Doctor. Auf Wiedersehen. Dachau. Why does it still stand? Why do we keep it standing? Some things I will never comprehend. There is an answer to the doctor's question. All the Dachaus must remain standing. The Dachaus, the Belsons, the Buchenwalds, the Auschwitzes, all of them. They must remain standing because they are a monument to a moment in time when some men decided to turn the earth into a graveyard. Into it they shoveled all of their reason, their logic, their knowledge, but worst of all, their conscience. And the moment we forget this, the moment we cease to be haunted by its remembrance, then we become the gravediggers. Something to dwell on and to remember, not only in the twilight zone, but wherever men walk the earth. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. Death's Head Revisited, starring H.M. Winant, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Maggie Carney, David Darlow, Richard Shavsden, Peggy Roeder, James Schneider, Carl Amari, Doug James, and Roger Wolski. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. <laughs>